How's everybody doing? Hoping you're having a fantastic day. Sorry for the weirdness of my camera. I, I need to like update it and switch some of the uh, settings, but I haven't gotten to it. So if I look weird, like if my movements are weirdly captured, it's because I need to update some settings on my camera. So sorry about that, uh, but you can see it and cope. So uh, recently, uh, if some of you have been on the Twitter sphere or uh, in any of the uh, Discord groups, I know that's like the cringiest thing I've ever said if you're in the Twitter sphere or in the Discord groups. Um, so if, if, you, uh, if you have no life and you're on the internet all the time, uh, you will have noticed that there has been some uh, controversy brewing. So for a very long time, I've spoken of the authority of St. Thomas Aquinas in matters of theology and philosophy. And I have gotten this from just reading the Roman pontiffs when they write about St. Thomas, because I have a strong devotion to St. Thomas, so I like to read encyclicals that talk about St. Thomas. Uh, that's something I enjoy, to, enjoy doing. So I've, I've been able to gather uh, from that some points on uh, his safety, um, his superiority over other doctors, and, and so on and so forth. And this is something that other authors um, have synthesized. This is actually, um, ever since, it's, it's kind of funny because this has been extremely consistent. So ever since the time of John of St. Thomas in the early to mid-17th century, we have spoken about the authority of St. Thomas. We've given various distinctions on the various modes of authority and the way in which he is authoritative. And so that was uh, 400 years ago. And the Thomistic accounts written up to the mid 20th century were the same exact distinctions given because that's how consistent the church has been on this. It's crazy. Hundreds of years of the same distinctions given. Everyone from Pius V to Pius X um, to, uh, obviously, it's been um, other authors spoken since then. And eventually, I want to actually do some research on this um, in the post-conciliar era, because there's stuff there for sure, and the changes to the Code of Canon Law. But I digress. So um, I've been speaking about this for a very long time, and uh, the SCOTUS have finally... Um, decided to give some responses, uh, minor sort of Twitter-esque responses. But it, it was just overall painful, um, absolutely painful. Um, this is kind of like when you talk to a Protestant and they're like, well, when you look at the Eucharist, it's not physically Christ's body. Like you can just look and see it's bread. Therefore, transubstantiation is false. It's, it's quite literally that mode of argumentation. It's, it's actually quite distressing. Um, I've been taken in some very wild uh, senses. There's been responses that would actually um, result in some of the heresy of the modernists when it comes to the authority of the church over philosophy. It's just been really, really disappointing. Um, and honestly, it's just kind of a waste of time for all of us involved to continue to discuss these things. So what I wanted to do is I just wanted to make a video and then kind of just tell people, look, I'm not, I'm just not going to engage on this anymore. Um, maybe if somebody wrote an article or did a video, I would, uh, but yeah, I'm just not going to continue 
the Twitter stuff. If anybody needs clarification or anybody needs uh, a response, this video is just going to be that. And it's going to be pretty long. Um, I'm going to be going through Ramirez's account of the authority of St. Thomas. Um, Salivari, I think that's how you pronounce the name, Salivari. Uh, Salivari, uh, Joachim Salivari, uh, SJ, he's a Jesuit. He also did a shorter study on this, which does a lot better, um, I think at least, with uh, dealing with some of the over-exaggerations, over-exaggerations that I'm accused of, that I've been very clear in um, saying I don't believe, such as St. Thomas is infallible, uh, that's what you think, or um, well, you think that the Franciscans shouldn't be allowed to study Scotus Bonaventure and Hales. Well, ne I've never said that. Um, and I've actually, every single time I've spoken on this issue, I've, <laughs> in the beginning of of, uh, of my uh, rant or whatever, I have clarified that this is not what I believe. Um, but it's just when, I, I don't know if it's ill will or just a, um, a lack of care on the part of my um, interlocutors. But so, yeah, this is just going to be that video. Uh, and after this, I might do uh, a look through Salivari's um, to do like a shorter version of this video. Uh, that might be fun uh, if people want that, because this is probably going to be like an hour and a half if we're lucky. Uh, this is going to be a pretty lengthy video. So um, is Scotus blessed or a saint? He's a blessed. Um, and uh, so the Franciscans have a doctor of the church. It's a, uh, it's St. Bonaventure. Um, they just think Scotus uh, as a blessed uh, interprets Bonaventure rightly, which I don't really agree with, but it is, um, it is whatever. Okay. Let me look at. <laughs> Pines of the Aquinas won't have the internet's most controversial tome I stolen because he likes Aquinas too much. Yeah, that was that was honestly like one of the most distressing uh responses. Um really. Because it's 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 like the first the first paragraph. If if you think if somebody's going to like if I, I get honestly um, if you don't want to read through my massive like Twitter responses, that's cool. I get that. Some people just want to scroll, uh, don't want to read it. Like, I have no problem with that. Obviously, it's just not for everybody. But if you're going to respond to something, you, you think you'd at least read it first. And if you didn't see in the first paragraph where something is lined up, like it's not like I hit it like halfway through the thing or anything. If you don't see in the first paragraph where I say something, then it's obvious you were just responding to something you didn't read. And especially when you're calling for not having charity towards somebody um, and calling for him being obviously wrong, um, then, yeah, it's it's uh, it's just ridiculous. Um, but honestly, uh, if I wanted to get on Pines with Aquinas, I would probably, um, you know, that would, uh, no, I don't want to be mean. Um, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. Okay. I'm not going to go there. Um, yeah, I, I will leave my uh, my problems with some of the way they do things. Um, okay. Oh, so the same guy who hates you because we talked about the premarital contact thing as well, if you remember the exchange about that. Oh, really? I didn't know it was the same guy. Um, yeah, I don't. I actually have never uh, heard of Thursday until today um, or yesterday uh, when he responded. And then I happened to see in his bio that he was – he worked with Pines of the Aquinas. I'm like, well, oh, okay, I guess this makes a lot more sense then. Um, yeah, but if I wanted to get on Pines of the Aquinas, I would uh, just become a uh, heretical Anglican priest. Um, okay. Okay, I'm not going to go there. Um, okay, so let's get right into Ramirez's work. But before that, if you like the hat, Bishop of Rome hath jurisdiction. Look at that beauty, beauty, or mugs, shirts, sweatshirts, aprons, bags, whatever you want, stickers, we got them. So if you want it, help the show out, get some Gary Goo, uh, link below. Also, I'm sure if you're listening to this, that you actually uh, really like St. Thomas Aquinas, or even if you don't like St. Thomas Aquinas, and you want to learn more about St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, in the link below, uh, there's a link to a Discord server called the New Aquinas Academy. We do readings through some of St. Thomas's easier works. 
Um, I eventually want to expand that and go into like a lot of different sort of reading groups, more systematic uh, lesson formation and, and stuff like that. Um, and if you want to help me be able to uh, expand there, because right now I'm kind of just uh, doing the one thing. Um, there's also a Patreon for the new Aquinas Academy. Uh, if that's something that you would like to see um, expanded. So uh, links for all that is below. They're, they're actually, okay, so this is, um, there's a quote that I quoted um, from his canonization proceeding where they speak about how St. Thomas was also loved among simple laymen um, because of the simplicity of some of his works, such as his commentaries on the Our Father, Ten Commandments, Ave, and, and so on, and some of his sermons. So St. Thomas actually wasn't this like autist up there in the in the clouds all the time. He, he was... He, unlike a lot of the scholastics, fed everybody from simple laymen to the, the wisest philosophers and theologians. That's what, that's just what makes St. Thomas so great. And there's a million other reasons um, that make St. Thomas great, but uh, too bad um, uh, certain um, people don't want to talk about this, even though they, they name themselves after the angelic doctor. But, uh, yeah. Okay. I will share. Okay, yeah, maybe you're you're right. You're right. You're right. Fred Fred did uh Fred did share uh my video on the um the diamond debate. Okay, maybe maybe I'm being maybe I'm being a little bit too harsh. But actually I don't think it's Fred, so I think I I, I think very highly actually of, of Fred. I think it's the it's the the deep the deep state of Pines of Aquinas, the deep Steubenville. Okay, so the authority of St. Thomas Aquinas, you can get this on archive. Uh, it's by uh, Jacob Ramirez, OP, a famous Dominican commentator on the Summa in the 20th century. And he's basically um, showing how the church, I mean, if you, I can't remember exactly, I wish I had a PDF of this, but there's a collection of papal statements from St. Thomas that was done, like, it was like, at least over like 150 years ago. I think it was even before the Leo IX Pope said it was made. And it was still like multiple volumes of just papal statements about St. Thomas and his authority. So yeah, it's it's like an insane, an absolutely insane amount of material on this. And he's, so he's taking that, uh, he's putting it actually in the same um, sort of uh, ordering that John of St. Thomas did um, when he was writing his um introductory volume to his uh, summa commentary so let's begin recently pope pius XII, oh crap in the encyclical humani generis of august the 12th 1950 in an allocation delivered on september 17th of the same year and directed to those at the third international thomistic congress held in rome seriously and repeatedly warned Catholic theologians and philosophers to abandon the vagaries of novel theology and the philosophy infected with materialism, historicism, imminentism, and existentialism. They were to direct their attention to the safe and sound doctrine of St. Thomas Aquinas, in which salvation and truth are found. Pius X had done the same when modernism became strong, especially in his encyclical Pascendi of September 8th, 1907. Likewise, Leo XIII, in an effort to turn the human mind from the errors of pantheism, rationalism, ontologism, and extreme tradition, traditionalism, against which the Vatican Council had taken action, considered that there was no better remedy at hand than to devote all his powers to restore, nurture, and prescribe, and urge the doctrine of the angelic master. For that reason, he issued the encyclical Attorney Patris on August 4th, 1879, as well as many other documents. From this evidence, one fact clearly stands out, that in the judgment of the Holy See, there is a remarkable force and power in the doctrine of St. Thomas for safeguarding faith and reason against the multiple deviations which afflict our age. Just how great this power is and how serious the obligation of adhering to and following the command and admonitions of the Holy See in this matter is perhaps not sufficiently clear to all. This right here. So it's one thing. Uh, to just deny that power and that obligation, the commands and admonitions, 
that's just uh that's just flat out um ignorance of the era but it is it is fair um that the nature may be unclear of that uh, obligation and of the seriousness and, and so on it's totally fair to say that totally okay so this is what ramirez is doing here ramirez wants to show where these distinctions are explicitly being stated in these encyclicals it's very it's actually really really cool to show how consistent the catholic church has been for centuries uh, on this matter for this reason there is an evident need to discuss the doctrinal authority of saint thomas aquinas in the fields of philosophy and theology together with the obligation which binds Catholic philosophers and theologians by precept of the Holy See to embrace and follow his authority. Okay, so something we have to be very clear about, um, and uh, this is going to uh, change a bit how Ramirez um, is read in some areas um, because the, the canonical situation is different. He's working off of the 1917 Code of Canon Law and the interpretations given by the popes of the 1917 Code of Canon Law, how they've applied that it's different with the 1983 code of canon law. So some of the canonical uh, bindings don't exist anymore, uh, which is just canonical bindings. Uh, that's not really uh, anything to just uh, say, see, look, the, the Catholic church actually contradicted 500 years of her, uh, her attitude towards St. Thomas, which I think would just be like, I mean, at that point, if you think the Catholic church did that um, doctrinally rather than merely canonically, then, you should just not be Catholic anymore. Um, that would be the most sensible thing to do. So uh, continuing. In order that we may proceed without ambiguity in a matter of such moment, we must above all keep in view uh, what strictly touches on our discussion, namely the twin distinction of doctrinal authority. One aspect deals with the object or matter and the other with the mode or form. Okay, this is important. We're going to be looking at the, the, uh, the object or matter and then the mode or form. Okay, very important. On the part of the matter, so on the part of the object, on the part of the matter, there is one authority in philosophical science or in the order of truth, which man can know by reason. So the, uh, the object of the magisterium of the church and therefore the object of St. Thomas's authority is going to be in one sense philosophical, but in a different way. There's another authority in theological science or in the order of truths exceeding the natural powers of human reason. This latter order of truth cannot be known unless it is revealed by God and accepted by faith. On the other part of the form, the authority in each science, whether philosophical or theological, is twofold. So there's two ways, two manners in which we can have authority in each one of these sciences. So we kind of have like a, a square right here. So we can put like theological science and philosophical science up here at this part of the square. And this is going to be the matter. And then on the other side, we can put uh, extrinsic and then intrinsic authority uh, right here to form the form of the of side of the square. So we can have intrinsic theological authority, extrinsic theological authority, intrinsic philosophical authority, extrinsic philosophical authority. So this is important. On the part of the form, the authority in each science, whether philosophical or theological, is twofold. One is intrinsic or scientific and is measured by the internal mentor, mental stature of the writer in the intrinsic doctrinal validity of his work. So this, this, uh, this intrinsic part of it has to do with the skill of the philosopher rather than having to do with the extrinsic, which we're going to find out, has to do with the declaration of some other authority, which is Holy Mother Church. The other authority is extrinsic or canonical and is measured in the particular way by the approbation and commendation of the teaching church. So we can think of this, uh, if you want to fill in our square up here, we can look at the intrinsic philosophical authority. So intrinsic philosophical authority is going to have to do with like the astuteness of the intellect of the philosopher. So like even Aristotle, Plato, Proclus, uh, SCOTUS, um, a lot of people have intrinsic philosophical authority. We're going to say that Thomas actually has the highest intrinsic philosophical authority, but um, we're going to get to that later. The other is going to be extrinsic philosophical authority. So extrinsic philosophical authority, we're going to distinguish that between divine and human. So when it comes to human, it's going to be the judgment of learned men. 
So the judgment of learned men have um, said that this philosopher is actually the smartest or the best or exceeds all others in philosophy. And St. Thomas, in a certain way, is going to have this, but we're not really going to talk about this here. We're more concerned with the divine. So when it comes to divine extrinsic philosophical authority, this is going to have to do with the judgment of the teaching church. And yes, the teaching church has, while its primary object is not philosophical truths, it has authority over philosophical truths, over guarding them because they can lead to errors against the faith. That's why. And the church would not be able to carry out her divine mission of protecting and guarding the faith if she couldn't speak on matters of philosophy. This was something which was spoken of time and time and time and time and time again during the anti anti-modernist magisterium. And in fact, uh, unfortunately, some of these SCOTUS are making the same arguments as the, that the modernists made uh, when it came to the church's authority in matters of philosophy. It's... Uh, it's just uh, ridiculous. So now let's let's fill in the bottom part when it comes to theological authority. So theological authority, uh, intrinsic, it's going to come uh, in a certain sense because uh, theology is said to be a radically supernatural science, um, yet it is only works virtually by revelation. In a certain sense, this is going to apply also to the strength of one's intellect. But on the other hand, it's going to uh, have to do with the sanctity of one's life. So that's going to be intrinsic uh, theological authority. Then extrinsic theological authority is going to be um, is going to have to do with the teaching authority of the church, the approbation and com uh, commendation of the church. So those are the four ways, or really five, if you want to distinguish um, extrinsic philosophical authority into human and divine. Those are the four or five ways in which we can speak about the authority of a certain uh, teacher in the Catholic Church. And then uh, he says in this sentence, oh, we admit the merely human extrinsic authority, which depends upon the evaluation of learned men, which St. Thomas uh, obviously has this as well. And somebody could cover this if they want. Such canonical or ecclesiastical authority of St. Thomas or of any other writer in the philosophical, philosophical field should not be considered incongruous. For just as the power of the church touches directly only spiritual things, this is what I was saying earlier, but indirectly temporal things by reason of the spiritual, so the teaching authority of the church indirectly and by way of a consequence extends to philosophical science. Though primarily and directly, it is concerned only with supernatural truths and theological truths. So, again, in order to guard, defend, and promulgate supernatural and theological truths, it in a certain way is going to secondarily touch philosophical truths. This this should be obvious. Um, this shouldn't I shouldn't be telling you anything that's just crazy and out of the ordinary. As Pius XII explains, assuredly, it is her task, the teaching authority of the church, by divine institution, not only to protect and interpret the deposit of divinely revealed the truth revealed truths, but also to keep watch over the philosophical sciences themselves in order that Catholic dogmas may suffer no harm from erroneous opinions. Is Pius XII a presuppositionalist? Is he? No, he's not. He's not. This is just simple Catholic teaching. Anybody with a smattering of ecclesiology would be able to tell you this. It's simple. Okay, so now we're going to start actually getting into the scientific authority of the doctor, and it's going to be in philosophical science. And I'm going to keep uh, an occasional watch over the live chat, uh, not too much. Okay. Um. Uh, how safe is it to trust Philo of Alexandria? Uh, there's not really any uh, promises by the church uh, when it comes to Philo of Alexandria. Okay, nothing else. Yeah, the, the, this actually, um, Hassan, maybe we need to do like a follow-up. Uh, Thomistic forgery, so true. Maybe we need to do a follow-up on the authority of St. Alphonsus Liguori. Uh, but people would just like have a meltdown if they heard that Alphonse Liguori's physicians are safe. Okay, so scientific authority of the doctor in philosophical science. In speaking of the intrinsic philosophical authority of St. Thomas, remember, if you remember, intrinsic philosophical authority has to do with the bigness of the brain, has to do with uh, that, that uh, power that a certain thinker is going to have. 
Beyond doubt, we must note the following. The intrinsic doctrinal authority of any philosopher rests in its entirety on a double basis. The person or pers personal qualities which befit a good philosopher and his works, in that they give evidence that his teaching is perennially true and unassailably valid. Both of these aptly per apply perfectly to Aquinas. First, he possessed an abundance of all the personal qualities requisite for a good philosopher, a razor keen mind, vivid memory, tireless effort, profound learning, purposeful diligence, purity of life, the cultivation and love of truth alone. There is no doubt that nature, quote, wonderfully endowed him to be a philosopher, end quote, as Pius XI declared. There was no philosophical school known at that time, or indeed which possibly could be known, in whose philosophy he was not completely skilled. He fully understood the Greeks, Latins, Jews, Arabs, yet at the same time he treated them with gentleness and understanding. He clearly saw, as he himself said, quote, the study of philosophy is directed not at knowing what men have thought, but at knowing what is actually the truth of things, end quote. That's one of my favorite quotes from St. Thomas, actually. And I think it offers a pretty devastating critique of how a lot of philosophy and theology is done nowadays, but I digress. He adds, quote, to know what you may wish or understand does not belong to the perfection of my intellect, but only to know the truth in reality, end quote. This is actually, this actually serves as a basis for what we'll talk about later, which I've always agreed with and which uh, he's going to provide a little bit of a um, excursus at the end. This provides the basis for the goodness of the school system, the system of the schools that we have. Scotus, Suarezians, Bonaventurians, uh, Thomists, Eclectics. Uh, we, we have all of these different uh, schools. They mutually sharpen one another and are actually able to help us um, better engage with the truth, even as, um, even as somebody who is dedicated to the Dominican tradition of interpreting St. Thomas. He was accustomed to read everything with a mind undisturbed and free from prejudice so as to capture even the smallest spark of truth. This is what I think when I read Scotus. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I actually uh, I actually have a, a uh, love for uh, Blessed Scotus in many ways, um, even while I don't necessarily uh, view him as my uh, teacher. He warns us, quote, in choosing or rejecting opinions, one should not be influenced by love or hatred for the one presenting the opinion but rather by the certitude of truth, end quote. And again, he says, quote, do not heed by whom a thing is said, but rather what is said that is good, you should commit to your memory, end quote. His pure life gave rise to a, short, uh, to a sort of natural necessity of uncovering and eagerly grasping the truth, especially of the moral order, as if by instinct. He himself says, quote, one who has the habit of virtue judges rightly concerning those things which should be done according to the virtue, insofar as he has an inclination towards it, end quote. For example, quote, in a matter pertaining to chastity, that person will judge correctly who has the habit of chastity, end quote. In these manners, that other axiom of Thomas holds true, quote, life holds a priority over doctrine, for life leads to knowledge of the truth, end quote. He was possessed of the greatest skill, coupled with a wonderful sense of balance and proportion for learning and research, reading and meditation, experimentation and abstraction, inductive and deductive reasoning, speculative and practical activity, as well as in the use of analyzing or synthesizing. The array of perfections flowed even into his works. He gathered to himself alone as into a sea the stream of truth running through the philosophers and ecclesiastical writers. These he assimilated and purified. Their doctrines, to use the words of Leo the Thirteenth, like the scattered limbs of a body, Thomas gathered together and arranged. He disposed them in wonderful order and increased them with mighty additions. He published learned commentaries on the chief works of Aristotle, based on a new and accurate translation, with which his fellow Dominican, William of Morbeck, supplied him Aristotle's logic, natural philosophy, psychology, metaphysics, and ethics. He was thoroughly versed in the substance of the doctrines of Plato and the Neoplatonists based not only upon the references in Aristotle, Cicero, and St. Augustine, but also upon a reading of the actual texts. For he had in his possession Plato's Timaeus with its commentary by Proclus. He actually wrote a commentary on the Timaeus, but it got lost, sadly. 
This fact comes to light from a letter written by the Faculty of Arts of the University of Paris to the General Chapter of the Order of Preachers, dated May 2nd, 1274. He also wrote clear and penetrating commentaries on the works of the Platonist uh, Dionysius, Proclus, and Boethius, on the works uh, on the Divine Names, on the Book of Causes, and on the Hebdomads. In writing these works, he made use of the previous Greek and Arab commentators, such as Alexander, Ammonius, Porphyry, uh, Themistius, uh, Philippon, Simplicius, uh, Eustratius, Avicenna, and Avore. I'm sorry, uh, these names mess me up all the time. He had their works before him and subjected them to a critical examination with the result that he surpassed each and every one in explaining Aristotle. It was for this reason, says Louis of well, Louis, that philosophers called him expositor par excellence. These commentaries on the works of Plato and Aristotle were not made from a merely philo philological or historical point of view, such as recent writers often adopt. Yeah, the philological or historical point of view is terrible. Rather, his commentaries were literal and doctrinal, uh, though at the same time, the philological, critical, and historical aspects, such as could be developed at that time, were not neglected. For this reason, any accidental and entirely secondary defects crept in. They were restricted and fully compensated by his almost unbelievably complete knowledge of all the works of all the authors he was explaining. To this, he added an incredible shrewdness in searching out, examining, and detecting the more obscure meanings of the same authors. So well did he assimilate the force, spirit, and mind of these philosophers that one might say their very souls had, as it were, trans transmigrated into that of their commentator, as though through the exposition of Thomas, one were hearing the authors themselves speaking. Moreover, he refined their doctrine in a variety of ways, in that he not only exposed their literal meaning, but their intent as well. Into their principles, he put order. Into their arguments, he put clarity and profound conclusions. He corrected their errors and rephrased their inaccurate statements so as to bring out the proper sense. He enriched their doctrine with so many additions that, being compelled to betray themselves at the hand of an interpreter, they seemed to put on and be redolent of philosophy itself. It was Thomas alone who truly surpassed them, in that he delineated in their philosophical efforts and in the fragments of truth which they found, the person of philosophy, as it were, and imbibed the whole truth of the full draughts. Uh, in addition, he wrote many original works. Among the minor works are uh, On Being and Essence, On the Principles of Nature, On the Nature of Matter, On the Principle of Individuation, On the Nature of Generation, On the Four uh, Opposites, uh, on the uh, nature of the intelligible word, on the unity of the intellect, on separated substances, on the uh, primacy of rule. Among his major works are his disputed questions on truth, on the soul, on the spiritual creatures, and the first three books of the Summa Contra Gentiles. In these, especially the Contra Gentiles, the human faculty of reasoning seems to have reached its supreme height. And then uh, Leo the Thirteenth said on this, there is no part of philosophy which he did not handle with acuteness and solid solidity. He so investigated the laws of reasoning, God, and incorporeal substances, man and other sensible things, human acts and their principles, that the full selection of subjects and a beautiful arrangement of their divisions, his excellent plan of procedure, the soundness of his principles and the force of his arguments, his perspicuity and propriety of expression, his facility for explaining the most abstruse questions leave nothing to be desired it's actually interesting when you look at um uh studiorum ducem when you look at studiorum ducem actually uh pius it was a pius the 11th or benedict the 15th it was pius the 11th um pius the 11th through that encyclical lists every single area that was treated um in the schools in philosophy at that time and shows why and how saint thomas is an authority on them Every single one of them. There's literally like paragraphs talking about this. Uh, and so it's it's like, it's just right there. It isn't um, anything hidden. In fact, as is evident 
in preserved fragments of the autograph of the Contra Gentiles, St. Thomas expended the greatest effort and care upon his work, subjecting his manuscript to the most exacting criticism three or four times. He used to revise words, phrases, arguments, and whole chapters. He made corrections and changes and polished his work in order to produce it in the most accurate style and order. On the other hand, he presented arguments so solid and full, so clear and suitably arranged as to reveal the truth and overcome error, that for true philosophers, down through the centuries, he offers a lasting and inexhaustible armory of weapons for revealing protecting the truth against every attack from its enemies. Leo XIII aptly stated, It also happened that the angelic doctor, in his speculations, drew certain philosophical conclusions as to reasons and principles of created things. These conclusions have the very widest reach and contain, as it were, in their bosom, the seeds of truth well nigh infinite in number. These have to be unfolded with most abundant fruits in their own time by the teachers who come after him. As he used his method of uh, philosophizing, not only in teaching the truth, but also in refuting error, he gained, he has gained their prerogative for himself. With his own hand, he vanquished all errors of ancient times, and still he supplies an armory of weapons, which brings us certain victory in the conflict with falsehoods ever springing up in the course of years. For this reason, the famous Cardinal uh, Francisco Toledo, S.J., with the advice and approbation of philosophers from every country, wrote, quote, Thomas has within himself the likeness of all in whom there is any precision of interpretation, weight of doctrine, coupled with piety, wide, varied, and solid learning, and an incredible method for the thorough treatment of whole disciplines. It was not merely because of his commentaries on Aristotle, but much more by reason of his summa, uh, his summe, uh, quaesiones uh, disputate, and other writings that he alone gave as much light to philosophy, to say nothing of theology, as all the others put together. I believe that it would not at all uh, detract from their excellence if I were to say of Thomas that which each of them would say if he were living and present. Notice uh, good old uh, Cardinal Francisco Toledo, SJ, is not a uh, presuppositionalist uh, because presuppositionalism did not exist during that time. And he was a cardinal. Uh, But the philosophical discipline of St. Thomas, that is, the spirit of his system and its major propositions, cannot be called Platonic or Aristotelian or the offshoot of any other school. Rather, it is thoroughly Christian and human in that it gives evidence of an organization of truths and principles towards which the human mind, naturally Christian, which is a quote from Tertullian, is inclined by nature. There is no system of philosophy which is so much a part of and conformable to nature, and at the same time so capable of perfecting the human mind as the philosophical system of Aquinas. Simple, pure, clear, brief, ordered, beginning with ideas and principles per se known, it proceeds by natural steps, as it were, to higher, more profound, and hidden truths. Step by step, it ascends to the supreme pinnacle and ultimate causes of things. With these well in mind, it again returns to the things of the sensible order weighing and explaining them with the judgment of wisdom. The famous series of the 24 theses reveal the same order. These propositions in the judgment of the Sacred Congregation of Studies, March 7th, 1916, truly contain the essence of the philosophical doctrine of St. Thomas in its principles and major propositions. These principles and many others of the same kind, especially those proper to metaphysics, will never perish as long as nature remains, nor will they age with the passage of centuries, but with perpetual vigor will endure forever. As Pius XI wisely pointed out, these principles are not subjective and artificial, but natural and objective constructs, and therefore will last forever. The portions of St. Thomas's doctrine directly touching sensible phenomena, as well as the method of treatment used to explain them, do not constitute the substance of Thomistic philosophy. These are entirely accidental and change in accordance with the day-by-day developments of the experimental sciences. Abstracting from such portions and method, the superstructure of metaphysics remains integral and sound. The consistency and unity of truth We find most clearly in the system of philosophical doctrine of St. Thomas, particularly in his metaphysics, psychology, and natural natural ethics. His doctrine shows a wonderful harmony with divinely revealed truths. Whether we consider St. Thomas's philosophical system in itself, 
or with regard to supernatural truths accepted on divine faith, or in his method of investigation and teaching, or his succinct, sound, clear, and energetic manner of explanation, we must declare that it possesses the greatest worth and efficacy, and thus the highest scientific authority. So this was just a philosophy. And I actually think he went a little bit light here, um, as much as he wrote, because, you know, Studio on Ducha, man, like paragraphs and paragraphs just talking about every single area of philosophy. So he could have done something like that. But what he wants uh, to, st uh, because this is just like a tenth of the work, what he wants to really get into is his authority in theological science. So I'm going to check the live chat real quick. Um, the Visitation of the Betrothed. You know, um, uh, actually, Albertus Magnus said the same thing. He had this uh, dream one time where the Blessed Virgin Mary wiped off his face with a cloth. And after that, he was able to understand everything he read. We do need we do need the we need the St. Alphonsus video. OK, everybody wants me to do the St. Alphonsus video. I need to. Uh, I know um, of like certain 10 to 15 page treatments, not too long. I mean, I guess it wouldn't be the worst thing if I didn't make like a three hour video going over the authority of St. Alphonsus. I'm not really a fan of Thomistic thought. Haha. I mean, I guess it's fine. I mean, it's not like you have to be a Thomist. Notice something, something I, I have never said ever is that every single Catholic, in order to be a Catholic, has to be a Thomas. Never said that. Ever, ever, ever. And actually, I've refuted that position multiple times from some people who may misunderstand what the popes have said. And we're actually, the last section of this work is going to be a refutation of the over-exaggerations that can take place. So, let us uh, continue on in theological science. St. Thomas's intrinsic and scientific theological authority is likewise great, both in regard to St. Thomas himself and his doctrine. Okay, remember, intrinsic, person and works, scientific or extrinsic has to do with the declaration of an outward authority, which with um, theology is going to have to be the church. So his personal gifts of nature and grace wonderfully equipped him to grasp and expound sacred theology accurately and completely. He was fully versed in all the sources of sacred doctrine, the scriptures, tradition, the councils and decrees of teaching of the teaching church, the writings of the Latin and Greek church fathers and doctors. He received their references to the word of God with great faith and piety and sounded their depths through the gift of wisdom to such an extent that he was frequently wrapped in contemplation of the divine mysteries. Thus, in a vital manner, he intimately penetrated and tasted them. He wonderfully adapted the natural wisdom with which he was fully equipped and the skill of his genius, which was destined for divine things, to the examination, illustration, and defense of those truths of faith with scientific methodology. This methodology bore both upon the truths he knew naturally by analogy and upon the connection of the mysteries themselves with man's ultimate end. This is a reference to uh, uh, Vatican I. In this manner, his way was lightened and directed by divine faith and then of the gift of wisdom. As Pius XI uh, apposited, appositely, I've never heard of this word. What? Appositely? Appositely. Let me, let me look. What is that? What is it? Appositely. Well suited for the purpose. Appropriate. I'll just say appropriately. As Pius XI appropriately said, this is the region in which faith is supreme, and the science of faith is called theology. Science of this kind will be all the more perfect in a man in proportion as he is better acquainted with evidence for faith and has at the same time a more fully developed and trained faculty of philosophizing. Leo XIII tells us, There is needed a use of philosophy, both perpetual and manifold, in order that sacred theology may assume and put on the nature, the habit, and character of true science. This being the case, one may assert without boasting that there was never a theologian stronger in faith than Aquinas, one richer in wisdom, better provided with a deep understanding of philosophy, nor one more dedicated to the study of divine truth. So true. He made his own wor own the words of St. Hilary. I regard this as the chief task of my life, my obligation to God, 
to see to it that my every word and meaning bespeaks God. <coughs> the, the following, taken from his own work, exactly corresponds to this axiom. Since the perfection of man consists in his union with God, a man should rest in and be attracted to divine things with all his power, as much as he is able, so that his intellect may be free for contemplation and his reason for the investigation of divine things. According to Psalm 72, it is good for me to do adhere to my God. And again, he says, the human mind ought always to be moved more and more to a knowledge of God, according to the measure that is proper to it, that is, in the highest degree possible. It should not, then, be considered unusual that as many great perfections flowed into his theological works. Nor should there be any doubt, as Pius XI says, that Aquinas raised theology to the highest eminence of dignity. He treated every part of theology most skillfully and enriched theology as a whole, lavishing upon it the incredible luxuriance of his genius. He laid solid and lasting foundations for that fundamental part of theology called apologetics. Succeeding theologians have reared their structure upon the basis he had afforded, such as his distinction between natural and supernatural truths concerning God, the proper qualities of each, the nature of revelation and faith, the possibility and necessity of revelation, the credibility of the mysteries of faith, and the motives supporting it. Cajetan, Banya, Zumel, Navarrete, uh, Nazarius, John of St. Thomas, and the Samanthachenses developed the principles of apologetics supplied by Aquinas in learned commentaries on the Prima Secundae and the Secunda Secundae, where the nature of faith and theology is treated. Through them, these principles were made available to later Thomists, who brought out special works suited to our times, as Cardinal Zigliara, Fathers Gardel, and Garrigou Lagrange. And the work they're talking about by Garrigou Lagrange is De Revelazione, which my friend, my friend Ethan and I should actually be starting a, a series on this Thursday. Um, so hopefully that will start this Thursday. We've had some uh, issues getting it getting it started. We've been talking about it for months, but yeah, that'll be soon. So the treatises on the church itself viewed by modern theologians as the mystical body of Christ, its constitution, qualities, and marks, the primacy and infallibility of the Roman pontiff, the members of the church, all had St. Thomas as their precursor, and in tall intents and purposes, their creator. He outlined the basic foundations later developed by his famous pupils, John of Torquemada, Cajetan, Banyes, Nazarius. Through them, his fundamental ideas passed into the modern tract De Ecclesia Christi. That the theological method, contained especially in his tract De Locis Theologicis, came chiefly from St. Thomas, is frankly stated by their famous Melchior Cano, founder and parent of this branch of theological science. Okay, actually, I didn't I didn't notice this until now. But now that I think of it, De Revelatione, De Ecclesia, De Locis, all of these had like Dominicans as their founders who were strong Thomists. Coincidence? I think not. He says, as a manifestation of my gratitude, I bow to him to whom I owe so much, and I ever admit my lasting indebtedness to him and his task. For my part, St. Thomas was both author and teacher in the composition of this work. Even dogmatic theology, also found in Thomas by far the richest of all commentators. With so much acumen did he treat the nature of God and his attributes, his unity, goodness, perfection, simplicity, infinity, immensity, eternity, incomprehensibility, ineffably, ineffability, omniscience, beatitude, providence, omnipotence, the mysteries of the divine will and predestination that he left for succeeding theologians an opportunity to imitate, but not to equal or surpass. Clearly and aptly describe the intimate life of God and the trinity of persons, as far as that can be done by one not yet in heaven. He delineated with amazing penetration the creation of the world, man, angels, and the elevation of man and angels to the supernatural order, along with the fall of both. He treated also of the divine conservation and direction of all creatures. Never was there a theologian who so subtly uh, uh, penetrated or fully and clearly explained the nature, faculties, and operations of human and angelic creatures. In exploring and elucidating the mysteries of the incarnation and redemption and other mysteries hidden in the life and death of Christ, he appeared to have wrestled the honors from other theologians, just as he did in his hymning and explanation of the sacrament of the Eucharist and his eschatological questions. There's actually something really cool that um, Sudiorum Duchem talks about, that St. Thomas also in a certain way becomes like the um, ultimate um, uh, liturgist. Uh, when he's writing his Corpus Christi uh, office. 
St. Thomas was not also the ultimate, not only the ultimate philosopher, not only the ultimate theologian, he was the ultimate mystic, he was the ultimate moralist, he was the ultimate uh, um, uh, hymnologist, if you want to put it like that. When he finished his tract on the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, he received the praise and approbation of the Lord himself, who said, Well, have you written of me, Thomas? Indeed, his tract on the sacrament was clearly miraculous, said Benedict XV. One must place, and, and honestly, it's like, this is this is real. This is all real. Because when you look at how some of this stuff was treated before the time of St. Thomas, it, was, um, it, w it wasn't like that. It was... Um, like clearly just wrong. It's just that it was disordered, I guess would be the best uh, way of putting it. It just wasn't like clearly and profoundly stated. And then just Thomas comes through and was just like, Pah. and then everything gets snapped right in order. Okay, here you go. One must place the same evaluation upon his moral theology, dealing with the direction of human acts to a supernatural end. No ecclesiastical writer, father or theologian, deeply, so deeply, fully and clearly explain the ultimate end of man, human acts, the passions, the divine law and its precepts, grace, the vices, and the moral and theological virtues. Because uh, St. Thomas, while he, he is not the moral doctor of the church, he's the common doctor of the church, the moral doctor of the church, St. Alph Alphonsus Liguori, which uh, people have been requesting that I do something on him, so maybe I will. St. <coughs> Alphonsus Liguori, was sat at the feet of St. Thomas uh, for when it came to the learning of moral theology. And all of his sources also sat at the feet of St. Thomas. It was this part of theology which, in the estimation of his contemporaries, Aquinas especially enriched. They called him the renowned instrument of God in theology and philosophy, and especially in moral theology. Who, was, uh, who said this? 27. Uh, Ptolemaeus de Luca. Oh, ecclesiastical history. Interesting. I've actually never heard that quote before outside of here. Um, there you go. He not only uh, treated the life of the individual as regards uh, regulated by the moral law, but in addition, exposed the principles and doctrine upon which a rich family life must rest, as well as the rights and duties of parents. Likewise, he discussed the implications of social life and the true and safe direction of conduct among nations. All of these he handled from the viewpoint, both of nature and of grace. And for his teaching on personal prudence and the prudence of rulers, right and justice, authority and obedience, private property and almsgiving, war and peace, the rights of nations and their mutual obligations. All these were fruitfully developed in later times by Cajetan, Francisco de Vitoria, uh, Dominic de Soto, Banez and others. So when you get all this uh, modern academy soy jacking about the uh, school of Salamanca, having all of this amazing political theory stuff, the reason they were amazing in political theory, why is it? Anyone want to guess? Because they all were reading Thomas. That's why. And applied later to the texture development and preservation of American law. I don't know about this one. Actually, uh, Ramirez wasn't even, uh, uh, Ramirez was Spanish. So maybe he actually is uh, not being like, what, like weird sort of patriotism that some like American writers have to be like, actually Aquinas was like heavily influential on in, uh, American law. Maybe, maybe. Even at present, his principles are considered to be of profound practical worth and hold a position of respect. Okay, here, here's where we get, here's where we get into the good stuff. With singular dignity and loftiness of thought, he enhanced and advanced ascetical and mystical theology. Depth, devotion, and thoroughness mark from start to finish his treatments of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the fruits and the Beatitudes, the indwelling of the Holy Trinity, and the souls of the just, the active and contemplative life, prayer in the mystical states, religious and episcopal perfection, rewards and effects of burning and ardent charity. This is actually... Uh, personal opinion here. This is where St. Thomas's influence comes together the strongest uh, in Vatican II. It was the universal call of holiness. Because you had Garrigou Lagrange reading St. Thomas, commenting upon St. Thomas. Uh, you had Secunda Secunde, uh, Q184, Article 3. Uh, gets quoted over and over and over again by the popes. And then Garrigou puts it all together in the three ages of the interior life rebuking some of the um, Carmelite uh, errors when it came to the universal call of the mystical life. And St. Thomas uh, 
is, is the is the originator uh, of all of that. And actually, this is one of the areas that uh, SCOTUS um, falls into error with and uh, can't be held after uh, the Council of Trent. But that's, again, a story for a different day. So uh, this is uh, St. Saint, Saint Thomas's, um, I, I think, one of the most important fields has to do with his ascetical and mystical theology. Um, influential Vatican II, also Catechism of the Catholic Church um, as well. These are his famous words on the verse, taste and see that the Lord is sweet. In the material order, we first see and then taste. But in spiritual things, one must first taste in order to see, because no one knows who does not taste. Therefore, the psalmist says, first taste and then see. In another place, he adds, we should understand divine things according to this unifying action of grace, not as if divine things were drawn down to the level of our being but rather our whole being is established above nature and God, with the result that we become totally godlike through his unifying action of grace. In his exegesis in biblical theology, he completely and learnedly interpreted sacred scripture. First, he firmly established and clearly explained the fundamental principles of this study, its nature, which, as the word of God, has God inspiring it as its principal author, and the man who is inspired, whom he explained the nature of inspiration in the light of prophecy, its truth in that it is the word of God who cannot deceive or be deceived, its multiple senses, the equivocal sense and others proceeding one from the other, but all developing upon the one fundamental literal sense. And finally, he discusses the development of divine revelation in the Old Testament and how it was suited in manner of its preservation to the cultural conditions of the Jews of whom it was given. Not only uh, the development of divine revelation of the Old Testament, but also the development of doctrine through the history of the church, which uh, pick up the, uh, a brief introduction to the development of doctrine by Father Thomas Gilby, if you want to know more about St. Thomas's uh, work on the development of doctrine. But I continue. He commented on the chief books of the scriptures, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Job, the Psalter of David in the Old Testament, and the New Testament besides the golden uh, chain on the four Gospels, a work of great learning and incredible labor in which he collected and ordered with wonderful precision whatever the whole tradition of the Greek and Latin fathers had brought forth. He wrote special expositions on the Gospels of Matthew and John and all of the Pauline epistles. In these commentaries, especially on the Gospel of St. John and the Epistles of St. Paul, there is a marvelous fullness of biblical and theological teaching, dogmatic, moral, and spiritual. The result is that they form an inexhaustible gold mine for exegetes, theologians, preachers, and all those who strive for perfection. St. Thomas's theology, as a complete unit, possesses such dignity that it surpasses every human science in its theoretical aspect and every practical science in its regulation and direction of human action. In its supernatural grasp and tendency, it is without peer. As Cardinal Bossarian said, among the saints, he is the most learned, and among the learned, the most saintly. And for that reason, he is the prince of all theologians. What Thomas has said about the perfect theologian fits no other theologian, as well as Thomas himself. Quote, the doctrine of sacred scripture and sacred theology has this peculiarity, that its contents, content is not only speculative as in geometry, but practical as well, and that it perfects the affections. It is for this reason that Matthew says, he that, does do, he that shall do and teach, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In other sciences, it is sufficient for a man to be perfect intellectually. In this science, one must be perfect not only intellectually, but morally as well. Such pull, uh, fullness and inherent perfection of St. Thomas's theology is apparent to anyone who reads or studies his ma many theoretical theological works, or to put it briefly, his major and minor works. His minor works are on the perfection of the spiritual life, which all of you should read, on the two pre uh, precepts of charity and the Ten Commandments, on the articles of faith, and uh, sacraments of the church against the errors of the greeks on the form of absolution on the reasons of the faith the compendium of theology um, exposition in the first and second uh, decretals in the uh, lord's prayer in uh, commentary on the ave maria and commentary on the apostles creed his major works are commentary on the four books of the sentences of peter lombard um, disputed questions and uh, quod libits, uh, such as De Potentia, um, on the union of the incarnate word, on evil, on the virtues in common, on the senses of sacred scripture, and especially his uh, Summe, so Summa Congenitalis and Summa Theologiae. 
uh, the celebrated words of William of Toko apply quite accurately to his major works. Thomas instituted new articles in his teaching, discovered a new and brilliant method in his presentation, and adduced new reasons in support of his arguments. No one who heard him teach new things and illustrate doubtful matters with new reasons would doubt that God had enlightened him with the rays of a new light. So swift and certain in judgment was he, that he did not hesitate to teach and write new opinions, which God had thought worthy to inspire anew. And I'm going to check the, the live chats real quick. Yeah. TLDR, St. Thomas was a complete unit. Where is this, uh, Job? Oh, did I? Uh, yeah, I've, I've always pronounced acetical. Acet yeah, it's acetical. Sorry. Uh, oh, Hassan is correcting everybody right now in the live chat. Okay, continuing on, one hour in, 15 pages in, let's go. This will be an hour's long defense of our doctor. Doubtless, besides his, if we ever, if we get to uh, noon, we'll have to make sure we say the Angelus. So if we're here for another two hours, uh, somebody remind me. Doubtless, besides his angelic genius, fortified with heavenly gifts of nature and grace, the causes of this fresh approach seem to be a profound knowledge of the sources and instruments of theology, and a more precise and dexterous application of them. He channeled into the service and utility of theology, his fuller, more accurate knowledge of scripture and the tradition of the fathers, his truer and more penetrating appraisal of reality, which stemmed from a more refined and penetrating grasp of philosophy. Previous theologians, and some of his own time as well, very timidly applied reason and human science to explain theological uncertainties and questions. Such usage was aimed more at literary ornamentation than fuller understanding. But Thomas, following in the footsteps of his beloved master, St. Albert the Great, called upon every human science and all the powers of reason to be of service, not as masters, but as servants in the defense, illustration, and explanation of the faith. For Thomas said, since grace does not destroy nature but perfects it, natural reason should minister to the faith as the natural bent of the will ministers to charity. And so, Thomas completed the work of renovation and con consolidation of divine and human science begun by Albert and brought it to perfection. He established two bodies of doctrine, essentially distinct, philosophy and theology. Both enjoy full autonomy in their own field in such a way that there is not and cannot be any real opposition or contradiction between them. Rather, there is marvelous harmony through their mutual aid and assistance. For reason should be subordinate to faith and serve it as nature serves grace and the creature serves the creator. So it happens that theology, without in the slightest abandoning its character as effective knowledge aimed towards piety, as many theologians of this time asserted, assumed at the same time the nature of a precise science, since it is truly and in a full sense the science of faith. This work of such tremendous volume, fruitfulness, value, for which St. Thomas strenuously labored and spent himself, suffered calumny and persecution while he was living and even after his death. These attacks reached their culmination in the condemnation of the several propositions by Stephen Tempierre, John Peckham, and Robert Kilwalby. But undaunted, he was victorious in every skirmish, and as Pius XI said, like gold which no acid can dissolve, so he retained his force and splendor and still retains it. In witness of this are the words of the professors of the Faculty of Arts of the University of Paris, calling him morning star preeminent in the world, radiance and light of the age indeed. We may say a light greater than the light of day. And by singular privilege given to the words by the author of nature to illumine the secrets of nature. We find the same praise in a lament of the death of Thomas written the same year. His hearers and pupils are of the same mind. He is celebrated by... Uh, Remigius uh, Girolamus as teacher among teachers and saint at summit of perfection. Ptolemy of Lucca, quote, Thomas was the arc of philosophy and theology. According to Rambert de Primadiza of Bologna, quote, he wrote unexcelled treatises overflowing with truth. Through whose mouth spoke St. Augustine, Boethius, and Anselm Richard of St. Victor, and all who had any learning. Further, they had no hesitation in comparing him to the fathers, especially to St. Augustine and to the great apostle Paul, blessed James Cap Capuachi of Viterbo, sorry, 
believed according to faith in the Holy Ghost, that our Savior, the teacher of the church, truth, for the enlightenment of the world and the universal church, had sent Paul the Apostle and, late, and later Augustine, and recently Brother Thomas, whom he believed would not be supplanted by one of greater authority even to the end of the world. Despite the attacks of his rivals, his authority increased and reached such a point that he convinced every mind and allied it to his teaching and was hailed as the universal master and teacher, as Bartholomew of Capua, who had known him personally, testified. Though after his death, the writings of Brother Thomas were impugned by many great men and subjected to the test of sharp criticism, nevertheless, his authority never decreased, but rather waxed stronger. With reverence and respect, it was diffused over the whole earth. Since, as Blessed James of Viterbo says, in his writings are found universal truth, universal clarity, universal enlightenment, and the universal order and doctrine necessary for arriving quickly at perfect understanding, Saints, uh, well, sorry, Stephen de uh, Salonhoc, before the year 1278, wrote, Brother Thomas of Aquin in Apulia is an outstanding doctor, famous throughout the world. He wrote much, and the whole East and West, with impartial judgment, embraced his safe and clear doctrine. They held. Uh, that's actually kind of a uh, kind of cool. He's still writing that. Uh, that even even like four years after his death, they were writing that Saint Thomas's doctrine was safe, which the Church would eventually uh, adopt as their position. They held it in admiration, rejoiced, and gloried in its possession. His doctrine as a shining light endures and increases up until the day when the morning light will rise. All use him as a source, even his rivals and disparag the disparagers who do so slyly. This is this is honestly so real. This is this is the realest thing I've heard all day. In the succeeding centuries, and even up to our own time, he has elicited the approbation or at least the admiration of men by his genius, genius and knowledge. This is especially true of the learned and even those not of the faith. If we listen to Erasmus, there was no theologian equal in industry or more balanced in genius or more solid of learning. Leibniz admired the solidity of his doctrine. Christian von Wolff, the keenness of his intelligence. Dame, uh, James Brucker, the excellence of his mind fullness of his teaching and his tireless industry, Harnock, the Herculean strength of his understanding, and R. Searberg salutes Thomas as the greatest of the theologians and philosophers of the church, who planted on high the, strength, the standard of progress in, philosoph in philosophy and theology. Therefore, the intrinsic strength of the doctrine of St. Thomas in philosophy and theology is so great that it is rated the highest, not only by his supporters and friends, but even by his rivals and enemies. Okay. So up to this point, uh, I'm going to take a brief break uh, right now. Got to refill my water. So the first, the first like hour of this, some somebody like <laughs> remind me one hour and seven minutes so I can put like tags in this uh, because I want to I want to split this up so people can like skip around and watch various sections that they want. So all of this just has been about his intrinsic authority of uh, philosophy and theology. Now we're getting into the canonical authority which is going to be um, the statements of the church. And this is where we're going to start to get into um, get into the crying. Okay, so I will be back in like two minutes.
Okay, I am back. So somebody was asking about whether I was going to go over the post-Vatican II popes. Wonderful uh, profile picture of Kano. Uh, eventually, I will do a like supplement um, going over individual popes and then also uh, canon law. I think that would be really cool uh, to do. I've done like minor research in that. Nothing that's like insanely like detailed like this is um, from Ramirez. Uh, but eventually that'd be something cool to uh, add, make this into like a little playlist. But OK, so we've spent the last hour uh, looking at the intrinsic authority in philosophy and theology. Remember, um, intrinsic has to do with the works that they have done and the their intrinsic genius. So that's what we've looked at in terms of philosophy and theology. So. Um, yeah. So now we're finally going to be getting into the statements of the church on this matter, um, when it comes to his authority. So canonical authority of the doctor communis of the church, this authority, which may be called dogmatic corresponds to the conformity of a theological or philosophical doctrine with divine revelation. It is measured by the approbation and commendation of the teaching authority of the church, whose function it is to judge such conformity. So when it comes to the canonical or extrinsic uh, authority, whatever you want to call it, it's going to be reliant on statements of the church. So that's the only places we can look. Thus, the weight of this type of authority is wholly derived from the authority of the church. And then um, it's actually kind of funny because um, I, was, I was told that uh, this wasn't too... Um, Thomistic uh, to hold to certain authoritative doctors. But here is the, uh, the uh, very non-Thomistic St. Thomas saying, the teaching of Catholic doctors has its authority from the church. For that reason, we must rely upon the authority of the church, more upon the authority of an Augustine, a Jerome, or any other doctor. Okay, so the teaching of Catholic doctors has its authority from the church. Interesting, because I heard that the teaching of Catholic doctors has no authority from the church. And actually, that doesn't matter. But I continue. When the authority of the church consistently and over a long period approves and commends the doctrine of anyone for all the faithful, it makes that doctrine its own and invests it with its own authority. So when I say something like Thomism uh, in a certain sense is Catholicism, or Thomism is identical with Catholicism, or so on and so forth. This is what I mean. Exactly. Just like we may say that the Franciscan order, consistently and over a long period of time, approving commends the doctrine of Blessed John and Scotus. Then we would be able to say that the Franciscan order has made the teaching of Scotus its own, and invests it with its own authority. It's totally fine to say. The church does not create the force of, and truth of that doctrine out of nothing, but rather supposes its existence and recognizes it, authoritatively po proposing it to be followed and imitated. The manner of such approbation is similar to that by which canonization of one of the faithful by the church does not create but supposes the sanctity of the person. The church merely recognizes that sanctity and authoritatively proposes it for veneration and imitation. Primarily, the church approves and commends theological doctrine, which deals per se with divinely revealed truths. But secondarily, it can approve philosophical doctrine, which is properly concerned with truths of the natural order, insofar as that doctrine is in conformity with the truths of the supernatural order. For this reason, Benedict XV called it philosophy according to Christ. And so the canonical doctrine of St. Thomas should be treated first in the field of theology and then in philosophy, because philosophy supposes the authority in theology. So this is this is going to be the massive section. So the authority, the canonical authority of St. Thomas in theology. John the 22nd, who canonized St. Thomas, said before the cardinals in consistory, when a motion was initiated to begin the process of canonization, quote, his life was saintly and his doctrine could only be miraculous because he enlightened the church more than all the other doctors. Notice this is like 50, less than 50 years after his death. Yeah, less than 50 years because it was 1320, I think, when the canonization progress, process started and he died in 1274. 
This is less than 50 years after his death that he's saying that he enlightened the church more than all the other doctors, and that his doctrine is miraculous. So this this isn't this isn't like, oh, actually, like the Leonine popes were hating modernism so much and they decided that they wanted to uh, adopt Thomism as their own because Scotism was kind of weak at the time. No, no, no. That, that's ridiculous. This has been consistent for 700 years at this point. By the use of his works, a man would profit more in one year than if he studied the doctrines of all others for of, of others for his whole life. At the completion of the process of canonization, when more than 300 miracles performed by St. Thomas had been recounted, the pontiff said, why should we seek more articles? He has performed as many miracles as he wrote. Well, why should we seek more miracles? He has performed as many miracles as he wrote articles. Truly this glorious doctor, after the apostles and the early doctors, has greatly enlightened the church. Clement VI, in his letter in Ordine a Fratrum uh, Predicatorum, in, sorry, at first I thought that was English, and I started reading it like English, of February the 6th, 1344, directed to the faithful, praised the order of preachers for producing, quote, that famous and fruitful branch, the blessed Thomas of Aquin, outstanding doctor and confessor, the whole church gathering many fruits of his spiritual maturity from the writing and teaching of his wisdom and doctrine is consistently refreshed by their aroma. Further, the same pontiff proclaimed in the Dominican general chapter held at Breves in 1346, less than, still less than 100 years after his death, that all the brethren are expressly forbidden even to dare to withdraw from the doctrine of St. Thomas. It's crazy. It's a pontiff saying this to the Dominicans. For blessed Urban V, the mind of St. Thomas was the treasury of divine wisdom, which, with the aid of divine grace, quote, has unlocked the hidden things of scripture, solved its puzzles, brought light to its difficulties, and cleared up its questions. And he added, quote, at Toulouse, there is a new university for theology, which we wish to be founded on the solid and firm doctrine of that saint. To the Archbishop of Toulouse and to all the masters and doctors of the university, he wrote, quote, We wish, and the purpose of the present letter is, to enjoin upon you that you follow the doctrine of the blessed Thomas as the true and Catholic doctrine, and endeavor to spread it with all your power. Indeed, as Nicholas V said, by his doctrine, the universal church is enlightened, because he, on the word of Alexander VI, Quote, a, as a splendor light, enlighten the Christian world in every respect. Pius IV heartily praised the custom of the University of Salamanca for his yearly celebration of his feast in the Dominican Church of St. Stephen and granted many indulgences so that the great devotion might attend the feast. Of such a great doctor, whose doctrine, as everyone knows, brought and daily brings such great fruit to the church, end quote. He further invited all to imitate that custom and follow his doctrine. St. Pius V, who declared him a doctor of the universal church, recognized in Thomas, quote, the most brilliant light of the church. Notice, most brilliant light of the church. This is a superlative. Most brilliant light of the church. Does that mean all the other lights are, uh, are, are all the other scholastic lights are all on the same level and that we have to have some sort of equity between them? No, most brilliant light of the church, whose works are, quote, the most certain rule of Christian doctrine by which he enlightened the apostolic church and answered conclusively numberless errors, which illumination has often been evident in the past and recently stood forth prominently in the decrees of the Council of Trent to the most certain rule of Christian doctrine. He also said of Aquinas that, quote, his theological doctrine accepted by the Catholic church. And here we get the money right here. We get the money who, who, uh, Right, right here. Here's where we get the money. Right here. Outshines every other as being safer and more secure. So, St. Thomas Aquinas, safest doctor, safest doctor, safest and most secure to hold to his positions. Boom. Right here. Obvious. Clear. The safest to hold to. This isn't my words. This isn't something I made up. This is St. Pius V, right here. St. Pius V. Let's continue.
Clement VIII praised him as the angelic interpreter of the divine will and added, quote, the proof of his doctrine is the great number of books which he wrote in a very short time in practically every branch of learning in remarkable order and wonderful planning. And what, what do we have here? What do we have here? And with no error at all. With no error at all. I don't think I would even make this statement, actually. This is crazy that you have popes making this statement. Nah, he's, he's just the same as everybody else, bro. You got Thomas, you got Scotus, they're, ba Bonavent, they're basically all on the same level, guys. Don't, don't worry about it. Actually, this is just, uh, this is just MT being MT. He's just crazy, insane, uh, going off on, on Twitter and such. You know, if, if me, if me making the statements I said were, were quote, scandalous, what, what are you going to say to, uh, Pope Clement VIII by saying there's no error at all in his works? What are you going to say to that? There's nothing to say, actually. And then look at this. While writing these works, he had the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, speaking to him. And at the command of God, they explained certain passages to him. When he finished his works, he heard them approved by the express word of Christ the Lord. For Paul V, St. Thomas is the shining athlete of the Catholic faith. Quote, by the shield of whose works the church militant happily escaped the darts of heretics, defender of the Catholic church and conqueror of heretics. Making this idea his own, Benedict XIII wrote to the brethren of the Order of Preachers, Pursue with energy your doctor's works, more brilliant than the sun, and written without the shadow of error. Notice this, written without the shadow of error. That's like a pretty intense statement to make. These works made the church illustrious with wonderful erudition, since they march ahead and proceed with unimpeded step, protecting and vindicating by the surest rule of Catholic doctrine the truth of our holy religion. His doctrine, continually commended to the faithful by the constant approbation of the Supreme Pontiffs, cannot be adorned with praise befitting its great merits in the church. That same doctrine, lighting up the whole world as the sun, brought forth tremendous goods for the Christian church and every day bears more fruit. Benedict XIV, again, brought these things to mind and adopted them in the bull approving the Theological College of St. Denis outside of Granada on August 21st, 1756 at the time oh 1756 that sounds like the uh, leonine revival right guys um just kidding at the time he greatly praised and confirmed its statutes which commanded that quote henceforth none of the masters or lectors of the college of saint dennis shall read hand down or explain any other doctrine to their students in that college end quote having himself written many le learned works the pontiff freely confessed on his own behalf, quote, in the works we have written on various points, after we had diligently pursued and examined the opinion of the angelic doctor, we adhered and subscribed freely to his ever admirable doctrine. We candidly confess that if there is anything great in our books, it must be ascribed wholly to such a great doctor rather than to ourselves. The same pontiff continued, quote, the other praises of the holy doctors are surpassed by this. What, what is this? Is he the greatest? No, this can't be. The other praises of the holy doctors are surpassed by this, that he never despised his opponents or seemed to vilify or betray them, but treated all courteously and very humanely. If he came upon any of their expressions, which were inaccurate, ambiguous, or obscure, he would temper his criticism with a smooth and benign interpretation. If the cause of religion or faith demanded that he investigate and refute their opinion, he would accomplish the refutation with so much discretion that he deserved no less praise for his matter of disagreement than for his assertion of the Catholic truth. Pius VI would not at all allow, quote, that the divine eloquence of Thomas should be bandied about, bandied about, as if it were a novel doctrine impugned by idle discussion, since, as he himself later said, quote, in many schools, Thomas Aquinas was rightly called the son of doctrine in the standard for theologians, because he taught only what was consistent with sacred scripture and the fathers. Very interesting. Everything he wrote it is worthy, as it is piously said, of divine confirmation. Very interesting. And so our predecessors commended his doctrine with outstanding praises as the shield of Christian religion and the resolute guardian of the church. Recently, Benedict XIV, whose wisdom we thoroughly admired, ordered Thomistic doctrine to be restored in the College of St. Dionysius the Areopagite. 
outside of Granada and proposed the penalty of interdict for everyone who departed from him. Blessed Pius IX said, The facts testify that the church in the ecumenical councils held after his death so used his writings that many of the decrees propounded found their very source in his words and sometimes even the same words were used to clarify Catholic dogmas or destroy rising errors. This is actually interesting. Looking at all of those disputed points uh, in Catholic doctrine that were defined by the very words of St. Thomas. It's crazy. The very words that he wrote were used uh, to clarify uh, or define or to teach um, uh, by the church, even on certain uh, issues that Thomas disagrees with other schools about. Louis the Thirteenth, recalling all these instances and going beyond them, recollected with approval that Thomas's doctrine was present at the deliberations and decrees of the fathers in all the ecumenical councils held after his death. Not only was it present, but practically presiding, quote, and contending with irresistible force, the auspicious result against the errors of the Greeks, heretics, and rationalists, end quote. The pontiff added, quote, this is the greatest glory of Thomas, although his own and shared with no other Catholic doctor, that the fathers of Trent, in order to proceed in an orderly fashion during the conclave, desired to have opened upon the altar, together with the scriptures and the decrees of the Supreme Pontiff, the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas, whence they could draw counsel, reasons, and answers, end quote. Leo XIII himself desired nothing more than, quote, that the excellent wisdom of the angelic doctor flow far and wide. There is nothing more suitable to oppose the perverse notions of our times. There is nothing more powerful. There is no more powerful agent for conserving the truth, end quote. Truly, quote, anyone seriously interested in philosophy and theology and desirous of attaining some proficiency in those disciplines needs nothing more than a great familiarity with the Summa Contra Gentiles and the Summa Theologiae, end quote. Indeed, quote, the book par excellence, when students can study scholastic theology with much profit, is the Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas. And those who are doing any work in sacred science, so sharply attacked at present, have a source in the volumes of St. Thomas, whence they can fully demonstrate the basis of Christian faith, whence they can convince others of supernatural truth, and whence they can repel the vicious attacks of the enemy upon our holy religion, end quote. The pontiff was lavish in his praise of Francis Satoli, later Cardinal Prefect of the Sacred Congregation of Studies, for his edition of commentaries, quote, on the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas, so that his readers might not own, not allow the text of the angelic doctor to escape from their hands. In this way, only and not otherwise will the genuine doctor of St. Thomas flourish in the schools, which is the very close to our heart. For the method of teaching, which relies upon the authority and judgment of several masters, has a changeable basis. In that, mutually contradictory opinions arise, which cannot be reconciled with the mind of St. Thomas. Notice this. The method of teaching, which relies upon the authority and judgment of several masters, has a changeable basis, and that mutually contradictory opinions arise which cannot be reconciled with the mind of St. Thomas. All the Leo XIII is saying is that you can have many sources, but you got to have one master. Continuing. Then, too, such diverse opinions nourish dissension and, and disagreement, which can no longer disturb Catholic schools without great harm to Christian knowledge. We desire that teachers of sacred theology, imitating the Tridentine Fathers, should wish to have the Summa of St. Thomas open on their desks before them, whence they might find counsel, argument, and theological conclusions. From such schools, the Church may rightly expect fearless soldiers who can destroy, who can destroy air and defend Catholicism. End quote. It's actually kind of funny. I have, uh, I have St. Thomas's Summa open on my desk right now, on like a little stand. Continuing. He also strongly praised A. Bresny for editing the works of Cardinal uh, Peter Pesmani. Quote, Pesmani is one who with profound sense and lofty erudition has issued treatises on the nob nobler branches of learning. He followed as leader and master our remarkable Thomas, who is easily the prince of sacred science, end quote. He assisted yet more urgently, quote, this point is vital that bishops expend every effort to see that young men Des, uh, destined to be the hope of the church, should be imbued with the holy and heavenly doctrine of the angelic doctor. In those places where young men have devoted themselves to the patronage and doctrine of St. Thomas, true wisdom will flourish. 
drawn as it is from solid principles and explained by reason in an orderly fashion. We know that the Catholic clergy will be more solidly penetrated by divine science the more fully and thoroughly it is imbued with the doctrine of St. Thomas Aquinas. The more the clergy is penetrated by the doctrine of St. Thomas, the more it will go forth instructed with song, stronger basis for a solid faith, and so much the more fruitful and useful will be its ministry to the faithful. Furthermore, those who impede Catholic truth with fallacious arguments will find its defenders better prepared and supplied with excellent wiz weapons for a strenuous defense, end quote. If sacred theology is seen to flourish in progress according to the mind of St. Thomas, that fact should be a cause for rejoicing. So the Archbishop of Milan is congratulated upon the restoration in the theological faculty of Milan of, quote, theology proceeding correctly and well according to the plan and method of Aquinas in accordance with our command. Every day we become more clearly aware how powerfully sa sacred doctrine taught by its master and patron Thomas affords the greatest possible utility for both clergy and laity, end quote. In following the leadership of Thomas, scholars enter upon the right path for seeking a knowledge of the mysteries of the faith, as far as this life allows it. And so, quote, it is right that young men in the academies and schools should be chiefly exercised in acquiring a scientific knowledge of dogma by means of reasoning from the articles of the faith to their consequences, according to the rules of approved and sound philosophy. Yet the judicious and instructed theologian will by no means pass by that method of doctrine which draws its proof from the authority of the Bible. For theology does not receive its principles from any other science, but immediately from God by revelation. So it does not receive of other sciences as from a superior, but uses them as her inferiors and handmaids. It is this view of doctrinal teaching which is laid down and recommended by the Prince of Theologians, Aquinas, end quote. I'm going to check the live chat. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think it has to do with a uh, damnable error. Okay, uh, basically he sent, yeah, by that he's just saying that it's safe uh, when he describes it as having no error at all. Okay, so <laughs> Hounds of Justice, this is all true. So true. Continuing. St. Thomas is to be considered the master not only in speculative theology, but also in positive theology and biblical exegesis. This is actually really cool. Um, how far, just in every single discipline, his, his theology has been praised by the church. Like every single integral part of theology, every single like um, science of philosophy, everything. Ev li like literally everything from logic to like mystical theology. They're like, he's the best and you got to follow him. Okay, continuing. The pontiff went on, quote, care must be taken that young men approach biblical studies suitably instructed and formed. Otherwise, just hopes will be frustrated or what is worse, they will unthinkingly risk the danger of error, falling an easy prey to the sophism and labored erudition of the rationalists. They will be very well prepared indeed if by the method we have pointed out and prescribed, they studiously cultivate and thoroughly understand philosophy and theology under the leadership of St. Thomas. In this way, they will be well prepared to begin the study both of the Bible and of positive theology, and will make satisfactory progress in both. By his own example, the pontiff strengthened this admonition, for in his learned and salutary encyclical letters, he always uh, used St. Thomas as his guide and uh, preceptor, this can be easily recognized in his encyclical Proventissimus Deus on the study of sacred scripture, the encyclicals Immortale Dei and Sapientiae Christiane on the Christian constitution of states and the civil duties of Christians, the encyclicals Rerum Novarum and Libertas on social and political questions, the encyclical uh, Satis uh, Cognitum on the, authority, on the unity of the church, the encyclicals uh, Temes, uh, Tametsi, and uh, Mire uh, Caritatis on Christ the Redeemer, and the Holy Eucharist, and the encyclical uh, Divinum Illud Munus on the action of the Holy Spirit and the souls of the just, and many others. Saint Pius X made all these remarkable approbations of Thomistic theology his own, and asserted that the chief of Leo's praises in his restoration of the doctrine of Saint Thomas. Oh yeah, Pius X goes like even, even stronger. It's great. 
For he, quote, restored the angelic doctor as the leader and master of theology, whose divine genius fashioned weapons marvelously suited to protect the truth and destroy the many errors of the times. Indeed, those principles of wisdom useful for all time, which the Holy Fathers and doctors passed on to us, have been organized by no one more aptly than by St. Thomas, and no one has explained them more clearly, end quote. He also found much consolation in the fact that the study of theology in the University of Freiburg in Switzerland, quote, was being guided by Dominican brethren who, following a true appraisal of science, especially of sacred science, clothe themselves with the security of true teaching, for they have their own brother in theology, that divine light, Thomas Aquinas, who was not only the prince, but also the leader and master of sacred schools. This is as our predecessor Leo the Thirteenth ordered, and we confirm that order with the certainty of fruitful results. End quote. In addition, he urged quote, that no one in any way whatsoever depart from the regulations of the church in the matter of teaching, rejecting modernistic fallacies. Let them deal only with the sources of sacred doctrine and well-based philosophy from the rich vein of the angelic doctor. End quote. Indeed, those who depart from Thomas, especially in theology, quote, seem to affect ultimately their own withdrawal from the church. So true, end quote. On the contrary, to follow Thomas as leader is the same as never departing from the rule of Christian truth. See, it's, it's completely uh, pious and in line with the statements of the Pope to make statements like Catholicism uh, and, and Thomas um, have an identity with one another. Tom, well, Thomism and Catholicism, that is. Quote, in this particular matter, no safer principle can be employed than to follow Thomas as leader and master. Those who write of divine things, according to his mind, draw great light and strength from this source, end quote. We consider, a, a quote, we consider a very great value, the doctrine of St. Thomas Aquinas, with which we especially wish all students to be imbued in order that they may sweep out depraved ideas of divine and human things, which insinuate themselves everywhere, and being solidly based in Christian truth themselves, may implant it deeply in the hearts of all. As we have said, one may not desert Aquinas, especially in philosophy and theology, without great harm. Following him is the safest way to a knowledge of divine things. And it's right here. Right there. Boom. Following him is the safest way to a knowledge of divine things. So we say St. Thomas is the most safe. I only say it because the church has already taught me to say it. Continuing, his golden doctrine lights up the mind with its own brilliance. His path and method lead to the deepest knowledge of divine things without any danger of error. Again, note, without any danger of error. Continuing, uh, end quote, actually. He added this most grave pronouncement in which unique doctrinal authority of the church is attributed to Aquinas. Quote, if the doctrine of any author or saint has ever been approved at any time by us or our predecessors with singular commendation joined with an invitation in order to propagate and defend it, it may easily be understood that it was com uh, commended only insofar as it agreed with the principles of Aquinas or was in no way opposed to them. Notice this. Look at this. Look at this right here. If I'm going to read this again, because I think this is honestly one of the best, one of the, uh, Best quotes, because anytime you're going to say, well, actually, the church uh, approved of this guy or that guy there or um, wherever it may be. And this guy actually disagrees with Aquinas. Look, look what look what Pius X is saying. St. Pius X, quote, if the doctrine of any author or saint has ever been approved at any time by us, so that St. Pius X, or our predecessor, so any other pope with singular commendation joined with an invitation in order to propagate and defend it. It may easily be understood that it was commended only insofar as it agreed with the principles of Aquinas or was in no way opposed to them. End quote. Continuing. So theology as taught in Catholic schools must strictly follow the true doctrine of Thomas. Quote, the master of sacred theology, teachers should prudently call to mind that the power to teach has been given to them not in order to pass on their own opinions to their students, but to impart to them the approved doctrines of the church. For the more profound study of this science, as it ought to be instituted in universities and colleges and in all seminaries and institutes empowered to grant academic degrees, and notice this is uh, in some way um, dependent on canon law, but we can still gather principles from it. It is of first importance that the old system of lecturing on the actual text of the Summa Theologica 
which should never have been allowed to fall into disuse, be revived. For the reason also that lectures on this book make it easier to understand, even to illustrate the solemn decrees of the teaching church and the acts which have since been passed. For ever since the happy death of the holy doctor, the church has not held a single council, but he has been present at it with the wealth of his own doctrine. And so, um, in order that the genuine and entire doctrine of St. Thomas may flourish in our schools, a hope which is very close to our heart, and in order that the system of teaching be abolished, which depends upon the authority and judgment of the individual teacher, and therefore has a changeable foundation, whence many diverse and mutually conflicting opinions arise, not without great injury to Christian learning, we will order and command that the teachers of sacred theology and universities, again, remember, this is canonical stuff, universities, acne, uh, acne, uh, academies, colleges, seminaries, institutes, having the power by apostolic indult to grant academic degrees and doctorates in that field, take the Summa Theologica as the text for their lectures and explain it in Latin. They should also take particular care that their students develop a deep affection for the Summa. In this way, and in no other, will theology be restored to its pristine dignity, and the proper order and value will be restored to the sacred studies and province of the intellect and, re and reason flower again in a second spring. That's the new springtime, boys. The new springtime. The Summa being lectured on, word by word, everywhere. End quote. The Roman pontiff himself explained the sense and force of his words in an audience granted the professors and students of the Angelicum College in Rome, June 20, 28, 1914, at which we were privileged to be present. Pius X said then that he wanted no other doctrine than that of Thomas in the Church of God. <laughs> um, in view of the fact that his is the pure, solid, complete doctrine of the church, and no more than that, the doctrine of Christ himself and of God himself. This is great. Like the, these guys, these guys are honestly making me look like I um, I fall short of the praises of Thomas. Look, look at this. His, that is Thomas, is the pure, solid, complete doctrine of the church. And no more than that, the doctrine of Christ himself and of God himself. Imagine if I just tweeted right now. The doctrine of Thomas is the doctrine of God himself and just left it like no, no, no quotes or anything. People just like flip their minds. No, actually, actually, guys, actually, guys, that is that is St. Pius X saying that that is St. Pius X. You know, for uh, I, I don't think it would be exactly uh, prudential to to uh, to send that tweet right now. But I, I'm, I'm very uh, tempted to do so just to show just to show uh, how. If people don't know that these quotes are from popes, they would probably just like flip out and like say a bunch of dumb stuff towards you. <coughs> but continuing. <coughs> ah. From this, the meaning of what he wrote a few days before to the College of St. Anselm in Rome is clearly evident. Quote, that the privilege of conferring all the academic decrees in philosophy and theology may bear more abundant fruit for the order and the church. We desire and command that the professors of the College of St. Anselm always follow the doctrine of Aquinas in philosophy and theology and use the text itself in their lectures to the students of theology who are working for degrees. Benedict XV unhesitatingly repeated the same thought, quote, It is a holy and salutary practice and practically necessary in Catholic schools where young men are acquiring a knowledge of philosophy and theology to have Thomas Aquinas as the supreme master. Therefore, what has been most wisely determined in this matter by our predecessor, especially Leo the Thirteenth and St. Pius X of happy memory, is to be retained whole and inviolate at all causes, co uh, costs. In addition, we consider it extremely useful if the angelic doctor were to step out from the very sanctuary of the school, as it were, and pro uh, proffer, proffer the almost divine light of his brilliance. Oh, I assume he meant offer. The almost divine light of his brilliance to all those who desire to be more deeply learned in their religion. For it is clear that the modernists, as they are called, have fallen into such a great variety of opinions, all distinct, uh, distant from the faith, precisely because they've neglected the principles and teaching of Thomas Aquinas. End quote. Uh, he wrote to Father Thessaling, quote, We know as well as our wise predecessors how to be zealous for the glory of Aquinas. So true, zealous for the glory of Aquinas. And we desire that this great doctor, 
as he is the more viciously assailed by the heretics of our time, should on that account be more conscientiously regarded as leader and master by students for the church in the study of philosophy and in sacred sciences, end quote. Indeed, he is the one, quote, whom as son of Dominic, God considered worthy to illuminate his church, quote, for he, with his marvelous wisdom and holiness, bound fast to himself every lover of the true and good, for, quote, who is there devoted to serious study with love of holy church, joined to zeal for learning, who does not most faithfully cherish Thomas Aquinas, whose doctrine by the gift of divine providence furnishes so uh, dependable a light for the church to strengthen the truth and destroy error forever. To the credit of the order of preachers, we must add this praise, not so much that it nourished the angelic doctor, but that never after, even in the slightest degree, has it deviated from his doctrine. End quote. To the Theological College of Bologna, he wrote, we note with approval that Thomas Aquinas is there held in a proper position of respect. Our predecessors, the illustrious Leo XIII and Pius X, extolled his doctrine with the highest praise and prescribed that it be religiously retained in the Catholic schools, end quote. He strongly recommended this policy. At the same time, he reminded the theological faculty of the obligation of holding inviolate the principles of St. Thomas and of the teaching of the Summa Theologica itself in the schools of theology, according to the prescriptions of the motu proprio doctoris angelici. And uh, remember, um, sorry, I'm writing a brief note for myself, so I don't forget later. But remember, uh, this is all uh, reliant on canonical uh, uh, law, although again, this provides us with uh, principles. He commanded the same in the statutes of the Roman Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, republished by his order on March 12, 1950. And on March 7, 1916, he confirmed on his own authority and decree the decrees of Pius X on using the Summa as the text of lectures in all of the theological faculties of England and the adjacent islands. Quote, the, the Summa Theologica must be used as the text for lectures in the scholastic part of teaching in such a way that, together with some other text indicating the logical order of questions and containing the positive part of theology, the Summa Theologica is used and explained for the scholastic part of the doctrine, end quote. The theological wisdom of Aquinas holds a very high, and actually, um, as a brief note, this is kind of cool to see this um, in the Magisterium of the Church, um, when he's talking about some other text indicating the logical order of questions and containing the positive part of theology, the positive part of theology is the grounding of the teaching of the church and theological conclusions in the sources of scripture and tradition. Um, so this would be like a manual. So uh, the way in which education uh, was prescribed to be done is you would read the uh, Summa um, and have it lectured upon you. Uh, while also you were uh, using some sort of manual in order to understand uh, the positive part of theology, which would have collections of texts from the magisterium, uh, from scripture, from tradition, from uh, also describe all of the opinions which would be present. Um, so yeah, the, honestly, that sort of side-by-side uh, -side is, is definitely ideal. The theological wisdom of Aquinas holds a very high place not only in dogmatic and moral theology, but also in apologetics, uh, ascetical, and mystical theology, as well as in catechetics. Look, even in catechetics, fantastic, fantastic. In apologetics, as the pontiff wrote to Father Garrigou Lagrange, quote, that Aquinas has a phenomenal power for clarifying defending Christian wisdom is clear from your recent book, De Revelazione, and your explanation of that part of fundamental theology called apologetics. You use the doctrine and method of St. Thomas in such a way that you singularly overcome not only the ancient, but even the recent adversaries to the Christian faith, end quote, in, a, in ascetical and mystical theology as well. Quote, everyone is aware, apparently everyone's not aware anymore, but everyone is aware of the power of St. Thomas's doctrine to illustrate spiritual principles in both the ascetical and mystical life. And we freely admit our indebtedness to him on more than one occasion. Continuing. For he explained most clearly the doctrine of the scriptures and of the saints and the fathers on the elevation to the spiritual life and the conditions necessary for progress in the grace of the virtues and gifts of the Holy Ghost, of which the perfection of the mystical life is composed. End quote. In the field of catechetics, Thomas holds a high place, as is clear from the words Benedict used in his hearty congratulations of Father Pagus 
on the appearance of his friend's edition of the Summa in the form of a catechism. Using this occasion, the pontiff declared that Thomas is the master and doctor of the whole church, i.e. of all the faithful, notice not only nerds, but all the faithful, clergy, laity, uh, the wise, and the unlearned, and of all time. This is uh, this just shows that St. Thomas is in some like die for all this. Quote, the eminent con uh, commendations of Thomas Aquinas by the Holy See no longer permit a Catholic to doubt that he was divinely raised up, that the church might have a master whose doctrine should be followed in a special way at all times. The singular wisdom of the man seems suitable to be offered directly, not only to the clergy, but also to all who wish to extend their study of religion and to the people generally as well. For nature brings it about that the more clearly a person approaches to the light, the more fully is he illuminated. Finally, the pontiff desired all the approbations and condemnation, uh, commendations to be a law for the universal church, preserved inviolably forever, for he inserted this prescription into the code of canon law. Professor, professors should teach theology and philosophy and train students in these principles entirely according to the method, doctrine, and principles of the angelic doctor, which they should hold inviolably, canon 1366. In these principles, as Pius XI says, quote, the method, doctrine, and principles of the angelic doctor are clearly consecrated and, as it were, canonized. By this law, St. Thomas is truly raised to the position of teacher of the church itself. So who's the teacher of the church itself? St. Thomas. And there is a literal fulfillment of the complete sense of the saying of Benedict XV. The church declared that the doctrine of Thomas as its own. Why is it why is it uh why is it crazy to say that you have to be careful about Catholicism not being Thomism? Saying that statement. When Benedict XV is saying the church declared that the doctrine of Thomas is its own. But, you know, Benedict the Fifteenth, Internet Scotus. Benedict the Fifteenth, Internet Scotus. Yeah, I don't know who to who to follow on this one. Rightly, therefore, did Pius XI recognize and restore the primitive title, Common Doctor of the Church, attributed to Aquinas. So, when we call Thomas the Common Doctor of the Church, what do we mean? Well, Pius XI is going to tell us. Quote: Indeed, we so approve of the tributes paid to his almost divine brilliance that we believe Thomas should be called not only angelic, but even common or universal doctor of the church. As enumerated, innumerable documents of every kind of test, the church has adopted his doctrine for her own. So, when we call uh, Thomas the common doctor of the church, we mean that the church has adopted his doctrine for her own. Simple. But this pontiff, following the footsteps of his predecessors, added, quote, What has been providentially determined in canon law in this matter? should by all means be religious and religiously and inviolately observed, since its purpose is to prepare a plenitude of priests who are equal to the task of such a great magnitude, end quote. Applying this to the universal, universities and faculties of ecclesiastical studies and the whole church, he decreed, quote, sacred theology holds the chief place in the theological faculty. This study must be pursued by both a positive and a scholastic method. Therefore, when the truths of faith are explained and demonstrated from Scripture and tradition, their nature and close revel, uh, relation to the principles and doctrines of St. Thomas is to be investigated and clarified, end quote. So that no part of the church would remain exempted from the obligation of following Thomas. He extended the regulation to the regular clergy, quote, Let that indeed be inviolable for you, which we published in agreement with can canon law in our apostolic letter on seminaries and clerical studies. Namely, that teachers, in teaching the principles of philosophy and theology, faithfully adhere to the scholastic method according to the principles and doctrines of Aquinas. Is anyone unaware how wonderfully suitable the scholastic discipline and angelic wisdom of Aquinas is, at least some are, which our predecessors continually embellished with the most fulsome praise for the purpose of explaining divine truths and refuting the errors of every age? The angelic doctor, so states Leo XIII, our predecessor of immortal memory, in his encyclical Eterni Patris, rich in divine and human knowledge, comparable to the sun, is responsible for the fact that he alone vanquished every error that in existence and supplied us with invincible weapons for destroying later errors which would continually arise. For this reason, the pontiff expressed 
the greatest pleasure when the dogmatic, dogmatic tracts of Father Edward Hugon, OP, afforded him, quote, understand, understand, dear son, that your treatises in which you explain theology for students in the form of a commentary on the principal dogmatic questions of the Summa of St. Thomas merit our hearty approval, especially because you seem to have treated those very points which we not so long ago directed in an apostolic letter to the Cardinal Prefect of the Sacred Congregation of Seminaries and Universities. For you have followed, as we then advised, not only the plan and method of St. Thomas, but his doctrines and principles as well. Throughout the whole tract, you have caused positive the theology, as it is called, to serve scholastic theology, in such a way that the latter holds the chief place, as it should. This is actually one of the issues with uh, some of the New Vell Theology as they thought scholastic theology was somehow subservient to positive theology, but continuing. Your work does not offer merely a dry review of dogmas. Rather, it presents a true and solid base of doctrine made up of principles and conclusions. Further, we are pleased to commend the lucidity of its content and expression and the zeal which prompts you when the occasion is offered to inject a spark of piety into the mind of the reader by your apt comments. So, Continue with eagerness to pass on sacred science by word and writing to youths studying for the priesthood, following the mind of Aquinas. End quote. Not only is the clergy to be steeped in this advantageous doctrine, so not only the clergy, not only the clergy, this is very important. And on this point, he congratulated the Cardinal Archbishop of Bologna, uh, Nasali uh, Roca and the professors of the Theological Faculty of Bologna for drawing wisdom from the most pure source of Aquinas in order to educate their students in accordance with the commands and exhortations of himself and his predecessor. But even the laity should more fully cultivate and steep themselves in Christian wisdom. For that reason, he praised the bishops of the whole region of Amelia for courses provided to that end. It also afforded him great pleasure that the professors of the Catholic Institute of Paris follow Thomas Aquinas as a leader in such a way that many of the clergy and educated laity taste and study his doctrine, as it were, by the right of return to the former privilege. Is. Indeed, quote, the doctrine of St. Thomas is light which descends from God and returns to God. Truly in this man, whose virtue and doctrine, as has been well said, made of him the most learned of the saints and the most saintly of the learned, the divine wisdom willed to imprint its mark more broadly and to enkindle one to the most luminous rays of its immortal light. It is no wonder that the church has made this light her own. Notice, church has made this light her own, and has adorned herself with it, and has illustrated her immortal doctor, doctrine with it. It is no wonder that all the popes have nobly vied with one another in exalting him, proposing him, inoculating him as ma model, master, doctor, patron, and protector of all schools. End quote. As for himself, quote, he will always recommend to all true friends of faith and knowledge of natural and revealed truth that they remain faithful to St. Thomas and to his doctrine, end quote. Truly, Thomas is the leader and master of studies and the universal doctor of the church, as the pontiff pointed out in his encyclical Studiorum Ducem. He is the master in the major branches of learning, especially the sacred sciences, in which, with marvelous sagacity, he joins true science and piety. Quote, this union of doctrine with piety, learning with virtue, truth with charity, is singularly manifest in the angelic doctor. And it is not without reason that he has been given the sun for a device, for he brings forth, both brings the light of science to the mind, and at the same time fires the will with virtue. And therefore, God, the source of all sanctity and wisdom, evidently seems to have desired to point out, in the case of Thomas, how each of these qualities assists the other, how the practice of the virtue disposes to the contemplation of truth, and in turn, the profound consideration of truth gives luster and perfection to the virtues. End quote. Through the work and accomplishment of Thomas, sacred theology was raised to the pinnacle of its dignity. This is true in apologetics, dogma and moral, ascetical and mystical, biblical and liturgical matters, as is clear from the office he composed in honor of the Holy Eucharist. He is considered not only the theologian of the Holy Eucharist, but its greatest prophet and herald. For this reason, he is also called the Eucharistic doctor. Uh, quote, St. Thomas is the bard of the Eucharist and its doctor, uh, a poet sweet, sublime, luminous, even when he employs neither verse nor meter. When he treats of the divine Eucharist, he carries us to the center, which was his center, to the secret, which was his secret, and to the source of his purity, to celestial food, which was his angelic nourishment. 
end quote. All these things are especially resplendent in his Summa Theologiae, which, quote, is heaven seen from earth, end quote. In this allocation, the pontiff himself declared the real sense of how Thomas is the guide of studies and common doctor of the church, which title he has conferred upon Thomas as an encyclical, Studiorum Ducem, uh, quote, oh, guide in studies, quote, of all studies, and of the method in all studies, the question of method is of capital importance. In order for science to be strict and luminous, method is all important. When the method is erroneous and the path is lost, progress is impossible, and therefore a guide is necessary. Thomas is the guide. Of a method which teaches how to prepare, so to speak, order in the soul, which forms a sort of spiritual filing cabinet, when we have many things to keep in proper order, a filing cabinet is necessary, just as a card index is kept in archives and libraries. Intellectual car uh, compartments in which all knowledge must be stored and systematized are found in what will be called method. And St. Thomas is, in, his res in this respect, a peerless master, and therefore he is a leader in studies. <coughs> Common doctor. Quote, doctor of the whole church of every science, of all noble things, whole church of every science, all noble things, love to see it, a characteristic which approaches divine power in few intellects has the participation of the divine intellect sparked so brilliantly, for which reason we ask ourselves if the internal creator ever left a deeper imprint upon other minds. In his teaching is found par excellence, one of the characteristics of the book of life, in all circumstances of life, for all problems which can arise, we, which can arise, that book has a word and solution to pray off for us. Such is the character of the Holy Gospel, because it is the word of God. Something of this divine characteristic is in St. Thomas in his classical works, the Summa Philosophica and the Summa Theologica. In these books, well read and carefully consulted, I'm pretty sure by Summa Philosophica, he's talking about... Um, the Summa Contra Gentiles. In these books, well read and carefully consulted, there is a word and a solution for all the questions that can be presented to us. A sure word and a word of genius. They are two books which summarize the entire universe, heaven and earth. The Summa Theologica is heaven seen from earth, and the Summa Contra Gentiles is earth seen from heaven. Oh my gosh, I love that quote. The Summa Theologica is heaven seen from earth, and the Summa Contra Gentiles is earth seen from heaven. It is for that this reason that St. Thomas merited the name Common Doctor. Let him, therefore, always be your light. Let his books be your constant advisors. From his books, always attain truth. If studied wi wisely and tirelessly, they will furnish the reply to all your questions with immense benefit for life. End quote. From this, he concluded in the encyclical Studiorum Ducem, quote, Just as was said of old to the Egyptians in the time of famine, go to Joseph, so that they should rec receive a supply of corn to nourish their bodies. So to those who are now in quest of truth, we may now say, go to Thomas, that they may ask from him the food of solid doctrine, of which he has an abundance to nourish their souls into eternal life, end quote. Finally, Pius X. 12th, so we finally reach the modern day. Finally, Pius XII, following the footsteps and counsels of his predecessors, stated that those precepts found in the Code of Canon Law and in the Constitution, uh, Deus uh, Scientiarum uh, Dominus, relative to following and teaching the theological doctrine of St. Thomas and Catholic schools, bind to have an obligatory force, issued as they were in the manner of a decree. That doctrine, resting upon a solid rock, above and beyond the ravages of time, flourishes perpetually. It forms an invincible protection for the deposit of the Catholic faith, and even now safeguards it. It furnishes a safe path and leading to new investigations, and when they are completed safely and prudently, enjoys the result. In these studies, quote, the angelic doctor is always a most skilled leader and is a never-failing light whose accomplishments will always remain fresh, end quote. Quote, by this road, one may proceed to a safe and solid knowledge of the truth. Look, this is the promise. The church has given us this promise that by St. Thomas's works, we can proceed to a faith and safe and solid knowledge of the truth. He admonished the members of the Society of Jesus. Notice this isn't the, the order of preachers. This is the Society of Jesus. 
quote, to observe with all diligence their laws which commend them to follow the doctrine of St. Thomas as being more solid, safe, approved, and consonant with their constitutions, end quote. These, quote, these things have the force of law, which bind all Catholic schools of philosophy and theology, end quote, and therefore are to be observed by all as sacred and inviolable. He declared to the students of the regular and secular clergy pursuing sacred studies at Rome, quote, it is that wisdom of Aquinas, which collected the truths of human reason, illustrated them with brilliance and aptly and solidly unified them into a wonderful whole. It is the wisdom of Aquinas, which especially suited to declare and defend the dogmas of the faith. And finally, it is his wisdom, which was able to refute effectively the basic errors continually arising and conquer them invincibly. Wherefore, dear sons, bring to St. Thomas a heart full of love and zeal. With all your powers, strive to explore with your intellect his excellent doctrine. Freely embrace whatever clearly pertains to it and is supported by a solid reason found in it. End quote. Aquinas, uh, continuing, Aquinas, the angelic and common doctor, like the sea receiving into himself the rivers of wisdom from all who lived before his time, and whatever reason, human reason, had attained by thought and mental labor, so composed and ordered all of it in a wonderful manner, and with brilliant clearness, after exposing it to the supernal light emanating from the gospel, that he seems to have left to his successors the power to imitate, but to have taken away the power to surpass. <laughs> The doctrine of Thomas not only was most apt for destroying ancient heresies, for that reason stands forth as the champion of faith and firm bulwark of religion, but also offers the most powerful weapon for destroying thoroughly errors which are being reborn in perpetual succession and which wear the garb of newness. Therefore, all who attend Catholic schools of any type should cherish, revere, and imitate Thomas Aquinas as a heavenly patron, those especially who study him in philosophy and theology, and specifically students divinely called to the priesthood, and growing into the hope of the church, ought to follow Thomas as leader and master, recalling that there is an innate excellence in Thomistic doctrine. Notice, there is an innate excellence in Thomistic doctrine, a singular force and power to cure the evils which afflict our age. End quote. Sorry, I need to take a drink of water. Those things which in our day have been foolishly and erroneously proposed by certain people in the mystical body of Christ, which is the church, could have been avoided if they had followed Aquinas in the matter. For examination of the doctrine, quote, should have taken into account the very lucid opinions of masters of scholastic theology, especially the angelic and common doctor. For they had discoursed on this point, you surely realize that his arguments closely correspond to the thought of the fathers. Those arguments add nothing new, but merely comment by way of explanation upon the divine words of scripture, end quote. Similarly, the doctrine and deeper investigation of biblical inspiration, resting on the principles of the angelic doctor, offers new aids and insights for exegesis. The pontiff said, quote, among other things, this seems to deserve special mention. Catholic theologians following the doctor." The doctrine of the fathers, and especially that of the angelic and common doctor, have examined and explained the nature and effects of biblical inspiration more exactly and more fully than was wont to be done in previous ages. For having begun by expounding minutely the principle that the inspired writer in composing the sacred books is the living and reasonable instrument of the Holy Spirit, they rightly observe that, impelled by the divine motion, he so uses his faculties and powers that from the books composed by him, all may easily infer the special character of each one and, as it were, his personal traits. End quote. Continuing, actually, let the interpreter then, with all care and without neglecting any light derived from recent research, endeavor to determine the peculiar character and circumstances of the sacred writer, the age in which he have lived, the sources written or oral to which he had recourse in form of expression he employed. End quote. Further on, he says, quote, for of the modes of expression which among ancient peoples and especially those of the east human language used to express its thought none is excluded from the sacred books provided the way of speaking adopted in no wise contradicts the holiness and truth of god as with his customary wisdom the angelic doctor already observed in these words in scripture divine things are presented to us in the manner which is in common use among men quoting uh, saint thomas's commentary on hebrews for as the substantial word of God became like to man in all things except sin, so the words of God expressed in human language are made like to human speech in every respect except error. End quote. 
The same may be said on the question of so-called humanism, concerning which some speak today at great length, though not always aptly. Quote, humanism is now the order of the day. Undoubtedly, it is not an easy task to extract and recognize a clear idea of its nature in the course of its historical evolution. Nevertheless, although humanism has for long had the pretension of being formally opposed to the Middle Ages, which preceded it, it is nonetheless certain that everything it contains of truth, of goodness, and of great and of eternal belonged to the spiritual universe of the great genius of the Middle Ages, St. Thomas Aquinas. In its general characteristics, the conception, concept of man and of the world as it appears in the Christian and Catholic perspective remains essentially identical with itself. The same in St. Thomas as uh, St. Augustine as in St. Thomas or Dante, the same again in contemporary Christian philosophy, the obscurity of certain philosophical or theological questions, which have been illuminated and gradually resolved in the course of the centuries, detracts in no way from the reality of this fact, end quote. And we are now up to our 148th footnote. So this is fun. Surprise if there's 148 words about uh, other doctors. Continuing, um, actually that was end quote. So with new errors, or at least the danger of error arising, the pontiff is more insistent in urging a return to St. Thomas and more strongly commands fidelity in the observance of the church's precept on following the doctrine of the angelic doctor. This is clear from his encyclical Humani Generis, August 12, 1950. To those present at the Third International Thomistic Congress in Rome, he said, quote, this represents a safe path for you who are engaged in discussion and publication. Follow the doctrine of St. Thomas Aquinas, which lights up the road like a brilliant ray of the sun. End quote. Thank you, Pius XII. I will actually do this. I will follow the safe path. Indeed, quote, heaven is distant, distant from the earth in the same degree that the truths of divine revelation exceed the power of the human mind. They are loftier than those powers of mind but not in the least contradictory or repugnant to them. Uh, I, I know I said that wrong. They are above reason, but not opposed to it. With infectious eagerness, St. Thomas leads human intelligence, hesitating and dubious by reason of the brilliant splendor into the very temple of the mysteries of God, producing the solution to problems by the artistry of his arguments. He brings out the clear and splendid harmony existing between divine and human things. How sharply the contest waxes at present in fixing reasons used both in faith and in philosophy, as is shown in our encyclical letter mentioned above. We published it with this plan and purpose in mind, to preserve the deposit of Catholic faith whole, untarnished, and uninjured. Discuss among yourselves those questions which we touched on in our letter, and afterwards pass the results on to the studious youths whom you are teaching. Always follow that inspiration by which the angelic doctor learned the truth, namely by the greater effort of intelligence and by religious piety. Treat these matters thoroughly ins insisting upon his method, by which he always defined the limits and content of his op opinions, with no useless flow of words, but with serious and solid discourse. In the apostolic exhortation to all the clergy on September 23rd, 1950, he concludes, quote, Wherefore, lest the zeal of sacred ministers be miserably subject to change and hesitation, we particularly urge you, venerable brethren, to be especially vigilant in ensuring that those special regulations for such studies which this Holy See has established be received and preserved with complete fidelity, end quote. In the preface of the Mass of St. Thomas, which the Holy Father himself wrote, he gives thanks to God and addresses him in these words, quote, who wish to raise up to, in thy church the blessed Dr. Thomas, truly angelic by reason of his pure life and sublime mind, that he might communicate his solid and salutary doctrine and illuminate the church like the sun, whose wisdom, especially commended to all, is admired to the whole world. Ah, the preface to the Mass, especially commended to all. Interesting. Sounds like he's equal to everybody else, right? Weighing and considering all these points together, it must be candidly and ungrudgingly admitted that the church concedes the highest theological authority to Thomas alone over the other ecclesiastical writers of all time. Therefore, his canonical authority in the field of theology is truly the greatest over each and every one of the father's doctors. Read that right there. This is, this is the position that I'm putting forth. The church concedes the highest theological authority to Thomas alone 
over the other ecclesiastical writers of all time. Therefore, his canonical authority in the field of theology is truly the greatest over each and every one of the fathers and doctors. With good reason, then, Father uh, Salaveri, uh, S.J., who was um, the writer of the STS, or one of the writers of the STS, wrote that, quote, in theology, the authority of St. Thomas is entirely matchless and greater than all other, than, of any other doctor or theologian in the Catholic Church, end quote. And again, quote, the authority of St. Thomas, which may be called canonical, is greater than the authority of any other Catholic theologian, end, end quote. Okay, so I'm going to take another break. Uh, we're about to get into his extrinsic authority when it comes to Oh, yeah, ungrudgingly. So uh, about to get into uh, the section on philosophy, and I'm keeping notes on these timestamps because I know if not, I'll forget, and I want to add timestamps so everybody can uh, peruse through the sections as they wish. Okay.
No, I was just uh, I was just taking a break. Um, bad taco fourteen. <laughs> the the real militant Thomas were all the Pope saints and doctors we met along the way. So true, so true. No, no, no. I, no, <laughs> end the stream. I'm only like a third of the way through. What are you talking about? What do you mean end the stream? Yeah, that, I was gone for like eight minutes, wasn't I? I should probably uh, edit after I'm done. I'm gone for a pretty uh, lengthy time. Yes, this is live. Okay. Nah, you're good. You're good. Okay, so, and I just got a, uh, let me see if I can turn my camera on. I have to show you guys. There you go. Look what I was just, uh, Lexi brought me a mug of coffee. Okay, so let's get right into it. So, in philosophy, so what is the authority? Because remember, we've already talked about intrinsic authority in philosophy. We've already talked about intrinsic authority in, in theology. We've already talked about extrinsic authority in theology. Now we're going to be talking about extrinsic authority in uh, philosophy. And then we're going to finish up with... Um, a consideration of certain exaggerations uh, that certain thinkers may have. So, when the minds of philosophers were accepting the Catholic faith and exercising the, ta the task of philosophy with due reverence for the truths held by faith, there was no necessity for the teaching authority of the church to protect natural reason and philosophy itself. But, from the time of the Re Renaissance, as it is called, and especially the Reformation, again, as it is called, when philosophers did not hesitate to quote, philosophize without any regard to the faith, asking and conceding in return the right to invent anything that they can think of and anything that they please, end quote. Philosophy gradually degenerated into a seminary of errors in philosophers into artisans fashioning arguments against the true faith. The noble exercise of the mind reached such a low state that it finally attacked reason itself and philosophy, so-called, began to devour itself. This condition of philosophy accurately fulfilled the axiom of Aquinas. Philosophy, quote, is wisdom only as long as it is subject to divine wisdom. But when it withdraws from God, it becomes foolishness, end quote. This especially resulted from Kant's critique. And so, in order to cleanse reason and philosophy, as grace does fall in nature, the teaching authority of the church eagerly and seriously concerned itself with the restoration and renovation of true Christian philosophy. First, by the ordinary magisterium, Gregory the Sixteenth and Pius the Ninth spoke out against the errors of fideism or extreme traditionalism on the one hand, and rationalism, ontologism, and pantheism on the other. Then the Vatican Council solemnly condemned the same errors, especially those relating to reason and revelation and faith, and the motives of credibility, and also the relation between faith and reason. In its deliberations, the Council very accurately distinguished and affirmed the complete lack of opposition between reason and faith, philosophy and theology, the natural and the supernatural orders. To cure these errors arising from the abuse of philosophy, the father stated that no means was better suited than the reestablishment of a true and healthy philosophy, which had reached its peak in perfection in St. Thomas Aquinas. Then, after the council was temporarily adjourned due to the state of the world affairs, the several fathers began to send letters to, Thomas, to uh, Pope Pius IX, asking and begging him to declare Thomas patron of all schools. And these fathers said in their discussions about this that since the impurities of every kind of error flowed from a disrespect for the teaching authority of the angelic doctor, they would be dispersed if he was established and accepted as patron of the schools. Eminent among the fathers urging this were Cardinals uh, Riorio uh, Seforza of Naples and Joachim Pecky of uh, Paraguay. Perugia, sorry, Perugia, both of Paraguay, yeah, real, that's how you read, both of whom assisted at the Vatican Council and took a large part in its affairs. However, Blessed Pius IX died on February 18th, 1878, and on the 20th, Cardinal Pecci was, was elected as his successor, taking the name of Leo XIII. In assuming the supreme pontificate, he bent all his energy in restoring, urging, and spreading and even by his apostolic authority, prescribing a safe and healthy philosophy. Notice, this is not uh, this is not precept, boys. 
Quote, the more energetically the enemies of religion attempt to suggest to simple men and youths that they learn those things which becloud the mind and corrupt morals, so much the more readily must we lean upon not only a suitable and approved method of instruction, but the very content of the instruction must strictly conform to the Catholic faith in letter and in spirit. This should be especially true in, philosoph in philosophy upon whom on which correct procedure in other sciences very greatly depends. The purpose of philosophy is not to undermine divine revelation, but rather to pave the road for it and defend it from enemies, as the great Augustine, the angelic doctor, and other masters of Christian wisdom have taught us by their example and writings, end quote. That this is especially true of the philosophy of St. Thomas, he signified to the scholarly A. Uccelli, who edited from autographic manuscripts, the Summa Contra Gentiles, quote, we are very grateful to you for having contributed your care and effort to this remarkable work to which the Holy Doctor pours out from the rich vein, the treasures of a profound philosophy and supplies very timely weapons to refute the errors of the age, end quote. The famous encyclical Attorney Patris of August the 4th, 1879, had as its special purpose to inculcate the philosophy of Aquinas and to prescribe that it be followed. In, quote, Indeed, if one should examine the evils which afflict our age, he would easily discover that the fruitful cause, both of those which we now suffer and those which we greatly fear, is depraved knowledge of human and divine things. Such knowledge, long poured out from the schools of philosophers, has crept into every level of society and it has been received with the common applause of very many. Since it is natural for man to follow reason as the guide of his actions, if the understanding go wrong in anything, his will easily follows. This is the way that perverse ideas residing in the mind influence human actions and pervert them. On the contrary, if the mind of man be healthy and strongly grounded in solid and true principles, many benefits would accrue to both the public and private good." End quote. While it is true, that the whole salvation of the human race should not be expected from philosophy, since that depends upon the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Still, quote, natural aids should neither be despised nor undervalued, for the province of divine wisdom, disposing all things strongly and sweetly, supplies the human race with these aids. Among them, the right use of philosophy is clearly and most important, clearly the most important. True and sound philosophy renders three kinds of assistance to the Catholic religion. Firstly, philosophy paves the way for it it in the proof of the preambles of the faith, namely the existence of one personal God distinct from the world, who is omnipotent and can neither deceive nor be deceived. This supplies the basis for the rational credibility of divine revelation. The cons consequence should be then that if God speaks to men, they should give the full assent of their minds. That he has actually spoken to men is abundantly clear from the many miracles performed by God himself to support his word. Human reason is manifestly capable of knowing the existence and probative force of such miracles with reference both to the credibility of divinely revealed doctrine and the fact that it should be believed. Secondly, when by faith the divinely revealed mysteries are accepted, philosophy helps in various ways to understand and explain them in its function as the instrument of the science of faith, which is called sacred theology. Indeed, to use the words of the same pontiff, the constant and varied use of philosophy is required that sacred theology may assume and wear the nature, habit, and character of true science. For in this noble in this noblest of the sciences, it is especially necessary that the many and different parts of heavenly doctrine be gathered together, as it were, into one body. Thus they are united by a union of harmony amongst themselves, all the parts being fittingly arranged and derived from their own proper principles. Finally, each and every part is strengthened by its own unanswerable arguments. Nor must we pass over in silence or reckon little account that more accurate and fuller knowledge of our belief, as far as may be that somewhat clear understanding of the mysteries of the faith which St. Augustine and the other fathers both praised and labored to attain, and which the Vatican Council itself decreed to be most fruitful. Such knowledge and understanding are certainly acquired more fully and easily by those who joined to integrity of life and study of the faith, a mind that has been disciplined by philosophical culture. Especially is this so since the same Vatican Council teaches that we ought to seek for understanding of the holy dogmas, of that kind, both from the analogy of the things which are naturally known, and also from the way in which the mysteries themselves are related to one another, and also to the ultimate end of man. End quote. Lastly, this also quote, sorry, I need to drink coffee. That is still quite warm. 
Lastly, this also, quote, is the task of philosophy to guard with religious care all the truths that come to us by divine tradition and resist all who dare to attack them. Philosophy enjoys high repute because it holds the position of the bulwark of the faith and strong defender of religion, end quote. These three duties and offices of reason and philosophy towards the Catholic religion already clearly indicated by Thomas, and this is in uh, his commentary on Boethius' De Trinitate, question two, article three, respondeo, are completely and accurately fulfilled by the philosophy of Thomas himself. Every true and sound fruit of reason which the fathers and other ecclesiastical writers discovered in the field of philosophy over the course of centuries, Thomas had gathered unto himself as into a sea and embellished in many ways by his own work. He fashioned a body of philosophy which is complete, sound, unified, and even and ever powerful in that it is based on principles so solid and universal that they penetrate and even anticipate all time and change. The reason is that he encloses within his grasp an almost infinite number of truths to be opened up later masters at the proper time, and with much fruit. He alone destroyed all errors, ancient, modern, and future, or at least he certainly supplies invincible wisdoms to destroy them. Quote, Moreover, carefully distinguishing reason and faith, as is right, and yet joining them together in harmony of friendship, you so guarded the rights of each, and so watched over the dignity of each, that as far as man is concerned, reason can now hardly rise higher than she has risen, borne up in the flight of Thomas, and faith can hardly gain more helps and greater helpers from reason than those of which Thomas has given her. There is no sounder and safer philosophical doctrine, and one which is in more accord with the teaching authority of the church than that which is contained in the volumes of Thomas. End quote. This is interesting. I guess we need to let Leo the Thirteenth know about his uh, presuppositionalism that he uh, himself also uh, worked hard to condemn throughout his career in Fideism. He says, "This is my only thesis." Quote: "There is no sounder and safer philosophical doctrine, and one which is in more accord with the teaching authority of the Church than that which is contained in the volumes of Thomas." Notice this is just attorney Patris. Like these are the basic encyclicals to. Uh, these are the basic things to read, like Studiorum Ducem, Eterni Patris, Doctoris Angelici, and all of this that I've read so far has just been contained in there, every single proposition. I mean, it, honestly, I think it just shows that people are uh, speaking on issues that they haven't done work on. Um, they might have read some secondary sources uh, at best, but when you just read the encyclicals, the popes, it's very clear what's being said. It's very, very clear. <sighs> but we will continue to defend St. Thomas. No one ever so well demonstrated the existence, nature, and attributes of God and the other preambles of the faith, as is clear from the examination of the Summa Contra Gentiles alone. In the same work, he also prepared a defense of the Catholic faith more powerful than all others. Finally, no one ever offered such true, sound, and deep elucidations and explanations of the mysteries of the faith based on analogy and the connection of the mysteries one with another with the ultimate end of man as is set forth in his Summa Theologiae. Therefore, the philosophy of Thomas, St. Thomas is to be established and vigorously promoted in the Catholic schools and teachers are required to teach it and students must accept it. Quote, we urgently urge all of you, venerable brethren, to restore the golden wisdom of St. Thomas and spread it as far as you can for the safety and glory of the Catholic faith, for the good of society, and for the increase of all of the sciences. End quote. Indeed, quote, there is nothing which we have longer wished for and desired, then you should give largely and abundantly to youths engaged in study. The pure streams of wisdom which flow from the angelic doctor is from a per perennial and copious spring, end quote. Moreover, quote, let teachers carefully chosen by you endeavor to instill the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas in the minds of their hearers and let them clearly point out its solidity and excellence above all other teaching, end quote. He also gave this grave warning, quote, lest the false should be drunk instead of the true, or lest that which is unwholesome should be drunk instead of that which is pure. Take care that the wisdom of Thomas be drawn from his own fountain, or at any rate from those streams which, in the certain and unanimous opinion of learned men, yet flow whole and untainted inasmuch as they are fed from the fountain itself. This is actually um, a reference to the commentorial tradition, which is really interesting. I didn't pick up that at, uh, at first. But take care to shield the minds of youths from streams which are said to have flowed from thence, but in reality have been fed by other unhealthy waters from other springs, end quote. Because when you look at the Adichio Leonina, they actually include the guys uh, who are the um, the chief commentators on St. Thomas, especially Cajetan in the Summa, 
um, and then Ferreira in the Summa Contra Gentiles. In this letter, as he himself often recalled later, he stated and clearly proved, quote, that the best form of philosophy is that developed by the brilliant genius of St. Thomas Aquinas in such a way that it will never die. For he carefully searched out in all the works of ancient wisdom. This is all I'm saying that the best form of philosophy is that developed by the brilliant genius of St. Thomas Aquinas in such a way that it will never die. All I'm saying. Continuing. Quote, what we have often striven to impress upon you before, we now repeat that no method of philosophy is more suited to reach the truth or more powerful to destroy growing errors than the method of that blessed and most wise man. It's just obvious. In this way, quote, while we have recommended adherence to the doctrine of St. Thomas for the deliberate purpose of restoring soundness to philosophy, our special purpose is to use it as a sword cutting at the root of present evil. For by his principles and method of philosophy, he has a marvelous power to illustrate every facet of the truth and destroy every kind of error, even those engendered by the very difficult times in which we live. End quote. Quote, we propose as a model, one in whom virtue and wisdom shine with a maximum of splendor, a man fully imbued with human and divine learning, drawn from the treasury of the ages, one celebrated by the praises of the church and the approval of the Roman pontiffs, one made equal in mind to the angels, end quote. It was with the highest approval that this letter and these recommendations of the Supreme Pastor were received by the cardinals, bishops, superiors of religious orders, faculties of philosophy, seminaries, and learned Catholic men throughout the world. Representatives sent letters attesting to their admiration of and veneration for the doctrine of St. Thomas. Practically by referendum, Aquinas was rec recognized and proclaimed the Prince of Philosophers and Universal Doctor. Motivated by these letters and by others forwarded to Pius IX, Leo XIII declared St. Thomas, patron of all universities, colleges, lycea, and Catholic schools, quote, for they, the letters, have made clear to him, as well as to ourselves, that there is inherent in Thomistic doctrine a certain outstanding excellence, as well as a phenomenal force and power calculated to cure the evils which afflict in our times. This is the chief, uh, end quote. This is the chief and supreme reason which moved the pontiff to decree that for Thomas that, quote, St. Thomas is preeminent among all. Catholic men regard him as the exemplar in the various branches of knowledge, indeed, magnificent ornaments of mind and soul, inviting imitation by others, are all present in him, complete, pure, and well-ordered doctrine, obedience to the faith, and the finest harmony with divinely revealed truths, integrity of life united with the splendor of the greatest virtues, end quote. Nor was the Roman pontiff satisfied with these solemn pronouncements. Great energy and purpose marked his continuous efforts to recommend the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas. He founded the Roman Academy, named after Thomas Aquinas, quote, to explain and expound his works, to set forth his opinions, and to compare them with the opinions of ancient and modern philosophers, to show the forth of his opinions and his reasons for them, to strive to spread a salutary doctrine, and to apply it both to the refutation of modern errors and to those which would arise in the future. End quote. He was careful to see that in the Roman faculties and seminaries, philosophical studies according to the mind and principles of the angelic doctor were being cherished and taught simply, clearly, and fully. By his own order and at his own expense, he published a new critical edition, which embraces all the writings of the Holy, Fa Holy Doctor, together with the commentaries of Cajetan and Ferrara on the Summa Theologiae and the Summa Congentiles, through which, as through many rivulets, the doctrines of this great man might flow. Oh, yeah, actually, that's kind of cool. He's, he's referring back to what he said in Attorney Patris. So he's affirming that Cajetan and Ferrara are uh, in the same... Uh, in a, they're representatives of those uh, to whom we should go in order to interpret Aquinas. That is the commentorial tradition. It's really cool. I actually never really realized this until now. He continually urged bishops, religious superiors, and all scholars throughout the Catholic world to do likewise in the seminaries and schools under their care. Quote, endeavor to spread further every day the doctrine of such a great master and studying his doctrine. Keep the reg this regulation in mind that you should embrace any given opinion because it recommends itself freely to you on account of his wonderful propriety and simplicity of speech, and not because you have been perhaps persuaded by some prejudiced opinion foreign to common and approved doctrine, end quote. 
To the president and students of the Academy of St. Thomas at Parma, he wrote, quote, You can choose no safer guide for your works than St. Thomas, whose shining sanctity, joined with brilliant genius and penetration surpassing the human level, has earned for him the fitting tribute of angelic doctor, and he seems to have been abundantly filled with the measure of that name, end quote. In him are all the qualities which establish him as a guide and teacher of the healthy and true philosophy. He has the correct method of philosophy, philosoph philosophical doctrine, which is sound, mature, strong, and safe, universal and fruitful principles, touching the chief problems of all times, offering the answers to them, a compact, clear, serious style, an understanding manner towards all philosophers, yet with perfect freedom to disprove of all their opinions and advance others, and the finest harmony with divinely revealed truth, his philosophical method. His doctrine, quote, always retains its great power to stimulate wisely the minds of men. Quote, it was for this reason that we have advised and frequently and seriously urged that the works of the great Aquinas be kept at hand and continually and fittingly expounded, because the doctrine of the angelic doctor has been wonderfully fashioned to form minds and is equally useful for the commentator, philo philosopher, or one who would dispute succinctly and invincibly. He clearly proves individual points, one depending upon another in a continuous series. He shows that all of them are connected and join one with another. He relates them all to one basic principle. Then he lifts one up to the contemplation of God, who is the efficient cause, source, and archetype of all things, to whom all philosophy and indeed every man should be related. End quote. He is strong and in his praise of Lorenzelli who had already dedicated himself entirely to the teaching of Aquinas, stating that he had set forth Thomas's method of treatment, an admirable system of philosophy, in which he excelled in his Philosophiae uh, Theoreticae e Institutiones. He also sent hearty congratulations to the professors of the Faculty of the Philosophy of the Catholic University in Washington. Oh, man, that's us. Quote, especially because they purposefully maintained and it's entirely the established system of philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, according to our precept, and religiously followed him as guide. Wisdom in philosophy is exactly proportioned to the decree in which Thomas is followed, for his is the truest and most suitable of all the systems of philosophy. This is all I'm saying. We wish to use that system whether they are teaching or learning. End quote. The body of his doctrine is solid, mature, strong, and safe. His doctrine, uh, quote, his doctrine is so inclusive that he has embraced within himself, as in a sea, all the wisdom flowing from the ancients. Whatever truth was spoken or discussed by pagan philosophers, by the fathers and doctors of the church, by great men who lived before him, he not only thoroughly investigated, but augmented, perfected, and disposed, with such a clear penetration of ideas, such an accurate system of argumentation, such an economy of speech, that he appears only to have left the power to imitate, but not to excel. He stands invincible, strengthening his arguments by the force of reason and striking great terror in the mind of his adversaries. We see this every day. End quote. His full and fruitful principles embrace the special problems of all times and offer their solutions. Quote, this is an outstanding point about his doctrine, that being based upon and arranged according to the principles which have the widest extension, it is not limited to one period only, but is adaptable to the needs of all times, and is especially suited to overcome the constant rise of error. The angelic doctor, in his speculations, drew certain philosophical conclusions as to the reason and principles of certain things, of created things. These conclusions have the very widest reach and contain, as it were, in their bosom, the seeds of truths, well nigh infinite in number. These have to be unfolded with most abundant fruits in their own meth time by the teachers who come after him. And he used his method of philosophy, not only in teaching the truth, but also in refuting error. He has gained this prerogative for himself. With his own hand, he vanquished all errors of ancient times, and still he supplies an armory of weapons, which brings us certain victory in the conflict with falsehood, ever springing up in the course of years. End quote. His si style is serious, succinct, and clear. Quote, he employs a quiet style and serious manner of speech, not only when he is teaching a truth and composing an argument, but also when he is pursuing and pressing upon his adversaries. End quote. 
Very recently, Pius XII purpo proposed this form of argumentation to philosophers for imitation. Quote, proceed strictly according to his method, for he always defined the content and limits of his opinions without useless verbiage, but with sober and solid expression and evident precision. End quote. For this reason, he praised and so he praised the celebrated Anthony Muratori, who possessed a similar style of presentation. Quote, he disregard, uh, discarded that inflated form of writing then in vogue, as well as bombastic fancy and lengthy forms of expression, which were also frequently employed. Instead, he fashioned for you, his use a style and type of writing, which was unadorned, yet compact, strong, and penetrating, end quote. His gentleness towards every philosopher, coupled with a perfect freedom to disagree and to bring forward some new solution, so that the philosophy of the greatest of all philosophers, Aristotle, quote, the angelic doctor interpreted in a uniquely brilliant manner. He made that philosophy Christian when he purged it of the errors into which a pagan writer could easily fall. He used these very errors in his exposition and vindication of Catholic truth. Among the important advances with the church owes to the great Aquinas, this certainly should be included. That so nicely did he harmonize Christian truth with the enduring peripatetic philosophy that he made Aristotle cease to be an adversary and become instead a militant supporter for Christ, end quote. Indeed, one sh a militant supporter for Christ. There you go. Aristotle, he's a militant Christian. You know, I've seen James, uh, John Rickaby, that's originally where I got militant Thomist from, but uh, John Rickaby used, would use the term like militant scholastic to describe uh, describe himself. It's kind of funny. But I digress. Indeed, one should embrace the truths discovered by others in such a way that new truths are sought at the same time. Quote, it is true that in those days, too, many find their praise for genius and a contempt for antiquity. Nevertheless, that is evidently the best system of philosophy, which endeavors by rational procedure to discover new truths without at the same time disregarding the wisdom of the ancients. End quote. Let me check the live chat real quick. I'm eating cheesecake while watching this. Wow, amazing hat. Uh, where can I get one? Um, yep, my Gary Goo hat. Um, also, my Gary Goo mug. Um, you can get them at the link below. So, uh, continuing. And it's almost uh, noon, so I'm going to quickly finish this up, and then we'll pray the Angelus and Midday Prayer. And then we will continue. The marvelous harmony with divinely revealed truths. Uh, is this a quote? Yes. Quote, the holy doctor clearly proves that truths springing from the natural order cannot contradict with those that are believed by faith. Consequently, the support and cultivation of the Christian faith is not a mean and servile function of reason, but rather its noble obedience by which the mind is aided, educated in a loftier realm of truth. Finally, science and faith, both coming from God, should not exercise a rivalry or dissension, but bound together by the ties of friendship, should offer help to each other. An outstanding example of this wonderful harmony and concordance is found in all the writings of St. Thomas. In them, that harmony shines brilliantly. At one time, reason predominates with faith leading the way in the investigation of nature. At another time, faith takes the lead, defended and supported by reason, in such a way that each maintains inviolate its proper force and dignity. When a problem is so demands, both join together, having made a compact, as it were, to destroy the enemies of each. Hence, the best philosophers are they who join philosophical study with the obedience of the Christian faith. Thus, the brightness of Christian truths fall in the mind, and by that brightness, the understanding itself is helped. This takes nothing from the dignity of, the reason, of reason. Nay, rather, it adds to the reason a great deal of grandeur and subtlety and strength. Therefore, those who wish to be true philosophers should take the principles and foundations of their doctrine from Thomas Aquinas. There you go. Pope says so. To depart his leadership is praiseworthy. To follow his leadership is praiseworthy. On the contrary, to depart foolishly and rashly from the wisdom of the angelic doctor is something far from our mind and fraught with peril. The name of Thomas should be held sacred by all. But so, end, end quote. But if other authors, quote, should depart from the doctrine of the common doctor, there must be no dispute as to which is the right way, uh, end quote, namely the way of Aquinas. Uh, further, to follow Thomas as guide is not only a laudable privilege, but a duty as well. 
and a most pressing duty at that. Quote, for those who apply themselves to the teaching and study of theology and philosophy should consider it their capital duty, having left, left aside the findings of a fruitless philosophy to follow St. Thomas Aquinas and to cherish him as their master and their leader. Let it be a law for teachers as well as students to follow Aquinas as their guide and cherish and protect his doctrine from all impurity. End quote. Okay. Let's quickly um, pause to pray. Angelus. Okay. Midday prayer. Oh, no, never mind. The Regina Chaley. I forgot. O Queen of Heaven, be joyful. Alleluia. Because he to whom so meetly thou bearest. Alleluia. Hath arisen as he promised. Alleluia. Pray for us to the Father. Alleluia. Rejoice and be glad, O Virgin Mary. Alleluia. For the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. O God, who by the resurrection of thy Son, Jesus Christ, didst vouchsafe to give gladness unto the world, Grant, we beseech thee, that we, being holpen by the Virgin Mary, his mother, may attain to the joys of everlasting life. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, and I just remembered I left my hat on for that. Oops. Okay. Now, let's continue. Let's hope uh, we're still here for the 3 o'clock. No, the six o'clock, sorry, for the six o'clock. In no sense is this to be uh, construed as a curtailment of one's freedom to investigate truth. So this is important. Um, we're not saying that one is bound uh, by prescript to only ever follow Thomas and never to um, have any sort of freedom to uh, investigate truth. Rather, it directs that liberty in a safe manner and preserves it intact. So all they're saying is like that if you want to do philosophy safely, here's what you do, but not binding it to such a degree as if uh, through one's own study, they come to a disagreement on uh, certain points with St. Thomas. Uh, that's going to be when we get to the end and talk about the over-exaggerations of his authority. Um, those are going to be the issues. Quote, human reason should exercise a free hand in its efforts to penetrate to the interior and hidden knowledge of things, nor can it be otherwise. Indeed, following Aquinas as leader and guide, it does so more freely and expedient, expedient, expeditiously, because then uh, reason acts most securely, since it is entirely free from the danger of exceeding the safety of faith, end quote. Quote, you would erroneously call that freedom which follows and spreads opinions at chance and at random. Rather, it is the worst kind of license, lying and false knowledge, the slavery and blight of the soul. Thomas, the wise doctor, moves within the bounds of truth, for he never takes issue with God, the highest principle of all truth. To him he always clings, and he follows him most closely as he opens his divine secrets. Thomas's doctrine, as it is the most eminent and wholesome of all, approved for secular use and praised above all the others by the church, all I'm saying is that it's praised above all others by the church. Not only does not coerce the mind, but rather supplies pure and salutary food, end quote. <clears throat> there is no better course of study, no safer system of philosophy, no stronger instrument of sharpening the mind in its investigation of truth. Leo XIII repeated this again and again at every opportunity. He wrote to Cardinal uh, Deschamps upon the establishment of the chair of Thomistic philosophy at the University of Louvain. Quote, devote your efforts to studying the masters wisely, to nourishing the important studies vigilantly, and be definitively assured that the course of studies will be better as it more closely approaches the doctrine of that same Aquinas. End quote. In another place, quote, we have often said that the course of studies will be better as it more closely approaches approaches the doctrine of the same Aquinas, end quote. Two different letters, 13 years apart, and he's saying the same exact thing. Those indeed, uh, quote, those indeed will become finished and accurate philosophers who have been deeply steeped in the scholastic method and study. We have repeated and seriously admonished and mentioned to you on other occasions that the course of studies will be better as it approaches more closely to the doctrine of Aquinas, end quote. In an allocation, 
to the moderators and students of the seminaries and faculties of Rome. He said, quote, we seem to have acted with good purpose and opportunity when having in mind the acquisition of greater knowledge of things. We recalled the studies of clerics to the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas. In this matter, we repeat to your presence today what we have said clearly and repeatedly in our letters. Follow the angelic doctor as guide and teacher. Consider yourselves beloved sons to have come closer to doctrinal excellence as you devote more effort and study to him, end quote. His successor, St. Pius X, commended exact obedience of all these precepts. Quote, notice uh, again, canonical uh, things that we've said earlier. We take the lead in saying that all these regulations must be religiously observed, which our illustrious predecessor determined in the study of Thomistic philosophy and doctrine, and we shall take care to promote the hope for even greater fruit, end quote. And therefore, quote, all who teach philosophy in Catholic schools throughout the world should take care never to depart from the path and method of Aquinas and to assist upon that procedure more vigorously every day. He gives special advice on this matter to the Catholic Institutes in France, and specifically to the Institute of Paris. Quote, on the subject of philosophy, we wish you never to allow the regulations providentially set forth by our predecessor in the encyclical attorney Patris be less strictly observed in your seminaries. This is a matter of very great consequence for the protection and safety of the faith. End quote. It is not enough to imbue the students for sacred orders with that philosophy corresponding to the official programs of the state, but they should more fully and deeply instructed, quote, according to the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas, so that they can receive solid knowledge of sacred theology and biblical science, end quote. He suggested the same thing more solemnly in his encyclical letter, Pascendi, of September 8th, 1907, against the doctrine of the modernists, especially in the field of metaphysics, quote, in the matter of studies, we wish, and at this time command, that scholastic philosophy be made the basis of sacred studies. <coughs> Specifically, when we prescribe that scholastic philosophy is to be followed, we mean especially the philosophy which is taught by Thomas Aquinas. We state that whatever was sanctioned by our predecessor on this point is still in force, and whatever we have done by way of encouragement and confirmation, we order that it be followed all religious by all religiously. It is the business of the bishops and whatever seminary these points have been neglected to see that they are encouraged and required hereafter. We prescribe the same for moderators of religious orders. We warn teachers to keep this religiously in mind, especially in metaphysics, that to disregard Aquinas cannot be done without suffering great harm. End quote. We repeated this. Uh, he repeated this in his motu proprio. Um, Sacrorum uh, anti -stitium, stitium, especially insisting upon a faithful and strict adherence to Aquinas' metaphysics. Quote, we warn teachers to keep this religiously in mind, that disregarding Aquinas even slightly cannot be done with great harm. A small error in the beginning, to use the words of Aquinas in the prologue to his Dante Essentia, becomes very great in the end. End quote. This was his particular point in the motu proprio, Doctoris Angelici, of... June 29th, 1914, when he uh, complained of the false understanding with which some have interpreted preceding decrees, as though one might follow any scholastic doctor indiscriminately. Notice he's, cor he's correcting this idea, uh, actually, in uh, Doctoris Angelici. He's correcting the idea that uh, basically all the scholastic doctors are the same. It's really interesting. Though the doctrine is foreign to the doctrine of Thomas and even opposed to it, he scored this error and commanded that Thomas alone be followed, especially metaphysics, which treats of the principles and major propositions of the whole Christian philosophy. These principles truly contain the quintessence of the perennial wisdom, which was discovered with much labor by the finest minds of the whole human race. Therefore, it is a terrible thing to despise these principles, and they must rather be religiously observed. If they are neglected, theologians would put forth vain efforts to protect the faith and understand any of its dogmas. These are the famous words of the pontiff himself, quote, when we recommend that the philosophy of Aquinas particularly, but not exclusively be followed, some persuaded themselves that they were acting in conformity with our will, or at least not actively opposing it, in the indiscriminate adoption of and adherence to the philosophical opinions of some other scholastic doctor. Hmm, sounds familiar. Though they be repugnant to the principles of Thomas Aquinas, they were greatly deceived. It is very clear 
that when we set up Thomas as the chief guide in scholastic philosophy, we desire this to be understood above all as referring to the principles upon which that philosophy is based as its foundation. Oh, yeah. And you know what was attached with this? 24 Thomistic Theses. So this is what he's talking about um, as the um, summation of St. Thomas's philosophy. For just as the opinion of certain ancients is to be rejected, which hold that what one thinks of the nature of creation makes no difference to the truth of faith, so long as his opinions on the nature of God are sound, because error about created things begets a false knowledge of God. So the principles of philosophy developed by Aquinas must be preserved sacred and intact, for by those principles that knowledge of created things is uncovered, which is not congruent with faith, and all the errors of all times are refuted. Thus certain knowledge can be had of those attributes which are existing to God and to no one else, and the diversity and analogy existing between God and his works can be wonderfully illustrated. Moreover, if we speak of these principles of Thomas in general and as a whole, we must declare that his doctrine contains only those principles which the most eminent philosophers and doctors of the church discovered through prolonged reflection and discussion regarding the particular reasons determining human knowledge, the nature of God and creation, the moral order, and the pursuit of the goal of human life. Such a brilliant patrimony of wisdom, which we inherited uh, from those before him, he perfected and augmented by the almost angelic quality of his mind. Then he applied it to prepare, illustrate, and protect sacred doctrine in the minds of men. Sound reason cannot neglect such wisdom, nor can religion suffer it to be diminished in the slightest. And this is the more true, since if Catholic truth were once deprived of this strong bulwark, one would seek in vain for assistance or its defense from those philosophies whose principles are either common to or at least not opposed to materialism, monism, pantheism, socialism, and other modern errors. For the main points in the philosophy of St. Thomas should not be considered as opinions about which it is legitimate to argue, but rather foundations upon which all knowledge of natural and divine things is based. When these foundations are removed or weakened, it necessarily follows that students of the sacred studies cannot perceive even the meaning of the words which are used by the teaching church to propose to finally regulate revealed dogmas. And so, we have desired that all who are engaged in the task of teaching philosophy and sacred theology be warned that they cannot depart from Aquinas in the slightest degree, especially in metaphysics, without great harm resulting therefrom. Notice. This is, this is these doctrinal foundations. He's providing doctrinal foundations for his canonical statements. And one of the doctrinal foundations is that according to uh, the church, one cannot depart from Aquinas in the slightest degree, especially in metaphysics, without great harm resulting therefrom. This is a direct quote. Moreover, we declare further that those who perversely interpret or entirely despise the principles and major theses of this philosophy are not only not following Aquinas, but have wandered very far from the Holy Doctor. Notice these are the 24 Thomistic theses he's referring to. And if the doctrine of any other writer or saint was ever approved by ourselves or our predecessors with singular praise and the in invitation or command to spread and defend it were added to that commendation, it must be clearly understood that that doctrine is approved to the extent that it agreed with the principles of Aquinas, or at least in no way contradicted them. End quote. Notice, so when you get one of these uh, theologians, I don't know, uh, there's not actually, well, there's a lot of praises for St. Bonaventure. There's not, uh, I haven't found many um, even passing comments about Scotus. There's a lot for Bonaventure. This is the uh, the hermeneutical principle right there. With these points in mind, some teachers in various institutes and faculties, the order of preachers was not represented among them, proposed 24 theses to the Sacred Congregation of Studies for examination. These are the 24 domestic theses. They were accustomed to propose and to teach these theses, having drawn them from the doctrine of St. Thomas as the chief principles of the holy teacher, especially metaphysics. When these were duly submitted to the Supreme Pontiff and carefully examined, the sacred congregation replied that they clearly contained the principles and major propositions of the Holy Doctor. The theses were grouped into the various branches of philosophy. Seven referred to ontology, five to cosmology, nine to biology and psychology, and three to theodicy, which is theodicy is just theology proper, natural theology. Meanwhile, Cardinal uh, Mary de Val 
in the name of the Pope, congratulated Father P. Labe, rector of the Seminary of St. Thomas Aquinas at the Catholic Institute of Paris, on, quote, the cult of the angel of the schools, whose incomparable doctrine and sovereign pontiff has it glorified anew, end quote. Yeah, I, um, a lot of times somebody will, uh, I've, I've actually heard multiple people say this, they'll say Thomism is a cult. Yes, yes, it is a cult. It's a, um, it's a cult approved by the church. Continuing, to Humbert Everest, O.P., under whose auspices the Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas was translated into English, he wrote, quote, to publish the immortal works of Aquinas is the same as divulging in writing the most complete human and divine knowledge and offering to everyone desirous of knowledge the best method of philosophy to unlock sacred truths and effectively to destroy errors, end quote. And so it is only right that we read in the eulogy of St. Pius X, placed at the foot of his coffin, quote, he zealously promoting the teaching of Thomas Aquinas, end quote. It's really, that's fascinating, really. The St. Pius X, when he wanted to list the major thing he did, he wanted to let everybody know that he zealously promoted the teaching of Thomas Aquinas. Fascinating. After the death of St. Pius X, difficulty arose concerning the 24 philosophical theses which the Sacred Congregation of Studies had declared contained the genuine doctrine of St. Thomas. The difficulty was proposed in this time, quote, Do the 24 philosophical theses approved by the Sacred Congregation of Studies really contain the genuine doctrine of St. Thomas? And if so, should Catholic schools be obliged to subscribe to them? The Sacred Congregation gave this response, quote, All the 24 philosophical theses express the genuine doctor, doctrine of St. Thomas, and they are proposed as safe directive norms. Notice the 24. So it goes actually even further than this, because sometimes you'll get this um, cope. It's basically like, oh, well, actually, like like a Gil Solomon cope. Well, actually, uh, like St. Thomas, he was right. It's just, you know, all of his followers kind of just like screwed everything up. But actually, uh, more specifically, the church says uh, what way of interpretation of St. Thomas is correct. Um, so just as St. Thomas's doctrine is safe. So also the 24 philosophical theses are safe expressions of his doctrine. So um, it's interesting. In other words, Catholic schools should not be obliged to subscribe to them. Actually, give me one second. I think Augustine just bit the dust. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, he definitely did bit, bite the dust. Okay, so great question from AD. So how does St. Thomas's authority relate to that of other doctors? Like if St. Thomas contradicted St. Alphonsus on moral theology, we generally agree with St. Alphonsus, question mark. So um, at least the way it seems uh, from my interpretation of how everything is going, we, we could give two answers to this. So on the one hand, uh, we can say um, with St. Pius X that the approbation of the other doctors is only said to be uh, insofar as they uh, do not disagree with Thomas. So on the one hand, we could say that. But on the other hand, we could also say that the very um, approbation of St. Alphonsus Liguori is in that he interpreted uh, moral theology in accordance with St. Thomas's principles. Uh, so, yeah, that that's I. But if I were to um, express it, I would express it in the second way. Is that St. Alphonsus uh, was made the moral doctor of the church. And this is some things that he explicitly says. And I actually think that um, one of the documents on, on Alphonsus Liguori explicitly talks about this. But I can't remember off the top of my head that um, St. Alphonsus garnered his light uh, from the fact that he interpreted uh, moral theology after the principles of St. Thomas. Um, yeah, yeah. So 
Hassan says, let's go through the sources first. Yeah. So this isn't like m m definitive judgment. Although, unfortunately, um, if I happen to be wrong on this, um, some will take it to be my definitive judgment. But yeah, that's uh, that's really um, how I would generally deal with that. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, this is going to be like a five-hour stream by the time of time. It's going to be great. Um, so let's continue. In other words, Catholic schools should not be obliged to subscribe to them, yet these theses should be proposed in those schools as safe directive norms which should be followed. Okay, this is important when it comes to the 24 Thomistic theses. That, like... Um, well, this this had to do with uh, the way in which canon law worked, but this can be applied to like doctrinal basis. So like the 24 Thomistic Theses, if I happen to study the works of Aquinas and come to a disagreement um, with one of them, I can disagree with the 24 Thomistic Theses and still say I agree with Thomas. But to have a but they are safe directive norms to the safe directive uh, to the um, to the safe doctor. So kind of, I hope that makes sense to you. Namely, quote, as the doctrine preferred by the church, end quote, as Benedict the Fifteenth, who ratified this response, himself explained to Father Hugon, OP, and as the latter relied in his work, uh, he wrote a commentary on the 24 Thomistic Theses. The new pontiff constantly desired that the precepts of Leo the Thirteenth and Pius X on the faithful and religious adherence to the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas be followed and observed, for his is the philosophy according to Christ. Quote, Along with our predecessors, we are equally persuaded that the only philosophy worth our efforts is that which is according to Christ. Therefore, the study of philosophy according to the principles and system of Aquinas must certainly be encouraged, so that the explanation and invincible defense of divinely revealed truth may be as full as human reason can make it. And so we wish this Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas to be under our care, not less than it was under the care of our predecessors. End quote. In the statutes of the Academy, renewed by the order of the Pope, in his motu proprio, is found the following. The Roman Academy of St. Thomas has this particular purpose, to explain, defend, and protect the philosophy of the angelic doctor. Moreover, teachers, at least once every week during the academic year, should read the works of St. Thomas on philosophy, especially the commentaries on Aristotle and Boethius. End quote. Thereupon, the regulation should, be, should guide the Academy were promulgated. Quote, the doctrine of this academy is to explain, protect, and spread the doctrine of the angelic doctor, especially in philosophy, and follow strictly what was set down in the encyclical attorney Patris. The chief work of the academy are these, to join their studies and forces with the other academies of the same institute, so as to establish Christian philosophy everywhere according to the principles of Aquinas, end quote. Mention can also be made of the letter of Cardinal uh, Bisletti, Perfect, uh, prefect of the congregation to Father A. Baud, why don't these guys have real names, rector of the Catholic Institute of Paris, referring to a more intense cultivation of the devotion of St. Thomas, in which the prescripts of Leo XIII, Pius X, Benedict XV, on, on, the, on following the theological and philosophical teachings of St. Thomas are recalled and renewed. The pontiff used every occasion to extol and urge this philosophy, as is evident in his letters. In the encyclical uh, In Preculara uh, of April the 30th, 1921, he praised Dante, who, quote, midst a great victory of studies, followed especially Thomas Aquinas, prince of the schools. Following him, whose angelic qualities of mind ennobled his own, he learned practically everything he knew in the realm of philosophy and theology, end quote. Pius XI said that Benedict XV especially, quote, was to be praised for having promulgated the Code of Canon Law, in which the system, doctrine, and principles of the angelic doctor are unreservedly sanctioned, end quote. In Canon 1366 of the Code, promulgated on Pentecost 1917, is found in the law, quote, notice this is Canon Law that um, doesn't apply uh, anymore, but the principles still apply. Quote, professors should by all means treat the studies of rational philosophy and theology and should train students in these subjects according to the method, doctrine, and principles of the angelic doctor and should hold these as sacred, end quote. Recalling the same precept in a letter to Cardinal Schult on the following, on the founding of the Catholic Institute of Philosophy at Cologne, June 29, 1921, the pontiff said, indeed, quote, 
Indeed, nothing could be more salutary and timely than to establish an institute of true science, that is, philosophy, where not only solid and safe doctrine may be taught, but in addition, all those matters touching the highest notions of the good and the true may be explained clearly so as to furnish a solution to the various questions which will continually arise. The philosophy we mean is the scholastic philosophy, which is of principal importance with Catholics. Developed by the holy doctors, it was brought to such a pinnacle of perfection through the genius of Aquinas that practically no one can raise it any higher. On this point, the prescripts of the Roman pontiffs have been clearly formulated, and the code of canon law now embodies them. End quote. Pius XI took the same course, inviting all to follow his predecessors, and he ordered their injunctions to be observed strictly and sacredly. Quote, what was providentially established in canon law in this matter should be inviolably and religiously observed. When they finish the course of arts, our students should study philosophy for at least two years in order to build a solid foundation for sacred theology. The philosophy we mean is the scholastic philosophy developed at the cost of great labor by the Holy Fathers and doctors of the schools and advanced the highest point of its perfection by the work and brilliance of Thomas Aquinas. Our illustrious predecessor, Leo XIII, did not hesitate to call it the bulwark of faith and solid fortress of religion. It was to be uh, it was to the great praise of Leo that he restored Christian philosophy, urged by his former love for and cultivation of the angelic doctor. We will go further and say that of all the things he did during his long pontificate, which were useful for the church and for society, this restoration was of such importance that if he had done nothing else, that alone would suffice to commend the name of so great a pope to immortality. Therefore, teachers of philosophy should consider it a duty of prime importance when teaching this subject to clerics to follow not only the system or method, but the doctrine and principles of Thomas as well. They should do this even more eagerly because they know that no doctor of the church is so terrifyingly and formidably to the to to terrifying and formidable to modernists and other enemies of the Catholic faith as Aquinas. St. Thomas is terrifying and formidable. So true. End quote. The pontiff wrote in the same vein to the moderators of religious orders and other societies of religious men, quote, Hold sacred and violet, which we have said in our apostolic letter, on the matter of seminaries and clerical studies, in conformity with canon law, the teachers in explaining the principles of philosophy and theology should faithfully follow the scholastic method according to the principles and doctrine of Aquinas, end quote. He called the mind and adopted the famous words of Leo the Thirteenth in the letter Nostra Ergo, on in 1898. Quote, Those who wish to be true philosophers, and surely men ought especially to desire this, should place their bases and foundations of their doctrine. Thomas Aquinas. End quote. And this is this is the the money quote. Indeed, no one ever quote better explained the nature and method of philosophy, its part and its force. Thomas handled these parts in a way which was proper to each, starting from the those elements which are native to human reason and gradually ascending to others which are more remote. He arrived at the summit of all things, end quote. His propositions on the natural power of the human mind to know truth rooted out the errors of agnosticism. His doctrine on the existence of God as demonstrable from creatures through cause and effect stand today, as in the Middle Ages, as the most solid and strongest of all. In this letter, as he recalled in an allocation to the cardinals in 1923, he urged all the clergy, quote, especially to follow this leader in their studies, end quote. There is present in the philosophy of St. Thomas, quote, so to speak, a certain natural gospel, an incomparably solid foundation for all scientific instruction, since the chief characteristic of Thomism is its objectivity. Its constructions or elevations are not those of a mind cut off from reality, but are constructions of a spirit which follow the real nature of things. The value of Thomistic doctrine will never seem less, because this would require that the value of all things become less, end quote. In a word, the philosophy of Aquinas is the philosophy of the Church of Christ, i.e. a Christian, Catholic, Roman philosophy. Look at this. Look at this. This is legitimately exactly what I said when I said um, that Catholicism equals Thomism, that the philosophy of Aquinas is a philosophy of the Church of Christ, a Christian, Catholic, Roman philosophy. Now, Come on, come on, come on. I've learned all of this, and I speak all of this 
from what has been taught to me by reading the popes. Come on. Let's let's continue. Indeed, as innumerable documents of every kind of test, the church has adopted his philosophy for her own, end quote. So, he heartily praised Cardinal Mercier for his philosophical writings based on the doctrine of St. Thomas, quote, namely, ontology, end quote. And the pontiff added, quote, by your explanation, you protect the metaphysical principles of St. Thomas. To recede from them, even slightly, will cause great harm, as our predecessor of happy memory, Pius X, warned, end quote. Did anybody hear Augustine's, uh, he, Augustine has a toy dumbbell, my son, and he, uh, and it has music about lifting on it. So he's a lifter already. We need like a, like a toy sumo that like, you know, that'd be a great idea. But if I made a toy sumo, would any of you guys buy them for their kids? Probably would. Okay. Continue. Uh, Pius XII recalled all these precepts of his predecessors and quote, if any precept be wanting anywhere, he restores them in their original force and quote. The perennial philosophy or Christian philosophy, which St. Thomas brought to perfection and left at its peak after composing and strengthening it with a marvelous order, rests on a solid rock, perpetually strong and fresh. Its fruit will endure forever. Following its guidance, one may safely proceed to a solid knowledge of the truth. And quote, look, safely proceed. That's all I'm saying. Quote, indeed, the perennial philosophy is a work of great magnitude. To construct that work, the flower of wisdom in the learned geniuses raised up by the provident power of God over the centuries and labored, strong in its philosophical youth, and now grows stronger and continually offers increase to various studies, either when physical studies need deeper investigation, or history needs a more circumspect treatment, or critical method needs more precision. But the palm is reserved for Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas, among all the cultivators of scholastic philosophy. He holds primacy of place. Unique lovers of the truth, with what reverence as truth demands, does he thoroughly consider the things to be known, carefully examining the facts, investigating the texts and documents from which acts and statements are discovered, how adept he is in disposing the parts of his inquiries, what firm strength in his arguments and clear dignity in his language, with con conquering fortitude, which loftiness of mind engenders, he proceeds to his conclusions. By his calm and confident development, he extracts their conclusions from metaphysical principles, which are the common heritage of Christian wisdom for all ages, end quote. Going further in his encyclical Humani Generis of August 12th, 1950, he adds, quote, this is that healthy philosophy which stands as our heritage from previous Christian times. It enjoys a higher order of authority because the very teaching authority of the church weighs her principles and, as and assertions gradually clarified and defined by men of genius in the balance of divine revelation itself. This philosophy, recognized and accepted by the church, protects the true and genuine validity of human knowledge and unshakable metaphysical principles of sufficient reason, causality, and finality, and ultimately the mind's ability to attain certain and immutable truth. In this philosophy, many things are explained which touch faith and morals, neither directly nor indirectly, but these the church leaves free to free discussion of learned men. This is very important. It's very, very important. As for many other matters, especially this is going to be one of the things that we talk about later when we uh, refute some of the over-exaggerations. As for many other matters, especially the principles and chief tenets to which we have mentioned above, the same liberty is not granted. Now, what are the chief principles and tenets laid out above? Generally, these are taken for the uh, 24 Thomistic Theses. But even in these essential questions, philosophy may be clothed in a more convenient and richer raiment may be fortified with more precise dis distinction, may be divested of less useful scholastic aids, may be prudently enriched with the fruits of the progress of the human mind, but never may be overthrown or poisoned with false principles, or be regarded as a great but obsolete relic. Truth in its philosophic expression cannot change daily, especially in the realm of the self-evident principles of the human mind, or of those opinions which lean upon both the wisdom of the ages and the support and approbation of divine revelation. Whatever new truth is uh, the human mind can find in its sincere quest can hardly be opposed to truth already discovered, since God, the highest truth, has created and guides the human mind. Not that it may daily oppose new truths to those already established, but having removed the errors which possibly have crept in, 
may build truth upon truth in the same order and structure found in reality, the source of truth. The Christian philosopher and theologian should not therefore embrace eagerly and lightly whatever novelty is thawed up from day to day. Rather, they should weigh it with the greatest care and a balanced judgment, so as not to lose or corrupt the truth already required, acquired, with consequent grave danger and harm to the faith. If one has a true perspective in these matters, he will readily see why the church requires that future priests be instructed in philosophy according to the method, doctrine, principles, of the angelic doctor. So now he's going to be actually, uh, really interestingly, uh, Pius XII is going to be uh, explaining the rationale of the um, the Codicane Law, the doctrinal principle we can retain. Since, as experience of many century proves, the method and doctrine of Aquinas is singularly preeminent for teaching students and for investigating obscure truths, his doctrine is in wonderful harmony with divine revelation and is most effective for safeguarding the foundations of the faith, as well as for reaping usefully and safely the fruits of sound progress, end quote. Of such a kind are, quote, those which by their nature are closely connected with the doctrine of faith, end quote, and which deals especially with the two philosophical studies, quote, theodicy and ethics, end quote. These do not agree with the tenets of immanentism, idealism, historical or dialectical materialism, nor with existentialism, all of which are opposed to Catholic dogma. Students of sacred study should receive instruction in many other fields, among which, quote, the study of social questions is of considerable importance, but the greatest effort must be expended in philosophy and theology, according to the method of the angelic doctor. And to these should be added a knowledge of the needs and errors which afflict our age, end quote. These errors cannot be effectively refuted unless one has thoroughly learned the basic elements of philosophy and theology, quote, in order that the study of sacred sciences may not unhappily suffer. We strongly exhort all of you, venerable brethren, to watch carefully that the precise regulations which the apostolic see has laid down for such studies be faithfully received in translating the action. End quote. In this way, and in no other, will the deposit of Catholic faith be preserved whole and pure and unharmed, as well as untainted by the tenets of false philosophies. This extended list of documents is more than sufficient. Okay, we finally got to the end of the philosophy section. I'm going to take a quick break. Promise I'm not disappearing on you. The extended list of documents is more than sufficient to show clearly that the canonical doctrinal authority of Aquinas in philosophy is the greatest in a unique sense. To no other ecclesiastical writer in the field of philosophy does the church extend such great approbation and commendation. And now uh, we're finally going to get to a section on the uh, entire body of St. Thomas's doctrine in general after we've covered the, the extrinsic authority of philosophy, of theology, and then philosophy um, in particular. So I'm going to take a break and I'll be back in like five minutes.
Okay, I'm back. Let's get right back into it. So, the general authority of the entire body of St. Thomas's doctrine. Okay, so there are distinct categories of St. Thomas's doctrinal authority, namely scientific and canonical, philosophical and theological, each outstanding and still in its own field, as well as distinct from the others. Still, these categories may not and should not be separated, but rather int are rather intimately joined in perfect unity. The result is that all of them, together taken, are as integral parts of one complete and total doctrinal authority. All these parts mutually assist and complete each other, and arising from this natural harmony between the philosophical and theological, between the scientific and canonical authorities of both, we find the highest authority of the whole and integral body of St. Thomas's doctrine. This intimate harmony of reason and faith, and consequently of philosophy and theology, is extremely clear and distinctly mentioned in the works of St. Thomas. He says of theology, quote, The science may receive help from the philosophical sciences, not that it should in need, stood in need of them, but only to make its teaching clearer. For it accepts its principles, not from other sciences, but immediately from God by revelation. So it does not depend upon other sciences as upon the higher, but makes use of them as of the lesser and as of hand handmaids. Even so, the master sciences make use of the sciences that supply their materials as political and military science. That it thus uses them is not due to its own defect or insufficiency, but the defect of our intelligence, which is more easily led by what is known through natural reason from which the other sciences proceed to that which is above reason, such as are the, as are the teachings of the science, end quote. It is not the business of theology to demonstrate the principles of philosophy, but only to weigh their validity in relation to its own proper principles. This is really important. But when it comes to the relationship between philosophy and theology, uh, theology is said to be a negative norm. That is, in relation to its, it doesn't tell philosophy how to do philosophy, but it tells philosophy where it can't go in relation to its own principles, which actually is a lot more far-reaching than we would think. Quote, whatever is found in other sciences contrary to any truth of this doctrine must be condemned as totally false. End quote. So it does not agree with the truth revealed by God. You can neither deceive nor be deceived, but rather contradicts the truth. It cannot be true, but is false and is to be rejected. Such falsity is totally inept, and theology cannot use it to illustrate and explain its propositions. And so the Holy Doctor adds, quote, Inasmuch as sacred doctrine makes use of the teachings of philosophy for their own sake, it does not accept them because of the authority of those who taught them, but because of the reasonableness of the doctrine. For this reason, accepts such truths and rejects others, end quote. The same harmony is apparent in the way in which the church approves a doctrine, stating that the doctrine has been adopted as her own and commanding that it be followed. All proof previously adduced incontrovertibly incontrover demonstrates this. In the code, we find, quote, professors shall by all means treat the studies of rational philosophy and theology and shall train students in these subjects according to the method, doctrine, and principles of the angelic doctor and should hold these as sacred. The philosophy and theology of St. Thomas are at the same time to be held sacred and explained in Catholic schools, not only as to system or method, nor only as principles or major propositions, but even as to doctrine, i.e. the doctrinal system based on these principles and that method, in such a way that the students, quote, may be instructed in a complete and coherent synthesis of doctrine according to the principles and method of St. Thomas Aquinas, end quote. In this matter, some declarations of the popes are much to the point. Leo XIII said, quote, We propose for imitation a man whose virtue and wisdom shine brilliantly, a man fully imbued with human and divine knowledge, culled from the fruit of centuries, a man honored by the praises of the church and the Roman pontiffs, and found equal in mind to the angels, end quote. Taking this into, con uh, quote, taking this into consideration, devotion to this great and holy man, affords the most powerful help to restore philosophic and theological learning with consequent great utility for the state, end quote. Referring to this some years later, he says, quote, we have taken care to restore the studies of philosophy and theology under Thomas's leadership to the time-honored method. A cleric should grow up with and be exercised in the school of his philosophy and theology, for he stands forth as the most learned and most capable in holy contests. 
Let each one consider this imposed by law, that Thomas Aquinas should be f followed as guide by both faculties, and let them especially cultivate and safeguard his doctrine. The best preparation will be con conscientious application to philosophy and theology under the guidance of St. Thomas Aquinas, and a thorough training therein, as we have pointed out and directed, end quote. With good reason was he able to write on May 9th in an encyclical letter confirming the constitutions of the Roman Academy of St. Thomas that, quote, from the very beginning of our pontificate, driven by a knowledge of serious evils, we have often striven that the studies of philosophy and theology should be reintegrated according to the time-honored scholastic system of St. Thomas, and that the discipline of his scholastic method should be established as handmaid and companion to the truth of faith. We now rightly rejoice that this has been accomplished in practice in practically every Catholic school, end quote. After the publication of his encyclical, Attorney Patris, the foregoing was artistically expressed on a medal struck for the occasion. On the observance was a likeness of the pontiff. On the reverse was a likeness of St. Thomas, wearing the doctoral insignia and extending with the right hand his theology and the left his philosophy. Across the top was this inscription. The doctrine of Thomas Aquinas restored to its pristine place of honor, and across the bottom, renewal of the covenant between divine and human wisdom. St. Pius X considered it sufficient to recall among many other this one phrase, quote, studies in philosophy, theology, and cognate sciences, especially sacred scripture, should be made in conformity with the pontifical directives and the study of St. Thomas, so often recommended by our reverend predecessors and by us. To disregard, especially to disregard Aquinas, especially in philosophy and theology, as we have said, cannot fail to cause great harm. Using his guidance is the safest way to profound knowledge and find things. Notice, again, thesis explicitly stated that it's the safest way. End quote. Benedict the Fifteenth, who promulgated the regulation, now included in the Code of Canon Law, deemed it enough to call to mind the words, It is a sacred and salutary and almost necessary duty to follow Thomas Aquinas as the great teacher in schools where youths are instructed in philosophy and theology, end quote. His philosophy, since it is truly in accord with Christ, can be used safely with no other danger of error and applied by sacred theology, quote, in order that the explanation and defense of revealed truths may be as full as human reason can make it, end quote. In this, Pius XI added, quote, teachers of philosophy should consider it of prime importance in teaching clerics the science to follow the system and method, as well as the doctrine and principles of St. Thomas, that they will do that even more zealously because they know that no doctor of the church is so terrifying and formidable to modernists and other enemies of the Catholic faith as Aquinas. What we say in reference to philosophy is likewise to be understood in the study of sacred theology. For that which accomplishes the aim of making this study a true science and of giving, as our predecessor of illustrious memory said, a complete and unshakable explanation of divinely revealed truth is scholastic philosophy under Aquinas's guidance, being put at the disposal of sacred science, end quote. He repeated these commands to religious men studying for the priesthood, quote, in treating the principles of philosophy, professors should follow closely the scholastic method according to the principles and doctrines of Aquinas. How important it is for your students to follow the scholastic method is apparent from the fact that, because there is a very close connection between philosophy and revelation, the scholastics themselves joined both in a wonderful harmony and set forth arguments in such a way that one offers light and important help to the other. Since both come from God, the highest and eternal truth, the one and one furnishes and explains the truths of reason and the other the documents of faith. They cannot oppose each other, as some have foolishly maintained. Rather, they harmonize so easily that one completes the other. It follows from this that an ignorant and unskilled philosopher will never make a learned theologian. Conversely, one who is entirely barren of divine wisdom will never be a perfect philosopher. On this point, St. Thomas aptly states, with the faithful, a matter of faith is proposed by the principles of faith, just as from self-evident principles, a point can be proven to the satisfaction of all. So theology also is a science. To put it in other words, just as philosophy takes its principles of natural knowledge from, from reason, which is a participation of the divine light and enunciates and explains them, so theology, by the light of supernatural revelation, which illuminates and fills the intellect with its own light, deals with, develops, and explains the notions of faith, just as if they were two rays from the same sun or two rivers from one source or a double building on one foundation, end quote. Quote, 
human science is indeed very great as long as it yields to the teachings of faith. But if they are ignored, then it must necessarily fall into many errors and aberrations. But, beloved sons, if your students gather to themselves the best of human knowledge and apply it to the service and use of sacred doctrine, and if they burn with a love and desire for divine truth, they will be and will be considered men of God and will bring much benefit by word and example of the Christian people. End quote. Finally, Pius XII gives generous praise to the order of preachers for its uncommon merit in philosophy and theology and adds, quote, You have given Thomas Aquinas, common doctor of these studies, to the church. His authority is unique whether for educating students or in leading the search for hidden truth, and is enunciated by decree in the Code of Canon Law. Of these studies, the angelic doctor is always a most skilled labor, leader, and never failing light, bringing forth perpetual fruit, end quote. Notice is all I'm saying is that his authority is unique. In the encyclical Humani Generis, he gives stern warning that not just any philosophy can be used by a theologian as an apt instrument to explain and defend the truths of faith. Only that philosophy may be used, which the church has judged to be true and healthy for secular use. That is Christian philosophy under the leadership and teaching of Aquinas. He says, quote, it is clear that the church cannot be bound to every system of philosophy that has existed for a short space, but those which through general agreement were composed by Catholic doctors over the course of the centuries to bring about some understanding of dogma are certainly not based upon any such frail foundation. They depend upon principles and notions deduced from the true knowledge of created things. In the ded deduction of this knowledge, truth divinely revealed has illuminated the human mind through the church like a star. Therefore, it is not at all astonishing that the ecumenical councils have not only employed these notions, but even sanctioned them in such a way that it is wrong to depart from them. Wherefore, in neglect or reject or devalue what has been accomplished over many centuries by great effort by men of uncommon genius and sanctity under the watchful eye of Mother Church, and with the light and guidance of the Holy Spirit, in order to express ever more accurately the truth conceived, express and perfected by the mind, and to replace it with conjectural notions and with some formless and unstable tenets of a new philosophy, which as the flowers of the field are today and are gone tomorrow. This is not only the height of imprudence, but it also makes dogma but a reed shaken by the wind. St. Thomas, with wonderful cleverness, leads the intelligence of men, hesitant and doubtful by reason of the splendor of divine revelation into the very temple of the mysteries of God. Answering difficulties by the skill of his argumentation, he emphasizes the brilliance and clarity existing in the harmony between human and divine things. So the greatest importance, notice, the greatest importance must be given to philosophical and theological teaching according to the method of the angelic doctor, end quote, in the training of youths. Therefore, there can be no doubt that the complete doctrinal authority of St. Thomas, Thomas, both intrinsic and extrinsic, by the approval and com commendation of the church, is truly the greatest among all ecclesiastical writers in philosophy as well as in theology. Important right here. Because this is my whole thesis. And it's pretty clear that this is what the church teaches. It's obvious. Unless you're pugnacious. From this, quote, enduring, constant, and repeated approval of the Holy See, time after time, and even up to the present, in a manner at once particularly insistent and always encouraging, end quote, of his philosophical and theological doctrine above all others, is entirely distinctive and was never attributed to anyone else. To estimate properly this unique authority, one must avoid extremes arising from excess and defect in which the church holds a proper middle course. Okay, so um, this is the point in the stream where after all of this uh, fun proof, we're finally going to be getting to those who actually err and fall against the teaching of the church. Where do people err in excess? Where do people err in defect? Uh, because as St. Thomas consistently teaches, um, the truth is somehow both between and above the defect and excess. So, first, some err by defect and do not obey the commands of the church. First, those who openly condemn or minimize the philosophical and theological doctrine of Thomas in attempt to impugn it and to hold it up to derision. So those who do this are going against the church. 
Now, it's possible to not be a Thomist and to uh, obey this, to not openly condemn or minimize his uh, philosophical and theological doctrine. But others uh, do impugn, they do hold it up to derision, they do condemn, they do minimize, they do actually do this. This is common, not only among modernists, but also among so-called scholastics. This isn't unheard of, to be clear. But uh, again, it's possible, it's absolutely possible, and it's actually not even that difficult to refuse to openly condemn or minimize um, the philosophical and theological doctrine of Thomas and to not impugn it and not hold it up to derision. So as Pius XII says, quote, how deplorable is it that this philosophy accepted and honored by the church is scorned by some and shamefully rejected as being outdated in form and rationalistic in its method of thought. They say that this philosophy of ours upholds the perverse notion that there is an absolutely true metaphysic. And on the contrary, they hold that reality, especially transcendent reality, cannot better be expressed than by desperate teaching, disparate teaching, which mutually complete each other, although in a way mutually opposed. So they concede that our traditional philosophy with its clear exposition and solution of questions, its accurate definition of terms, and its clear-cut distinctions can indeed be useful as a preparation for scholastic theology, although it is more suited to the me mentality of the Middle Ages. Yet it does not offer a method of philosophy suited to the needs of modern culture. And then they allege that our perennial philosophy is only a philosophy of immutable essences, whereas the modern mind must look to the existence of things and to life, which is ever in flux. While scorning our philosophy, they praise others, ancient and modern, oriental and occidental, by which they seem to imply that any philosophy or theory graced with a few corrections or additions, if need be, can be reconciled with Catholic dogma. No Catholic can doubt that this is entirely false, especially where there is question of those fictitious theories they call immanentism, idealism, historic or dialectic materialism, or even existentialism, whether atheistic or simply the type that denies the validity of reason in metaphysics. Finally, they reproach the philosophy taught in our schools for regarding only the intellect in the process of cognition and neglecting the function of the will and the emotions. This is simply not true. Christian philosophy has never denied the usefulness and efficacy of good dispositions of souls for perceiving and embracing fully moral and religious truths. In fact, it has always been taught the lack of such dispositions can be the reason why the intellect influenced by the passions and evil inclinations is so darkened that it cannot see clearly. Indeed, St. Thomas holds that the intellect can in some way perceive higher goods of the moral order, whether natural or supernatural, and that it experiences in the soul a certain connaturality with these goods, whether this be natural or the result of grace. And it is clear how much even this somewhat obscure knowledge can help reason in its investigations. But it is one thing to recognize the power of the dispositions of the will in helping reason to reach a more certain and solid knowledge of moral truths. It is quite another to contend, as these innovators do, that the appetitive and effective faculties have a certain power of understanding, and that man, since he cannot decide with certainty based on reason itself, what is true and therefore to be embraced turns to his will, by which he freely chooses among opposite opinions. It is not at all surprising that these new opinions constitute a dangerous influence for the two philosophical sciences, which are by nature closely connected with the doctrine of faith, namely theodicy and ethics. They maintain that the function of these sciences is not to prove with certitude anything about God or any other transcendent being, but rather to show that what faith teaches about a personal God and his precepts is perfectly consistent with the necessities of life, and therefore are to be embraced by all to avoid despair and to attain eternal salvation. All of these opinions are openly contrary to the documents of our predecessors, Leo XIII and St. Pius X. It cannot be reconciled with the decrees of the Vatican Council. It would be unnecessary to deplore these aberrations from the truth, if all, even in phil philosophy, directed their attention with proper reverence to the teaching authority of the church. It is the mission of the church by divine institution, not only to safeguard and to interpret the deposit of divinely revealed truth, but also to watch over the philosophical sciences in order to prevent Catholic dogma from being harmed because of erroneous opinions, end quote. Okay, now we're up to the second error, those who err by defect, that is. They err by defect and disobey the commands of the church 
who under any pretext whatsoever withdraw from the doctrine of Thomas, who do not study him with proper sincerity, uh, but rather spend their time in looking for his defects, if there are any, and not in attempting to discover his genuine doctrine to explain it. Hmm. This uh, sounds a bit familiar. Um, I actually uh, I was talking with a friend last night about this issue. And he said, um, you know, some of these non-Thomistic classics online, they can be uh, basically like Europeans. Um, because Europeans, they can't talk about anything good about Europe with talking about how bad America is. So a lot of these non-Thomists can't talk about anything good about their philosophical or theological systems without talking about how bad Thomas is. And those, those are uh, those who are falling by defect uh, on this second principle. As Leo XIII said, quote, to depart unadvisedly and rashly from the wisdom of the angelic doctor is not only against our will, but is fraught with danger as well. Notice, to depart unadvisedly and rashly. So again, we're not saying that uh, de facto, every single person has to, in the conclusion, uh, agree with St. Thomas. That's not what we're saying at all. Not at all. And notice, uh, actually, this is interesting. Um this is a letter to the <laughs> okay, this is kind of savage moment. Um, this is Leo the Thirteenth letter to the uh, Minister General of the OFM, um, the Order of Friars Minor, the uh, Franciscan Order. Uh, interestingly, um, he's writing this to the Franciscans. Uh, Saint Pius X added, "Quote: It is true even today that when somebody parts company with Thomas, he seems to be ultimately admitting." aiming at partly parting company with the church and quotes. This is the type of thing I mean when I say uh, that Thomism and Catholicism are uh, in some way identical. Pius XI advised professors, quote, <clears throat> to be persuaded that then only will they satisfactorily discharge their duty and our expectation when after long and diligent perusal of his writings, they begin to feel an intense devotion for the doctrine and Dr. Aquinas, and by their exposition of him, succeed in inspiring their pupils with like fervor and train them to kindle a similar zeal in others. And quote. Pius XII continues, quote, Wherefore, beloved sons, fill your souls full with love and zeal for St. Thomas. Strive with all your powers to perceive his clear doctrine with your minds. Freely embrace whatever has a clear connection with it and is supposed by a sound reason of his doctrine. End quote. St. Augustine wisely set up this law for understanding and interpreting the works of any author. First, that the authors themselves should at least not be despised. And secondly, that they should be loved. Whoever, quote, whoever thought that the obscure and hidden books of Aristotle ought to be interpreted by one of his enemies, end quote. A man who wrote his works with such labor and care as St. Thomas is especially entitled to the same degree of diligence in one who is studying and explaining him. Otherwise, we can suitably apply to him the saying of St. Augustine, quote, If you believe that I am in error, carefully consider again what was said, lest perhaps you fall into error. End quote. Third, so the third way you can fall by, um, by defect. They also err by defect, who admit the great and powerful authority of St. Thomas for other times, although not for our times, which present new problems. Interesting. Very interesting. It's almost like I've uh, heard from some who say that uh, St. Thomas's authority was only against modernism, but not against any of the errors of our own time. Hmm. Interesting. According to them, the historian of philosophy and theology should attribute a great position to him in noting the doctrines of the Middle Ages, but the modern philosopher and theologian should recognize only his archaeological value, end quote. On the contrary, Leo XIII asserted, quote, This is a great accomplishment, that his doctrine is founded upon, improved with principles enjoying the widest possible extension, is fitted to the needs not alone of one particular age, but of all ages, and is especially accustomed to the destruction of errors which perpetually arise, end quote. Benedict XV wrote, quote, The Apostolic See's famous praise of Thomas Aquinas, allow no Catholic to doubt that he was divinely raised up at, that the church might have a teacher whose doctrine should be followed for all time. A teacher indeed, and a doctor who never grows old, end quote. St. Thomas, in the words of Pius XII, quote, is always a most skillful guide and a never failing light. The structure he has erected, quote, is living perpetually above, above and beyond all time 
and is even now a strong and powerful bulwark to protect the deposit of the Catholic faith, end quote. Therefore, it is never lawful, quote, to overthrow even one of his philosophical doctrines or contaminate it with false principles or regard it as a great but obs obsolete relic, end quote. The fourth way you can err by defect. They err by defect who acknowledge and praise the supreme authority of St. Thomas by words and state that it is valid even in our own time, but deny and disparage his authority by deeds insofar as they consider it to be merely symbolic, as if Thomas was not a singular individual person, but represented all scholastic writers indifferently. I think, I think this, is the, this is the issue right here. This is the issue. Almost this exact argument is brought up by um, some Scotists to say that St. Thomas's authority is actually just the authority of the scholastic doctors and not St. Thomas. Continuing, and so that highest doctrinal authority would affect scholastic doctrine indistinctly, not especially the doctrine of Thomas himself. Although it would be named after Thomas, since he was the most outstanding of the scholastics, or even if they accept him really and as himself, they equate his authority with that of other ecclesiastical writers in such a way that Thomas's authority and that of those others is practically the same. So there is no special obligation to follow Aquinas' guide, but rather every kind of liberty is given in a sort of eclectic manner to embrace several kinds of doctrine at once, even including contrary doctrine. So that's the fourth error. Indeed, as they say, the doctrine of St. Thomas is held up by the Roman pontiffs as safe and sound, yet this does not prevent the doctrine of other writers, though inconsistent with the contrary to, and contrary to Aquinas' teacher for being called safe and sound. Indeed, it may be sounder and safer. It is merely scholastic doctrine that is being approved and commanded by the church when she extols Aquinas rather than Thomistic doctrine. Such people have sadly deceived themselves. The documents of the church clearly and positively exclude opinions of this kind. It is sufficient to refer only to a few among the great number. Yeah, there's, there's literally just a great number of all of these, and he's just summarizing. And how far away? How far are we in? Four hours and seven minutes. Yeah. Leo the Thirteenth said, quote, "When we declare that one should receive with a willing and glad mind whatever has been wisely said." or whatever is profitable, no matter by whom it is discovered or thought out, we exhort all of you, venerable brethren, with the greatest earnestness for the safety and glory of the Catholic faith, for the good of society, and for the increase of all knowledge, to restore the golden wisdom of St. Thomas, and to spread it as widely as possible. We said the wisdom of St. Thomas, for it is not by any reason in our mind to set before this age as a standard those things which may have been inquired into by scholastic doctors with too great subtlety or taught with too little consideration, not agreeing with the investigations of a later age, or lastly, anything that is not probable. Let these teachers carefully chosen by you do their best to instill the doctrine of St. Thomas into the minds of their hearers. Let them point out clearly its solidity and excellence above all, all teaching. And what's important about this, um, I want to highlight this because I often bring up this text. So what's important about this is when, it's, when we're talking about the safety of St. Thomas, we're talking about the safety of, of St. Thomas' own positions that aren't excluded. So let's pretend, I don't believe this is the case, but let's pretend that St. Thomas denied the Immaculate Conception. If St. Thomas denied the Immaculate Conception, which I don't think he did, his position would not be safe on that. Because not agreeing with the investigations of later age, or lastly, anything that is not probable. Because it falls under one of those. So it's not of the mind of the pontiffs to put forward those theses as following, but only Thomas's opinions on the current disputes that we have in the church. That's where he is the safest, the most safe, safer than any other doctor. He wrote to the fathers of the Society of Jesus that they should not be so engaged in the study of their own authors as to withdraw in the slightest from the cultivation of the true teaching of St. Thomas, in which they should be uniform. Such uniformity, quote, is impossible unless the students of the society adhere to one author, that is, one already approved, concerning whom there is one precept in the laws of the society, quote, they should follow St. Thomas and consider him as their own proper doctor. It follows, then, that if any of these authors of the society, such as Suarez, Molina, etc., whom we have praised disagree with the doctrine of the common doctor, namely St. Thomas, 
there should be no doubt as to which is the right path to follow, namely the path of Aquinas, end quote. And then for the real banger, to the minister general of the Orders of Fire Minor, he wrote, who is who, who are the Orders of the Fire Minor? The Franciscans. Let's see what he has to say. Quote, the name of Thomas should be held sacred by all the children of St. Francis, and they should be feared if they fail to take as their guide him of whom Jesus Christ said that he had written well of him. End quote. There. There it is. I didn't make this up. There it is. Right there. How many more? Uh, uh, what, what? We're on quote 292 at this point. 292. Do I really need to give any more? Or are, is everybody going to continue this nonsense of pretending that St. Thomas is of absolute equality with other scholastic doctors? It's nonsense. That's what it is. Absolute nonsense. Pius X complained that some misunderstood him when he said that the philosophy of Aquinas should be chiefly followed. He stated that because he said chiefly but not uniquely, quote, certain persons persuaded themselves that they were acting conformity with our will, or at any rate, not actively opposing it, and adopting it indiscriminately, adhering to the philosophical opinion of any of the other doctors of the school, even though such principles were collected contrary to the principles of St. Thomas. They are completely mistaken, for if the doctrine of any other author or saint has ever been enjoined by us or by our predecessors with singular co uh, commendation, joined with an Im invitation in order to propagate and defend it, it may be clearly understood that it was commended only insofar as it agreed with the principles of Aquinas or in no way opposed them. This honestly should just put to death, really. It should absolutely put to death the... Um, sort of equality myth that's going around that, oh, you had um, this Pope say nice thing about SCOTUS or this Pope say nice thing about Bonaventure, or this Pope say nice thing about Suarez or this Pope say nice thing about this guy. And that's true. They said nice things about them. And it's true. Pious doctors, learned in all things. Absolutely true. I read them myself. I get much from them. But when it comes to the safe path, the, well, the safest path on these issues, it is in accordance with Aquinas, in accordance with the principles of Aquinas, even while these other doctors are recommended. Even in this special letter up here to the Minister General of the Order of the Fire Miners, they're, they're not special. Far from permitting the doctrine of St. Thomas to, de to, get, uh, bleh, to degenerate, degenerate into some weak, amorphous, scholastic relic, this injunction must be obeyed in reference to it, quote, in teaching the precepts of philosophy and theology, teachers should follow faithfully the scholastic method according to the principles and doctrine of Aquinas, end quote. St. Thomas's authority in both philosophy and theology is entirely unique. Among all the doctors of scholastic philosophy, the palm is reserved for St. Thomas, and he holds a principal position. Moreover, the doctrine of St. Thomas is not only approved and commanded by the church, as merely safe and sound. Rather, it is safer and sounder than the rest. Indeed, it is the safest, soundest, and surest. St. Pius V said of St. Thomas that, quote, his theological doctrine accepted by the Catholic Church is more safe and sound than the rest. More safe, more sound. These are comparatives. For he is the surest rule of Christian doctrine. Oh, here's a superlative. Benedict XIV recalled and adopted the words of Clement VIII, who said that Aqu Thomas wrote his works without any error at all. And again, um, this is probably talking about without any error that is uh, damaging to faith and morals. And added that it can consequently be followed without any danger of error. Further, he commanded, quote, that henceforth none of the masters or lectors of the College of St. Denis may explain, teach, and read to their students any other doctrine, especially in theology, beside the sole doctrine of St. Thomas Aquinas. Leo XIII praised his pure doctrine for, quote, whatever truth was enunciated or reasonably discussed by pagan philosophers, by the fathers and doctors of the church, by learned men who lived before him, he not only thoroughly knew, but even increased, perfected, and explained, end quote. It is that, quote, 
which the fulsome praises of the Roman pontiffs and councils commended, and which, by the vote of the ages, leaves nothing to be desired of a more firm and fruitful nature. Domestic and civil society, which we perceive is in danger to the degree that it is persuaded by perverse ideas, would be immediately much more peaceful and secure if in universities and schools that doctrine were taught, which is healthier and more in accord with the teaching authority of the church, such doctrine is contained in the volumes of Thomas Aquinas, end quote. Let's keep going. St. Thomas has the surest met method of philosophy. His method of, method of philosophy is, quote, the truest and most suitable of all, end quote, end quote. We wish all to use it in both teaching and learning, end quote. For, quote, human reason has an innate inclination to reach the interior and hidden knowledge of things, and it cannot will otherwise. It follows this inclination much more freely and easily when Thomas is its teacher and guide, because then it acts most safely without any possibility of exceeding the bounds of truth. Most safely, most safely, end quote. Pius X said, quote, his golden doctrine illuminates the mind with its brilliance, and by its use, reason attains the deeper knowledge of divine things without any danger of error, end quote. Quote, to disregard Aquinas, especially in philosophy and theology, as we have said, is very harmful. Following him is the safest path to a profound knowledge of fine things, end quote. Quote, we urge you always to consider it a sacred and solemn duty to follow Aquinas as guide in philosophy and in the discussion of divine things. In this way, midst of excitement about studies, you will never wander from the rule of Christian truth. Look, you will never wander from the rule of Christian truth. There are a great many such aberrations today because there is an imprudent indulgence in each one's own judgment or in the unproved authority of certain men in this matter. There can be no safer course than to follow Aquinas' guide. No safer course. Notice that right there. Those who have g gave written treatises on divine things according to his mind have drawn from him much light and, sol and solidity. End quote. If, therefore, the doctrine of Thomas is safer and has been declared and praised as the safest, other doctrines inconsistent with or even contradictory to it cannot be called equally safe, let alone safest. Comparatives and superlatives exclude the same grade of perfection or quality in others, as we know from the very grammatical meaning of words. Quote, no doctrine can be found which is safer, end quote, as we've just heard from the mouth of St. Pius X. Indeed, from the fact alone that the doctrine of Aquinas is approved merely as being safe and sound, and that approbation is not given to others inconsistent with him. It is clear that these cannot be called equally safe and sound. John of St. Thomas writes, quote, notice, this is John of St. Thomas writing in the 17th century, mid, mid to early 17th century, saying the same thing as like Pius X is in the early 20th century, and like Pius XII in the mid 20th century. It's clear that the church is a consistent teaching on this. It's hundreds of years old. This isn't like, oh, well, the, the, the Leonine popes came in and just like ruined everything. No, 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 that's silly. That's honestly some of the dumbest things I've ever heard. It, it's really, really bad. I mean, it's frustrating because you, you put forward all of these uh, quotes and citations. It's the same sort of thing you'll hear over and over again. Quote, to be approved for soundness of doctrine is the highest type of approval. Though others may not be condemned or rejected. Notice, we're not condemning or rejecting the others, somehow heretics or erring in Catholic doctrine because of their differences. Still, this one is to be preferred. It would seem to be madness if the church, with great praises of many kinds, extols and approves St. Thomas's doctrine. It admits and approves as equal those which contradict it. Thus, she would destroy what she is building. It's obvious. If you're going to try... <laughs> If you're going to try to uh, say that the church is equaling the doctrine of other scholastics, the church would be destroying what she is building. It would be ridiculous. Okay, now is the time for the groveling. It's time for the groveling. From this one, one should not fly to the opposite extreme. Thus, there are an error who excess who do not obey the precepts of the church. So, there is a certain um, excess that can occur when uh, you over-exaggerate the authority of St. Thomas. Yes, this happens. Yes, uh, the church has spoken on it. 
And yes, we have very uh, distinct, um, very distinct uh, distinction, <laughs> distinct distinctions. Sorry, I, I'm, how, how long am I in? Uh, four hours and 20 minutes. So yeah, I'm starting to get a little tired. But we have, yes, very uh, precise distinctions uh, when it comes to the ways in which we do not over-exaggerate St. Thomas's authority. In almost all of these I've stated before, explicitly or at least implicitly. Okay, so let us continue. Those who deny all authority in other writers... Um, actually, I need to make a note of the timestamp because I want to make little chapters after this. Those who deny all authority in other writers of the church, as if Thomas's authority excluded all other doctrinal authority, and as if the angelic doctor were the only doctor of the church, this would be contrary to the doctrine of St. Thomas himself and contrary to his approbation by the church. So, pretending like there's no other authorities, pretending like there's no other doctors of the church, stating these things is false. It's wrong. Don't do it. You should be under, of course, the guidance of Aquinas and of the teaching authority of the church, reading other doctors, reading other works. It's totally okay. Thomas himself did it. Contrary to St. Thomas himself, who advised the student of wisdom, quote, do not heed by whom a thing is, but rather what is said you should commit to your memory. Moreover, no one by his own thinking can find out all that pertains to wisdom, and therefore no one is so wise that he cannot learn from another. In this way, additions are made to knowledge. In the beginning, a little bit was discovered. Then later, through different people, it began gradually to increase into a great quantity, for it is everyone's concern to add what was lacking in the preceding additions to knowledge, end quote. He himself attributes great authority to Aristotle and philosophy in St. Augustine theology, but he does not in any way exclude others. Of Thomas Cajetan says in a reference which St. Leo XIII used and approved, quote, because his veneration for the ancient sacred doctors was so great, he may be said to have gained the perfect understanding of them all, end quote. Contrary to his approbation by the church, which expressly recognized the authority of others. When we praise St. Thomas, Leo XIII says, quote, We do not disapprove others. We do not disapprove indeed of those learned and able men who bring their learning and industry and the riches of new discoveries to the aid of philosophy. For we clearly see that, there, that such a course tends to the increase of learning. Indeed, we declare that everything wisely said should be received with willing and glad mind, as well as everything by whomsoever profitably discovered and thought out, end quote. Passing over the fathers of the church and the doctors whose number daily increase and receive the approbation, authority, and accords with their merits, we will mention only these words of Leo XIII, quote, It is a joyous thing to recall the fortunate period when there came out of the halls of the theological faculty of Paris and return poured forth on its the treasure of wisdom, such men as Peter Lombard, William of Paris, Albert the Great, Bonaventure, Giles, and many others who illumined the whole world by the light of their learned wisdom. Because of their number, it is necessary to pass over some of them, yet we must mention Thomas Aquinas, whom the whole church admires and respects as the most brilliant son. New doctors should follow such distinguished leaders, and if they read their works, and especially if they embrace the doctrine of the angelic master, and diligently teach and strenuously safeguard it, we may hope that the that, that pristine dignity and unique excellence will be recaptured by a great increase in studies and in Christianity itself. End quote. The brightness of the sun, the moon, and the stars are all different, for star differeth from star in brightness. All shine with different degrees of brilliance. The more intense brightness of the sun does not blot out the lesser brightness of the other stars, but perfects them and renders them brighter. So the brilliance of the Aquinian star should not exclude the reflu the, reflu refugi the brightness of other doctors. But from the fact that he has perfected, explained, and expanded their doctrine, he renders them brighter and more lustr uh, lustrous. Okay, now the second. The second error by uh, excess. They err by excess who consider that each and every element of the Thomistic doctrinal synthesis is of equal scientific or canonical authority even though they be secondary and of less importance or with no intrinsic relation to faith or morals. So this, for example, would be like, um, 
holding that St. Thomas's interpretation of certain parts of scripture or of um, his views on embryology or, or whatever it may be are of equal value as like his, I don't know, his writings on the nature of um, being like they're not the same. Man, I'm starting to lose my voice. Man, we're only 18 pages away. Let's keep going. So, as Pius X wrote, quote, It is clear that when we present Thomas as the chief guide for our scholastic philosophy, we want this to be understood especially of his principles upon which his philosophy is based as its foundation. For those which are the capital theses in the philosophy of St. Thomas are not to be considered as debatable one way or another, but as the foundation upon which all knowledge of natural divine things is based. If such principles are removed or in any way impaired, if it necessarily follows that students of sacred sciences will fail to perceive even the meanings of the words in which divinely revealed dogmas are proposed by the teaching authority of the church. We therefore desire that all teachers of philosophy and theology should be warned that if they deviated as much as a step, especially metaphysics from Aquinas, they exposed themselves to the greatest risk. End quote. Among such principles or major propositions in philosophy should be numbered 24 Thomistic theses, which the Sacred Congregation of Studies declared, quote, clearly contain the principles and major propositions of the Holy Doctor, end quote. Hence, we have the words of Pius XII, the students studying at Rome for the priesthood, quote, adopt freely whatever pertains clearly to, to it, the doctrine of St. Thomas, and finds a solid basis in it, end quote. And again, in his encyclical, Humani Generis, in this philosophy, many things are explained, which neither directly nor indirectly touch faith or morals, in which consequently the church leaves to the free discussion of experts. But this does not hold for many other things, especially those principles and fundamental tenets to which we have just referenced, the unshakable metaphysical principles of sufficient reason, causality, and finality, end quote. At the same time, we must keep in mind what he said to the teachers and students at the universities and schools of France who were visiting Rome, quote, all the sciences have directly or indirectly some report of religion, not only theology, philosophy, history, literature, and even those other sciences in the juridical, medical, physical, natural, cosmological, paleontological, and philological fields. The presumption that they include no positive relation to dogmatic and moral questions leaves them open to the risk of finding themselves often in contradiction with such questions. It is necessary, then, that even if the teaching of these sciences do not directly touch religious truth and conscience, the teacher himself should be well-versed in religion, i.e. the Catholic religion, end quote. And so, Though every element in the Thomistic doctrinal synthesis is fully organized, connected, and ordered, not every element has the same weight of firmness and authority. The fundamental principles upon which all the others depend, and from which the rest flow, enjoy the greatest authority. Okay, now the third error. They are equally in error by excess, who exclude all freedom of thought, judgment, investigations, and verbal expressions of this doctrine, as to its principles and major propositions, as if each and every one of these principles were imposed upon the mind for belief and assent. So what else we're not saying is we're not saying that these are somehow um, of faith, that there's a necessity to believe in a, believe in assent to these, these uh, propositions of St. Thomas as of faith. Uh, that would be ridiculous. That's not what we're saying at all. They're not uh, even... Uh, theologically certain just because they come from St. Thomas. They're just safe. When the Sacred Congregation of Studies was asked if the 24 philosophical Thomistic theses should be imposed upon it held by Catholic schools, it answered that they all contain and express the genuine doctrine of St. Thomas, but it did not say that they must be imposed upon Catholic schools and held by them. The congregation said simply, quote, they should be proposed as safe directive norms, end quote, quote, with no obligation being imposed of embracing all the theses, end quote, as Benedict XV declared in a letter to the Superior General of the Society of Jesus on March 19, 1917. At the same time, he praised Father Hugon, O.P., for having made a commentary on the theses and placing their force and objective truth in a clear light. And to him, the pontiff reiterated, as he himself says, that, quote, if he did not mean to impose them for interior assent, he deemed that they be proposed as the preferred doctrine of the church, end quote. Boom. This is exactly what we mean. We mean that the church has proposed St. Thomas's teaching as her preferred doctrine, as something which is safe. 
Those are the two propositions. And so they always remain greatly approved, praised, and preferred to those which are inconsistent or opposed. These latter are merely permitted and tolerated, but the others are positively approved, praised, and preferred. And there is an obligation imposed to teach them in the schools as safe directive norms. So just as one would fail by excess, if he should say that all are a matter of obligation in Catholic schools, so one would fail by defect. Should he say that all doctrines which are opposed or inconsistent are equally approved or considered to be of equal authority? And if the church had manifested with no preference for the theses of St. Thomas, with respect to self-evident principles and immediate deductions from them to be approved for secular use and confirmed by the truths of the faith, Pius XII says, quote, however, even if these fundamental questions, we may clothe our philosophy in a more convenient and richer dress, make it more vigorous with a more effective terminology, divert, divest it of certain scholastic aids found yes, less useful, prudently enrich it with the fruits of the progress of the human mind. But we may never overthrow it or contaminate it with false principles or regard it as a great but obscure relic. Truth in its philosophical expression cannot suffer daily change. Lest of all when there is a question of self-evident principles of the human mind, or of those propositions supported by the wisdom of the ages and by divine revelation. End quote. Catholic theologians and philosophers, quote, should so speak by word of mouth or in writing to the men of their age that they may be intelligently and easily understood. It is inferred from this that in proposing and setting forth questions, in leading discussions, in choosing any form of speech, they should wisely accommodate their expression to the talent and inclination of their own age. For what is unchangeable, let no one disturb or attempt to change. But if it should not happen to be a difficult matter, as experience in common in practice point out, its wisdom should be translated into the common idiom for laymen, and through fuller explanation, present technical ideas, which are ordinarily obscure for those unskilled in theology. End quote. The last one the last way we can err by excess. Finally, they err by excess, who consider the doctrinal system of St. Thomas to be, in, to be a closed book, already enriched with every perfection, so that neither the ideas nor words used to express them can be further developed. So this is important when it comes to, I think, the combinatorial tradition, is that the combinatorial tradition is good. It's something which takes uh, those things that St. Thomas uh, may not have explicitly stated, uh, some things they may have been unclear upon, um, even some minor errors or some terminological differences, um, things that he only ver were only virtually present in his doctrine, and it draws them out um, through commenting on his works and through um, the objections which are raised by other schools. Because as I've always said, the school system is good. It's good that we have other schools. Uh, it helps us sharpen our own doctrine. So um, that is the uh, meaning really of this uh, error that some think that we should just kind of uh, take the take the summa and then Pope Francis should go out tomorrow and ex cathedra the whole summa and say I actually don't um, ever depart from anything in here and I actually don't even like clarify it. This of course is not human because the human level is not capable of absolute perfection in its works. It is not in accord with Thomas's own usual mode of action. He was continually developing, eliminating where necessary, and completing his doctrines and expressions, as can be seen in the autographs which are still preserved today. Furthermore, this notion is contrary to the mind of the church, which approves and praises his doctrine. Pius X, following Leo XIII, who heaped praises upon the doctrine of Thomas, and commanded that it be followed and spread, recalled that Leo did not fail to recognize the advances in knowledge being made in our day, and to urge the clergy to keep uh, so that they might discharge their office worthily. Pius himself roundly praised those who were, quote, to illustrate the opinions of Aquinas with learned commentaries or develop his thought by the investigation of new points developed from his principles or weigh his findings with the light of more modern philosophy, end quote. And he congratulated them, quote, because they help the genuine progress of philosophy to a great degree, end quote. The Sacred Congregation of Studies and its decree on the use of the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas as the text of universities, colleges, seminaries, and institutes enjoying the power to grant degrees in theology is to be interpreted in this way, that, quote, together with some text indicating the logical order of questions and containing the positive part, the Summa Theologica should be used and explained for the scholastic part, end quote. 
It believed that even that great work of Aquinas needs the service and help of some other work, pointing out the order of questions and containing positive theology. Pius XII, after praising St. Thomas's doctrine, recalls the precept of the Code of Canon Law, and himself adds, quote, We are not speaking now of those opinions and doctrinal formulae, formulae, formulas relating to physical or natural things, which in times past were proper and peculiar to their supporters, and that the discoveries of human knowledge in our age have surpassed and gone beyond these opinions. The church favors these discoveries, is not at all opposed to them, and rather promotes than fears them. End quote. Rejecting these extremes and opposing interpretations, the true and just interpretation of the validity of the doctrinal authority of St. Thomas and the obligation to accept it stands in the middle between these two extreme opinions. The method, principles, and philosophical theological doctrinal synthesis of St. Thomas is to be held sacred by all and inviolably preserved. So now we're going to be getting into uh, what actually is to be held. Quote, with assiduous effort, search the books containing the institution, laws, and histories of religion. Weigh what is discovered with wise investigation and turn it to the use of sacred science. End quote. In such a way that it may be enriched by rightly and sub subsequently acquired truths illustrated from research and historical investigations and expanded by its application to new problems rising today, it does not deny freedom to investigate this genuine doctrine when its interpreters disagree, and indeed offers its support in leading the search for true knowledge, but not that which is false and specious. The doctrine of Aquinas is so solid and firm in itself that it does not fear or avoid discussion in comparison with others. Rather, it invites such discussion and directs it along a safe path in the acquisition of truth. Thomas is not proposed for imitation in such a way that his followers and disciples may sleep and take their rest or be sluggish. But, imitating his work in industry, they should intensely apply all their energy in learning and expanding the truth, as St. Thomas himself says. Quote, a man should employ every force within him as intensively as possible to strive towards divine things that his intellect may be free for contemplation and his reason for the investigation of reality. And again, quote, the human mind should always be moved more and more intensely to know God according to its measure, that is, as far as it possibly can. Leo XIII said, quote, indeed, it seems that today too many mark genius by its aversion for antiquity, but the best methods of philosophy is that which by thought finds new truths and does not at the same time neglect the wisdom of the ancients. And we declare that everything wisely said, should be received with willing and glad mind, as well as everything by whomsoever profitably discovered and thought out, end quote. Pius XI said, quote, we desire that among the lovers of St. Thomas, as all the sons of the church who are engaged in higher studies ought to be, there be honorable rivalry and a just and proper freedom, which is the life blood of studies. Again, this is the rivalry of the schools, which is good. But let no spirit of malevolent disparagement prevail among them for any such as far as from helping, far from helping truth serves only to loosen the bonds of charity. But everyone who will hold inviolable the prescription of the code of canon law that, quote, teachers shall treat the studies of philosophy and theology and train students therein according to the method, doctrine, and principles of the angelic doctrine and religiously adhere thereto. And, quote, and all should obey this regulation in such manner that they truly call St. Thomas their teacher. And so, the no one will require of others more than the church, mother and teacher of all, demands, even in those matters which are disputed by more reputable authors in Catholic schools, let none be prevented from following an opinion which seems to be, to be closer to the truth. Boom, right there. School system's fine. Uh, disagreeing with St. Thomas, fine. Nobody is saying otherwise. These famous words of the pontiff, which some frequently use and perhaps sometimes abuse, and which should be correctly understood and interpreted, come from previous utterances of his, or even found in the declarations of Pius XII. For the right and proper, the right and power reside within the jurisdiction of the Roman pontiffs, not only to interpret authentically their own laws, but even those established by their predecessors. It is evident that Pius XI did not equate the doctrinal authority of the other ecclesiastical writers with that of St. Thomas, even improved in established fields, let alone in controversial and disputed matters. In both fields, the authority of Aquinas is always preeminent, although through uh, though on controversial and disputed points, it is not imposed with any internal force rising from the weight of its arguments, but assent consequently and quite reasonably is not required by the church. Boom, right there. Right there, this is all we're saying. We have recounted above 
many of the words written and proclaimed after that encyclical, which established anew the obligation to follow Thomas in philosophy and theology. The result is that the doctrine of Aquinas should not be regulated by the opinions of others, but rather other doctrines should follow his method, principles, and doctrine. He highly praised and congratulated Cardinal Mercier for his philo philosophical works, which show, quote, how strong the perennial philosophy is not only to unite with ancient wisdom that has been recently discovered by the praiseworthy work and brilliance of famous men, but to refute all errors so sharply opposed at present to the right reason and doctrine of the church, end quote. The Pope makes special mention of his ontology, quote, since you there support by illustration in the principles of St. Thomas's metaphysics, to withdraw from them even slightly will cause great harm, as our predecessor of happy memory, Pius X, warned, end quote. Thus he approved and adopted the words of Pius X, since by the witness of the church itself, the 24 Thomistic theses truly contain the principles and major propositions of St. Thomas in metaphysics, it clearly follows that the withdrawal in the slightest from them will be a great cause of harm. Pius XII has given the authentic interpretation of these words. He recognized a certain freedom within the doctrine of St. Thomas in his school, when he said that noted interpreters of Aquinas may dissent, dispute amongst themselves, but not against the curtain, his certain and genuine doctrine. There is, these are his famous words. Quote, Beloved sons, fill your hearts full of love and zeal for St. Thomas. Strive with all your power to understand his brilliant doctrine. Freely embrace whatever clearly relates to his doctrine and find safe support in it. So what he's, uh, what's going on here is this is merely actually on the differences between the combinatorial tradition uh, within the school of St. Thomas. These precepts already imposed by our predecessor, we ourselves bring forth and recall present. And if any are not being followed, they are to be restored in full vigor. At the same time, we adopt the exhortations of our predecessors by which they desired to protect progress in true science and real liberty and studies. We entirely approve and commend the measuring where necessary of new discourse and studies with ancient wisdom. It is perfectly legitimate to investigate freely those matters upon which well-known interpreters of the angelic doctor usually dispute. New findings from the history should be implied for fuller understanding of the text of Aquinas. No individual should act as if it were a master in the church, nor should anyone require more uh, from the church, from others than the church, uh, mother and teacher of all demands, nor should foolish dissent be encouraged. If all these points, as we trust, are followed, a fulsome increase may be expected from studies for encouragement to spread truth far from being surpassed, suppressed by the doctrine of St. Thomas is rather stimulated and safely directed, end quote. We should not pass over those words making Thomas in a way like the church, recalling his encyclical Humani Generis. To the scholars meeting at Rome for the Third International Thomistic Congress, he states, quote, This encyclical letter represents a safe path to you who are discussing and interpreting with the doctrine of St. Thomas Aquinas, leading you like a bright sun, end quote. Indeed, encouragement in seeking and spreading truth is not suppressed, but rather stimulated and safely directed by the doctrine of St. Thomas Aquinas, as by the encyclicals of the Roman pontiff. He adds further that though it is true, quote, that the pontiffs generally allow freedom to theologians on matters which are disputed in various ways by men of great reputation. Still, history teaches that many matters that were formerly open to free discussion are no, no longer now admit to discussion. It's actually really interesting right here, um, because basically I, I've been speaking about this, about some of the uh, more minor doctrinal errors that are present, uh, well, th theological errors that are present um, in SCOTUS, for example. Um, yeah, I think this this might be the referent of this uh, quote. So today, after so many uh, approbations, commendations, and precepts by the church, no Catholic is free to deny the matchless doctrinal authority of St. Thomas, whose teaching in philosophy and theology amidst all that surround it, amidst all that surround it, not only outside, but also within the church. She prefers and praises above others, quote, justly favored by the church, end quote. Quote, God has raised up the angelic doctor in the church to communicate his solitary and solid doctrine and to light it up like the sun. His wisdom, especially commanded, commended to all, is admired by the whole world, end quote. Truly, among the scholastic doctors, Thomas Aquinas stands eminently as the prince and master of them all, end quote. Whose doctrine is not only safer and more solid than the rest, but even more in accord with the teaching of the church. And therefore, teachers should clearly point out his soundness and excellence in the Catholic schools. 
in the judgment of the church, it, quote, it is praiseworthy to follow Thomas, end quote, quote, to depart foolishly and rashly from him is fraught with great peril, end quote, to depart from Aquinas even slightly, especially metaphysics and theology will cause great harm, not to depart from his discipline, even in the slightest is the highest praise and a securely pre preventing any danger of wandering from the rule of Christian truth. In a word, the slightest digression from Aquinas is neither permitted nor tolerated. But the church urges and strongly praises fidelity in following him even in minor matters. So the order of preachers, which retains the doctrine of Thomas as its most precious treasure and regards it as sacred and inviolable, puts this great fidelity together with the encouragement and freedom to speak and explain truth in the form of law. Quote, following the example of so great a doctor and learning upon him as upon a solid rock, our professors and writers should take care to follow with docility and reverence in the footsteps of the doctrinal tradition of the church in our order. This does not at all conflict with the legitimate academic freedom of investigating, judging, and resolving current or ancient questions with impartial consideration. From every suitable and approved source, means may be adopted more safely to find the truth which is full from, which is from God, to assimilate it more fully, to develop it more fruitfully, keeping in mind the exhortation of our most holy father, Pius XII, to the fathers at the preceding chapter. Whatever truth our times bring forth, weigh it with impartial investigation and turn it to the use of sacred science. Encouragement to seek and spread truth is not at all suppressed by the doctrine of St. Thomas, but rather is stimulated and safely directed, end quote. This freedom, especially in matters recently under discussion and consideration, should be carefully and prudently used, lest the false be accepted for the true, and the shadow for the substance. As Pius XII says, professors teaching philosophy and theology in Catholic schools, quote, in regard to new questions which modern culture and progress have brought forth to the forefront, should submit them to careful research. But with the necessary prudence and caution, they should not think, indulging in a false ironicism, that the descent, descendant and erring can happily be brought back to the bosom of the church if the whole truth found in the church is not sincerely taught to all without any corruption or diminution, end quote. The pontiff is grieved to note that some indulgence in these novelties without sufficient examination and approbation, they seem to be influenced by this reason, quote, lest we be unaware of the knowledge which recent progressive research has brought forth, end quote, which is the way it appears to intellectuals of the modern stamp. And what is more serious, this affects priests with a zeal and an itch for novelty. And many of these priests seem to be, quote, less equipped than others with learning and doctrine and austerity of life. Novelty itself is never a criterion of truth, and it can be praiseworthy only when at the same time it confirms the truth and leads to virtue and poverty of life. What has made its appearance in our times has wandered very far from the true path. Philosophical systems, which are born and die, without improving morals in any way, end quote. In the same way, quote, much is said, but hardly weighed on the scale of reason about the new theology, which is always changing along with all other things. It is always about to reach, but never quite arrives at the goal. If such opinions should be embraced, what will become of changeless Catholic dogmas and the unity and stability of faith? While you continue, therefore, to reverence and regard as sacred and serious the never-failing truth, have regard for the studious investigation solution of problems which arrive with the times, especially if they beget obstacles and difficulties for the learned faithful. By your explanation of these problems, thereby changing a difficulty into a help, strengthen their faith. When new and debatable questions arise, let the principles of Catholic doctrine stand out in your minds. When some novelty arises in theology, let it be weighed with vigilant caution. Distinguish solid and certain doctrine from that which is merely conjecture, and from that which is fallible and not always laudable. Practice can introduce and use even in theology and philosophy. Offer a friendly hand to those in error, but lend no ear to erroneous opinions. End quote. Oh, sorry, I need water. Among the doctrines proposed as novel mention must be made of the denial or at least the doubt of the possibility that human reason, without the help of revelation and grace, can prove the existence of a personal God by arguments drawn from the created universe. The denial that the world had a beginning, the affirmation that creation of the world is necessary and that it proceeds from the necessary liberality of divine love, the denial of God's eternal and infallible foreknowledge of the free actions of men, 
the denial of the transmission of original sin from one Adam, the other men descending from him through natural generation, the Virgin Mary alone being accepted by a spe special privilege of God, the denial being the asserted theory of polygenism, the perversion of the Catholic doctrine of sin as an offense against God, and of the satisfaction offered for us by Christ, the corruption of the doctrine of the free elevation of human nature to the supernatural order, as if God could not create beings with an intellect and yet not order them to the beatific vision, the denial of the transubstantiation of the real presence of Christ in the sacrament of the Eucharist, as though they should be reduced to pure and simple symbolism, the grave and positive doubt whether angels are personal beings, whether matter and spirit differ, differ essentially, the acceptance without any discretion of the philosophical doctrine of existentialism and evolutionism, and many exegetical aberrations as well. Aberrations as well. All these points Pius XII condemned in this encyclical, Humani Generis, and other recent documents, and decreed that they are forbidden in Catholic schools. There are some who interpret this moderate and rightful manner of following St. Thomas in this fashion. What the angelic, angelic doctor did for his age, and what he would do for our age if he were living, is what his modern Thomas di disciple should do. You ever hear some people say things like that? Well, it's about to get obliterated. This statement, if correctly taken, is true. If taken in the sense, as many do, that Thomas adopted the philosophy of this time, that is, the peripatetic, for the service of theology, and accordingly, if he lived now, he would adopt the philosophies which surround us, such as idealism, immanentism, existentialism, and the rest, and this statement must be pronounced entirely false. He did not take Aristotelian philosophy as it was, nor as interpreted by Greek, Jewish, and Arab commentators, but is purified and developed and expanded and greatly enriched by Christian philosophers, especially by his teacher, St. Albert the Great, most especially by himself. He worked very industriously and suffered many calumnies. In his time at the same University of Paris, there were some, the so-called avarists, who without discretion or prudent caution accepted some philosophical doctrines from Aristotle, from his expositors, which contradicted divinely revealed truth. These denied the personal Im immortality of the human soul, or at least laid the foundation for the doctrine of the act of intellect entirely incompatible with the personal immortality of the soul. The Holy Doctor directly alludes to them in a sermon probably delivered in July 1270 before the University of Paris, in which he said, quote, There are some who study philosophy and say things which are not true according to the faith. And when they are informed that what they said contradicts the faith, they state that Aristotle said it. But they, far from asserting the same, merely repeat the words of Aristotle. Such a one is a false prophet or a false teacher, because it amounts to the same thing to raise a doubt and not to solve it, as to concede it. This is pointed out in Exodus, when it says that if a man open a pit and dig a cistern and cover it not, and the neighbor's ox comes and falls into the cistern, the one who opened the cistern is bound to restitution. He opens a cistern, he raises a doubt pertaining to the faith, but does not cover that cistern, who does not solve that doubt, although he happens to have a clear and capable mind and is not liable to error. But someone who does not have such a clear mind is easily deceived, and the one who raised the doubt is held the restitution, because through his fault someone fell into the ditch. See how many philosophers there were, and how many they had to say about things pertaining to the faith. Yet you can hardly find two to agree on one opinion. And even those who do say something true do not say it without admixture of error. A little old man may know more about his faith than all the philosophers before him. We read that Pythagoras was first a boxer. He heard a teacher arguing on the immortality of the soul and declared that the soul was immortal. He was so affected that he put everything aside, took up the study of philosophy. What ordinary person here, there today, who does not know that his soul is immortal? Faith has a much wider extension than philosophy. So if philosophy contradicts faith, then it must not be accepted, end quote. Leo XIII, admiring the great work and labor of St. Thomas, wrote, quote, This is numbered among the great benefits which the Church owes to the great Aquinas, that he so beautifully harmonized Christian theology with the peripatetic philosophy then popular, that we have Aristotle fighting for Christ and no longer an adversary, end quote. By this purification and elevation, joined with multiple additions from the Neoplatonists and St. Augustine and the Arabs, especially from his own work and effort, by which he joined all of the fragments of truth into one body and raised it to a higher and more perfect synthesis, peripatetic philosophy was entirely altered, but its system and method of philosophy was preserved. Indeed, as Martin Grubman says, the work of the ages more enduring than bronze, which Aquinas accomplished, was his synthesis of Augustine and Aristotle. 
Yet he far surpassed both of them and established with one impulse a superior doctrinal synthesis, fully philosophical and fully Christian, a Christian philosophy in the full sense of the word, without ceasing to be a philosophy in the full sense of the word, to use the words of uh, Gilson. Rather, therefore, than taking this or that philosophy as peripatetic or academic, stoic or Arabian, he took for the use of theology and for the service of the faith, the truth that the natural order sought after by the continuous labor and effort of human reason. These truths constitute the perennial philosophy or common sense philosophy, as Benedict XV calls it. That is the philosophy without qualification. He would not use, but would entirely reject the many false philosophies which surround us today as immanentism, existentialism, materialism, or agnostic philosophy, in that they are incompatible with the truths of the faith and contrary to right reason. Father Schultz says, quote, there can be a more probable expurgation in Aristotelian philosophy of the errors which are accidental. Aristotle can be corrected from his own fundamental principles. But the errors present in modern philosophy are so fundamental that they cannot be corrected. This philosophy must be entirely rejected and expunged. Father Garagou Lagrange adds, quote, They say, moreover, that the modern philosophical system ought to be baptized as St. Thomas baptized Aristotelianism. For that, two things would be necessary. It would be necessary first to possess the genius of St. Thomas, and then the modern philosophical systems would have to be baptizable. To be baptizable, a soul is necessary. A system which reposes entirely entirely on a false principle cannot be baptized, end quote. But if one understands how he acted towards the philosophers of his time and how he would act towards modern philosophers if he was now living, then the statement is true. He proceeded very cautiously and prudently with the philosophers of his own and previous times, treating them with great understanding, yet they're most precisely distinguishing the true from the false in their writings so as to take the truth and reject error. In this matter, he was no respecter of persons, but of reality, for he was a unique lover and cultivator of truth, fame, fortune, and opportunism, failed to touch or affect him. But with a calm and serene spirit, he thoroughly weighed all things and judged them from the height of eternal principles. He always fortified himself with the reading of spiritual books, so as not to lose devotion from delving into philosophers. Without any doubt, Aristotle and the Jewish, Arabian, and Latin philosophers of his time were much less dangerous than modern philosophers in that all of them admitted the first and fundamental principles of a healthy and perennial philosophy, which many of the moderns reject. He would proceed much more cautiously and prudently with modern philosophers if he lived now. How thoroughly he would investigate and prudently weigh the novelties of our time. How unhesitatingly he would accept those which were tried and approved. How eagerly he would accept the chance from others to investigate more deeply and proceed more cautiously. He would always take encouragement from all to ascend to higher and better things. There is no doubt that he would follow the admonitions and cautions of the pious XII that declared must be maintained with reference to proposing new doctrines, openly or counterfeitly, and he would keep them to the letter. The true cultivation of St. Thomas, according to reality and the recommendation of the church, consists in holding sacred and violent his method, principles, and doctrine in philosophy and theology, and imitating at the same time his scientific, intellectual, and moral qualities, as well as cultivating them and manfully expressing them in life in the life of his disciples, so that Thomas continues to live in them completely, especially according to his spirit. His discipline is not hard or tyrannical, but sweet and human, yet prudent and firm. How much more modesty, consideration, simplicity he proposes his doctrines that his readers may mull them over and convince themselves. There is so much order in his exposition together with brevity, and so much clarity does he pour out along the profundity of ideas and propriety of speech that he fully convinces the serene, sincere mind. Frequently, meeting with him never engenders aversion, but rather promotes a continually new admiration for him. He inspires security of mind and joy in finding the truth. At the same time, he stimulates one's capacity and directs it safely in the search after new truths with fear and bold spirit. As Leo XIII said, far from draining the power of the mind, he feeds it lasting in solitary food, end quote. With evident right, therefore, from the supreme intrinsic value of St. Thomas's doctrine, and from the most special approbation and, com and commendation of the church, we may conclude with Father uh, J. de Guibert, quote, by the very fact of anyone embracing the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas, he embraces the doctrine most commonly accepted in the church, safe and approved by the church itself. When there is no grave contrary reason, the authority of St. Thomas suffices to prefer his opinion. This is not only true in theology, to which he solely refers, but in philosophy as well. 
for there is only one in the same force and approbation of both. This is by Father Santiago Ramirez, Order of Preachers. Okay, so we're just over five hours. Um, yeah, my voice is dead. I'm kind of dead. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Remember, subscribe, like, uh, Patreon, you know, all the, the fun stuff. Thank you, and God bless.